Señoras y señores, muy buenos días. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Spence and Defense Industry Sevilla Summit 2022. Is the summit for space and defense in Sevilla is the third edition of this summit which is rather different to the previous two ones for a very positive reasons, which is that we are seeing each other in person. It seems that we forgot where we come from. And um, after this pandemic, so after so many virtual meetings, it's finally time to see each other in person, to hug each other, to interact in person. And now we have the least positive side, which is an edition of the summit, which is very special for a reason that is obvious to all of us, which is the fact we have in Europe the first war in this century, which has changed the global geopolitical situation, which is something that we will deal with in the next two days of summit and how defense strategies have changed. We're going to talk about the space race. We're going to talk about the moon. Yesterday, we saw the capsule of the Artemisa mission over flying the moon around 100 kilometers. So we're going to talk about the new space race with the high level speakers that who will share their knowledge with us and also with many round tables with many debates where we will talk about uh, our ideas, exchange opinions. We will agree on some topics, but I'm sure there will also be some discrepancies, which is sort of like rather enriching to have debate. Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you, especially to those of you who are following us online through the Sevilla Summit um, platform, spainsanddefense.es. Welcome to all of you following from anywhere, from many points in Spain. This summit is thanks to our strategic partners, Scribano Mechanical and Engineering, and our global partners is Passat, Istesat, GMV, and Indra. Our sponsors, Navantia, Technobit, General Dynamics, and Sapa, and our collaborators, MBDA and Lockheed Martin, as well as all the partners. So thank you all. And let's start straight away, because we have a very busy agenda ahead of us. So let's start with our first uh, section, which is devoted to defense as guarantee for collective safety in democratic countries with three presentations. The first one uh, is an online presentation from the previous Supreme Allied Commander in Europe from 2013 to 2016. You know him well, General F Philip Bridloff, whom we will listen to in the next video. Buenas. Secretary Val Carthy, Mayor Munoz, Commissioner Close, thank you for having me here today. And more importantly, thank you for giving of your time to be a part of this very important conference summit. Uh, it sends a signal that you are interested and that you are here. To the sponsors, Escribano Mechanical and Engineering, Indra, Hippasat, GMV, and Histasat. Thank you as well for making this possible. This is important work that we're taking on, and your support makes it happen, and we appreciate it. We have a tough subject to look at across these days, and an important subject, considering the defense's role in guaranteeing collective security, not only in our democracy, but in our alliance. It is an incredibly important thing for the people of this great nation of España and for the people of NATO's alliance that we get this right. We are in some interesting times. We see that Russia is persecuting a brutal war in Ukraine and that the people of Ukraine are suffering and now Europe itself is suffering due to the energy crisis that Russia has caused and to some degree the the lack of grain and other shipments out of Ukraine have affected us all 
in light of these things, there has been a lot of talk about how we in the West should respond. And sadly, everyone always jumps to Article 5 when they discover or talk about that response. But I think it's important to remember, and I had to re remind several during my time as the SACUR during the first Russian invasion of Ukraine, that in our alliance, Article 5 is not the only article we need to be concerned with. And I remind also that the most important article to be prepared, should we ever have to go there, is Article 3. In Article 3, a nation is asked to prepare first for its own defense, to be ready to defend itself. Not only is it asked to be ready to defend itself, but then it is asked to create capacity that would allow it to contribute to the collective defense of the alliance. In other words, to have capacity above and beyond those that it earmarks for defending its own nation and then can be able to contribute should the alliance call on it. Again, as we watch the brutal war in Ukraine, we are reminded that we have to remain ready and vigilant. Readiness is to be looked at in two ways, I think. First is the readiness of today. What force do we have and how ready is it should we have to call on it today to defend our great nation or to aid in the defense of the alliance? So ready now. And then secondly, we have to consider the readiness of the future. Readiness to now is all about maintaining the readiness of our people and the readiness of the kit that we own, not the kit that we want to buy for the future. And readiness for the people is not a cheap thing. This is all about education. It's all about training. It's all about investing in the exercises that require, are required to keep our people fit in the tactics, techniques, and procedures of our national military or of the alliance. And then it's about investing in the resupply, supply, maintenance, and refurbishment of the kit that we have, our, our aircraft, our <clears throat> military ground vehicles, our ships, are they appropriately ready in sufficient quantity to meet the call if it is uh, required? This is required to keep our current force relevant. We can see that the enemy is willing to use his force today and now. Is our force relevant to answer the call should our nation or our alliance be threatened. Spain is always focused on these various readiness now and in the future. Some of you know that I served in 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 Spain para dos años at La Besa Rea de Torrejón. My two years at Torrejón were important to me and important to my wife and I as it was our first assignment in Europe. And as an aviator at Torrejón, I looked down the ramp at my brothers and sisters in the Spanish Air Force, a proud force, and I watched them upgrade from their older aircraft to the F-18 at the same time as down on our U.S. end of the ramp, we were upgrading from the F-4 to the F-16, and I was a part of that change. And I flew many times with your Air Force. And I remember watching the Fuegos, the fire defense aircraft, at the end of the runway as well at Torrejón. And, and I watched later as Torrejón uh, was a site chosen and investing in the NATO CAOC 
and that great capability that Spain brings to our force. And so your nation has had a proud history of investing in the now, its people, its aircraft, and I'll speak more to the rest of the force later, but it also has a proud history of thinking ahead and buying into those capabilities that will keep it relevant to its own people and to the alliance as time goes on. Later, as I served as the 17th Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, SACUR, I watched this great nation as it also uh, took care of its land forces and its naval forces and was an important part of contributing to what the Alliance needed in a collective way to take care of its duties around the world. So with that great history and acknowledging that your nation has made these important decisions in the past, I just want to first say congratulations. This very summit is an indication that your nation is looking forward again. And while we don't want to think about it, the importance of space and the fact that we need to be ready to defend in space, and yes, if required, someday to fight in space. It is an important next. <clears throat> and as I said before, your great nation has shown resilience in thinking about not only today and the next, staying ready should we be called on today, and remaining relevant in those forces that we buy for the future. And I congratulate you one more time in your thoughts about forging ahead in space. It is important. So it's time for me to close, and I want to thank you. I know I sound a little redundant, but it is for purpose. Thank you to España for the tough decisions you have made across your history, keeping your force ready should it need to defend itself today and planning and taking those tough budgetary decisions. And they are tough, but you have made those tough decisions to remain relevant into the future. And now you're stepping into that future of space and other requirements. I want to leave you with that challenge, that it's about today, yes. Russia shows us again and again that it is about today. But as importantly, and sometimes more importantly, it's also about the future. And as we remember, that takes investment in people and in capabilities or kids. I wish you the very best of luck as you tackle these tough subjects through the course of this summit. I wish I could be there with you, and I thank you one more time. Pues muchas gracias al general. Thank you very much, uh, General Philip Bridloff, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe from 2013 to 2016, so the, for this very interesting uh, thoughts and his memories of his uh, time in Torrejon. So we start with the first in-person speaker, the director of the National Security Department of the Office of the President of Spain, uh, General Miguel Ángel Ballesteros. So can you please display my PowerPoint? Good morning. And uh, first of all, please allow me to express my gratitude to the organizers of this third summit in Seville on space and defense industry for their kind invitation to take part in this panel on defense as the guarantor of the collective security in democratic countries. 
The current circumstances see the international geopolitical scenario as a changing and, uh, an environment, and we need to plan ahead more than ever. We need to know where we're coming from to be able to deduce or infer where we are going to. I think we prepared a PowerPoint, which I hope you can see. So please don't get scared by this slide. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. I shall stick to the 15 times I've been allocated. NATO was created, as you very well know, in 1949 as a collective defense organization to face up the then Soviet Union, which was threatening to put an end to the democratic freedom the Western world had been fighting for uh, against Hitler. Therefore, the Atlantic Alliance proposed a dissuasion strategy based on exclusively on nuclear dissuasion and their number on a number of conventional capacity elements. With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, Russia was not a threat anymore, and NATO focused on shared safety and security to contribute to the peace building in the Euro Atlantic zone without losing Article 5 of the Treaty of Washington, which is the article that gives security to all its members. And that's the way all the way to September 11, when it was clear that we needed to face an asymmetric enemy, which is jihadist terrorism, which led to the need to combating terrorism at the source. And the first source was Afghanistan. The, the idea of having forces away from their base was more relevant and to promote logistics, communications and information via satellite. And at the same time, missions were received a more comprehensive approach that would strengthen and provide support to the local authorities and local populations by helping the local population to develop. The result of the stabilization of countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq has led to a rather strategic fatigue due to the political economic tiredness that that uh, caused. And uh, it led to rechanneling our strategy from the shared security, we have moved to cooperative security. And what do we mean by cooperative security? In this sense, the Atlantic Alliance, as the European Union avoids the direct involvement of the military in the conflicts, but it helps with training, supply of equipment to countries that are in trouble, which is the case of Ukraine nowadays. The technological development of ICTs have led to the disappearance of the so-called hybrid strategies, which have always been there, which we, but which now see a resurfacing thanks to the new technologies. And the new technologies are such as uh, hybrid threats and hybrid, uh, we call it the Gerasimov doctrine, as a tribute to General Valery Gerasimov, whom, as you know, is the head of the defense staff in Russia. And according to the chief of defense staff, Gemasimov, this allows us to reach political objectives with a quarter of the military capacity. And above all, this allows us to act in the so-called gray area, where we achieve objectives without using arms or weapons or with a minimum use of arms or weapons. And this allowed Russia to take up the peninsula of Crimea in 2014. However, the current attempt to control the south of Ukraine and change Kiev's government has led to an escalate that has led them and, well, us to a hybrid war where technology, satellite capacity, production capacity, military industry are key. 
For NATO and the Western democratic world, this war has shown the true face of Putin's Russia and the need to go back to a dissuasive strategy which cannot be based in the number of military, but rather on the military technology differ differential sustained over time. The Ukraine war and in the international geopolitical situation has obliged NATO to have a new concept, the Madrid concept, which is completely different to the predecessor from 2010. In 2010, we talked about collective defense, but we didn't talk about dissuasion. In 2022, we focus on dissuasion to preserve sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Allied. In 2010, it was said that the activation of Article 5 of the Treaty of Washington would be in any case as a response to an armed attack. But now we consider that an armed attack can be any hybrid operation that cause effects equivalent to an armed attack, but without it being so, or to hostile operation in the space. Russia is considered to be a threat. In the past was a partner, and China is considered as a challenge. But we talk about defense yeah, yeah, it's with 360 degrees. And so we are undergoing a new international scenario. Military operations and politics had three dimensions, ground, air, and sea, and now there are five dimensions. Those form a three plus space and cyberspace. And this makes us think that the technological differential is key in this situation. Technology is applied to these two scenarios, which are key. Hybrid strategies have led to or have allowed to have medium-sized powers to launch operations to attain political and economic goals that in other periods of time were unthinkable. And they do so supported by these hybrid strategies. So how do we face this scenario in which space action, cyber attacks, the misinformation campaigns that proliferate due to social media, or actions on supply chains, such as the energy, give a lot of power to these regional powers, such as Russia? And the response is in the upgrading and revalorization of intelligence, geopolitical analysis, the crisis management, which is now based on the big data and data integration, the capacity of fast adaptation to new scenarios by resilience. And this all entails a national security system, which is properly a, a fit, sufficiently digital, so that data transmission allows the government to know in real time the situation and to know with which private and public situations they have to face them. And this is all done with technology. National Security Strategy 2021 established four main pillars of global trends that are part of the current international arena we live in. A higher geopolitical competition with a higher assertiveness of regional powers that I was talking about earlier that uh, leverage hybrid strategies that, of course, Russia could be considered a paradigm of. An econ social and economic environment affected by COVID-19 with an economic uh, weakening due to the Ukraine war and the brittleness of the global supply chains. The acceleration of uh, technological transformation in hyperconnected societies uh, where technology is king that turn data in the obscure uh, goal of desire as the big power and control. The apparition of disruptive technologies that can change the way we live or can change the defense and dissipation capacities. A technological transformation that is making inroads in the space or aerospatial context and also in the cyberspace. So this is the international context where 
President Putin has made the most out of it to launch his war, which he originally did not foresee that it would get this far. So he sees this as an extension of the Crimea operation. He actually called it special military operation, but which, as you know, has led to a massive escalade in which we don't know the end, where the end will be. So this has shown the need to revitalize the concept of dissuasion. But how does this must dissuasion be nowadays and in the future? Are we talking about we're talking about the technological differential. And to achieve that, we need research and research and development and innovation, good technical equipment, budget and time. But we don't have that time. And we, we could have it thanks to technological anticipation. So we need to advance in which fields we need to research. And with sustainability in time of the military equipment and capacities. The National Security Strategy 2021 established 33 lines of action to achieve the main objectives. We shall not go into them in depth. But amongst these 33 lines of action, most of them are on the first priority. And one of them is to ensure military capacity needed to provide credible dissuasion and effective response in the crisis or conflict, guaranteeing sustainability in time under a sufficient and stable budget. And this is key. This is the first line of action of our strategy. The second line is to strengthen the defense capacities with technological research and development as vectors for strategic advantage. And this is where I wanted to focus our attention. Technology is key for dissuasion nowadays. In the past, it was nuclear dissuasion, which still is. But for those of us who don't have it, it is not so much the number of aircrafts and, and tanks that we have but rather the technological differential or advantage. Bearing in mind that a vessel, an aircraft, or a ground vehicle has a life shelf of 20 years, we can't take for granted that if we don't refurbish it and update it, changing the technology, it cannot keep the technological dissuasion capacity forever. So we need budget. And this budget is not only for acquisition, but also to ensure sustainability during the whole life cycle. Action line three involves the development of the defense security and the space in Spain, as well as dual technologies with public-private partnership. This seems to be a very relevant topic. In a subsequent line of action, it also says that they should create a Spanish space agency with an important component of national security. Space has acquired high importance in national security. As an evidence, I can say that in 2019, they approved the first strategy for aerospatial security in Spain, which creates and develops the National Council for Aerospatial Security, which completes the strategy of the global common spaces, which are not regulated, where hybrid strategy find their best ideal habitat. Thank you very much. Due to time constraints, I shall stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ballesteros. And truly, you have posed many interesting 
reflections. And we're going to ask all of the speakers to be concise because we want to have you all speak here and debate with us today and tomorrow. Our next speaker, she is well known by all of you because from 2011 to 2018, she was the vice president of the Spanish government with Mariano Rajoy. She was the minister for uh, public administration. She was spokesperson for the government. She was a lot of things. She is partner of Cuadre Casas, legal form, and she's, go firm, and she's going to talk to us about strategy and about um, national security. I give the floor to Miss Soraya Sainz de Santa Maria. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was not able to be a Minister of Defense, and that is why I like speaking to you here. I would like, first of all, to thank um, all of you for the invitation to speak to you today and thank the strategic collaborators, the sponsors, the global um, partners that have allowed us to reflect upon something which is a topic that worries most of us and especially citizens. Whilst I had been in government, had I been told that we were going to be talking about budget and defense with this um, force, I wouldn't have believed it. I'm going to start by pointing out something that is repeated constantly since the pandemic and the geopolitical tensions, we live in a world where nothing is for certain and everything is volatile. And it is true that the increase of the geopolitical tensions has brought us to back to a world that we thought was part of the past, a world divided in blocks. And we are going back to polarization but I believe the Ukrainian invasion really what has brought to the surface is the tendencies and geopolitical um, forces that were being brewed in the last few years. The collapse of the liberal democracy. Since the economic crisis of 2008 and the institutional deterioration or the, really the loss of multilateralism in government, in tech battles between China and United States, to which we add the need of Russia to be part of everything. And I see that the two risks that we have now come together here, geopolitical ones and technological ones, that could lead to a more structural crisis. The fight for technopire, the lack of governance in this virtual world. General Ballesteros pointed to it, and I'm not going to go on about it, but we are looking at a hybrid world where there isn't as much a fight between armies, but a fight between societies on the whole. We um, are now in a world of um, hybrid threats. And um, we understand hybrid threats as coordinated actions and synchronized actions that spread from the secret services. And in the case of Russia, they attack systemic vulnerabilities in states or institutions, and they use very many means to do so. And they attack the political, the economic, um, social, military um, sectors, legal sectors, and they also use the cyberspace as one of their tools to serve their purpose. And what is their aim? What, are they, what do they want? What they want is to poke holes in our confidence of citizens' confidence in institutions and in the democratic system on the whole to convince us that the liberal system is on free fall. Their strategy is not inventing anything. They're just looking for cracks in our societies and diminishing them. 
In any conflict that there has been in the past, they have exploited instabilities. And what do they achieve with this? They justify and demonstrate the autocratic models and the good things that they have, if there are any. Autocracies and dictatorships try to demonstrate to their citizens that they are more efficient and that they can create more well-being than democracies. Our democracies are imperfect, but we respect civil society and human rights. We have seen a backwards tendency from the um, euph euphoria of, and optimism of the 90s. Only 25% of the global population lives under democratic regimes. 75% um, live in countries filled with dictatorship or autocratic regimes. So the first thing that I would like to share with you is that in this new time that we are living, the investment in security and defense should be aimed at allowing military capacities to the armed forces and also to give strong response to this situation, adapting the economy of security and national defense so that they can face um, geostrategic um, situations with China and Russia so that we may defend our democratic model. The second idea is that as a consequence of this polarization and its risks, we are living an inversion of the globalization process that started last century. We are going through new regionalization movements. They call them deglobalization, uh, going back on globalization. Um, Larry Fink and Blackboard um, expressed very clearly that the invasion of Ukraine ended globalization as we had gone through it in the last few decades. The demand of key um, raw materials, the energy um, crisis, the lack of supply chain is changing our mindset, governments and companies, and we are all reformulating our value chains, which means, and I think Germany is learning this, sacrificing efficiency in order to get back our resilience. And we are going to highlight security because facing dependency, we need to diversify. As a consequence, the investment in defense that we are fostering has to adapt to this new geostrategic concept and strengthen its logistic chains, the security of its supplies, and the strategic reserves which are necessary to dissuade and protect um, Spain and the European Union so that we may be autonomous. For now, uh, and it has been mentioned in the slides, we are witnessing a return to economic protectionism, a higher um, amount of interventionism, and the real reason for this is national defense, which requires more intervention and more presence in spheres that before of states, of course, where we weren't as present before. We're talking about national security in a very broad spectrum. National security um, plans that were planned, for instance, in 2015, already spoke about cybersecurity, energy security, um, maritime security space security, and of course, the environment. This concept fits really well with the new priorities and worries and philosophies that we have within the European Union. And we must not forget that the concept of um, strategic open um, concept, which is part of the economic um, section, is part of the defense strategy and facing the vulnerability of our union facing geopolitic situations, we need to strengthen all of this. We must aspire from the European Union to project um, its influence in the international um, stage and at the same time to defend our interests 
outside and within our borders. Protectionism within the European Union has seen um, the aid, the state aid that could have been given to international companies that wanted to enter the European um, sphere or the reinforcement of the um, strategic investment mechanisms. There are few questions that are as affected by geopolitics as perception and attitude um, of governments facing foreign investment. Of if um, a while ago investment in defense and aerospace was um, part of globalization, now we are seeing again that it is a very important example of lack of power in terms of what the government had been doing. The first warning came from the review of the competencies of foreign investment in, by the United States in 2018. But now what the Congress in the United States is discussing is not how we control um, foreign investment, but how we control the American investor that may be thinking in investing in suspicious states, so to call it, especially China. Before the pandemics, the European Union and the UK government, whose regime started in January, had expressed the need to reinforce the control of investment. The Spanish government applied the um, legal framework of 2019, which allowed a controlled regime and allowed member states to authorize previously investments that could affect national security and defense, and that could perhaps have impact on public order. And there was um, lack of trust towards um, China with the Road and Belt um, initiatives, for instance. The competent authorities um, which some of you are part of. And what worries them is the incursion of new investors and new governments in strategic sectors, of course, in defense. And that is always a worry. But I'm talking now about infrastructures, about energy, about sophisticated technology, or perhaps even sensitive data um, of our institutions and citizens. Doubtlessly, this has had an impact and will be bigger in the market of um, fusions and operations in our country and in Europe. But um, our control will allow us to not lose what we have. However, Europe must have tools and mechanisms that will allow it to bring all its policies and regulatory capacity and investments at the service of this vision. Europe needs a geopolitical strategy that allows us to incorporate the economic, energy, defense, and security and finance policies into it. And at the same time, we have to strengthen ourselves technologically and with regards to knowledge, facing the risk of misinformation and um, cyber attacks. That is the third idea that I would like to present to you. Investment in defense and security must have, of course, as the top of the agenda, investment in research, developing the industrial and technological sectors in Spain must be a must. The defense um, programs and cooperation programs allow industries in our country to be part of the European and global value chains. Yet new investments must always bear in mind not only the end military capacities, but also the technological value that they bring to the industry so that we can improve our position in the civil and military global markets. We need to create synergies between the industries so that we can provide activity, technology, and jobs to this national industry. In order to um, get to this point, we need to bear in mind two concepts. On the one hand, the absolute need to collaborate between uh, the public and private collaboration. 
in economy and transition, energy transition, technological development. None of this can be faced alone. And the public institutions cannot do it alone. They need the private sector. Both must be able to develop um, their um, work and understand the regulatory framework and the economic framework that this must be developed in. Yet our challenges are so big that um, this partnership is essential because of the investment it requires. I come from the public world and now I'm in the um, private world. Businesses are quicker at bringing talent, at giving more flexibility to the execution of projects and more resources to invest in research and um, development and knowledge. We need to keep this investment in a, a long period of time. The public sector, what do they require? What do the governments need to do? The great priorities of national policy and objectives, they should set them and then they should align the budgets, economy and um, finance so that we can create a um, law framework and rent that will allow us to bring into our country the necessary investments. This leads us to another idea, the absolute need of timely planning because our challenges are so big that they absolutely require political determination that is continued in time that will allow to give um, stability and guarantees to investment, public and private. None of the challenges that we have talked about are something that one term of government can face or two. Things cannot change in this aspect with every government because these challenges require social dialogue, um, political consensus. And I see that my um, ex-colleagues are in agreement. In parliaments that are more and more fragmented, political consensus is very rare. And it is made more difficult by the need that the political parties that share the same space need to be different from each other. And they are constantly picking at each other and thinking about voters and thinking about um, the general elections, local elections, the autonomous um, elections, and European elections. Thus, it is absolutely essential to give space to summits like these ones so that we can collaborate. And I know it's not in vogue, um, and but moderation requires that we come to certitude and that we can so that we can create a guideline for a country that requires it. In Spain, we have um, been able to come to agreements that have allowed us to face the future well. So let's learn from this ability that we have. And to draw my speech to a close, the time that we are going through is very volatile. The challenges and opportunities that come from the digital transformation and the um, climate emergency brings us to a geopolitical context that changes world order and is changing the geostrategic position of Western democracies. We are seeing many challenges, but underneath all of them is the greater challenge, which is linked to the principles and values that are linked to democracy. Europeans have first and foremost a responsibility that is linked to defense, to defend the legal framework that make safety and security the essence of any um, political action and democracy as the only coherent, legitimate way of protecting human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Soraya Sánchez Santa Maria, partner of Cuatro Casas and ex-vice president of the um, government and minister of pretty much anything except for defense. We are now going to um, move on to the next block 
of our summit, where we're going to analyze the European industry capabilities associated with security. We're going to be addressed by um, a gentleman, um, addressed online, by the Secretary General for Industry and SMEs, Ministry of Industry, Trade and Tourism, Government of Spain, Raul Blanco. Welcome to this video. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm sorry that I'm not there personally. That was my intention from the get-go um, when the summit organizers approached us. I want to say hello to Isabel Joan and the whole organizing committee of this wonderful summit. A summit that should be a reference for Seville, of course, a wonderful city, and reference for the aeronautical sector and of space. Because of its um, industrial and technology reality that the city um, goes through, because we really, you really host um, many important companies in defense, satellite, and aeronautical companies. And you also have universities that specialize in this issue. I would also like to extend my, well, my thanks to the Town Hall of Seville. We are at a key moment for the industry of defense and security in Spain. It was key before the pandemic, um, but the war situation of Ukraine have led us to understand better the need to have a defense and security sector which is robust and strengthened, a sector that has technological capability, and so that it can compete internationally and be very present within all of the European um, projects like the Future Combat Air System, FCAS, um, programs where the Spanish industry can have a strong presence and lead many technological elements. We have a defense sector and a security sector which has great capabilities. And of course, I add space because you are in the Space and Defense Summit. So I add space to this defense. And our sector has great businesses in land, air, and sea. And I guess after that, we have a wonderful range of niche technological companies and technological champions that demonstrate their abilities every day internationally. I'm sorry I'm not going to be in the round table that you will have afterwards. You will have the pleasure to um, listen to great companies like Indra. And you will also hear from this uh, wonderful technological champions um, like Escriba, Noma Dykes, um, sorry, like Indra, like Sapa. We all have to work together so that we can um, move forward and so that we can lead in at the European sphere. In Efgas and Navantia, with its fry grates. Ciao. We congratulate you, actually, um, because we um, are seeing that the um, the Portugal um, shipyards are going to be um, helping in contracts of the um, British Army. These are contracts at first world level um, and demonstrate our capacity technologically and of systems and all of the um, Navantia businesses. The satellite sector, which is very important also in civil, which will be very well represented throughout your summit. From here, from the Ministry of Industry, we promote, of course, together with the Defense um, Ministry, the Spain NGSAT and the new generation of satellites that are being designed by ESDESAT for defense and communications within governments. So again, we see local development of systems for communications and latest generation technology elements um, provided by Segner, the antenna for this new um, is this had satellites. All of these elements mean a very important peak for the satellite um, program. And it 
it's also key for the industry in our country, and it's going to mean a great step forward in the role that Spain can play as um, R&D and um, integrator of satellites within the private, private and public spheres. This whole new space branch that is developing very quickly where companies like Satlantis are really at the forefront of the European companies in terms of optical development and um, observation, sorry, and image um, tracking. Of course, Escribano and Mecanización is going to be in this round table and who are always at the forefront of all different programs, Technovit, in optronics and um, electronic development. I talked to you about all of this to share with you the abilities that we have, and that's what I would have wanted to share with you in person. All of this has to be linked to the moment that we are going through. In general, we're going through a, an industrial European reality, which means that we have recovered our industrial awareness, well, derived from the Ukraine war and the pandemic. We need to understand that we have to be sovereign in our technology and an industrial production. And of course, defense and security industry is essential there and strategic because this means being able to be defending ourselves against external threats. General Ballesteros um, will explain this um, need very well. The national security strategy really mark very clearly the threats um, that we may come up against, like um, pandemics, cybersecurity, climate, and defense issues. So within this context, when we understand the um, national security strategies, we have to understand that this is a lot more important than has been um, thought of beforehand. The answer to all of this is technology and interest industry, and thus we need Spain and Europe to be present in this movement forwards, and that's why the government has to reinforce and has to um, strengthen these industrial capacities. So from the department or the Ministry of Industry, our budget to support defense has gone above 1 billion euros. And next year, in the um, state um, budget, we will increase it again. So together with other ministries, like the Ministry of Defense, we are coming together in the understanding that we must invest more in this industry of defense. We must invest in um, long-term programs. We have a very good um, position in terms of the European sphere. We are leaders technologically like Airbus, and we want to continue being part of this ranking. And we want to play a part in this consolidation of capacities and strategic autonomy. We want to be a part of it in the next few years. The programs are broader and broader every time, and the need for funding is broader, and we need more aid. And thus, we need our defense industry to be very well prepared so that when we consolidate at European level, we may occupy our rightful position because we deserve it. That is why we must collaborate um, publicly and um, privately in the next few years. And also take, into, um, take to heart our recovery plan to promote technology in the realm of defense and security. Many of the technologies that you promote are dual. These programs can be used for more things. We can promote them with next generation funds within the different um, lines of the ministry. And we, of course, will create new ways in which we can promote um, technology companies and technology abilities in Spain so that we can look towards the 2030 agenda to um, the dual 
defense strategy because the defense industry is always at the core of technological um, disem technology dissemination because many technologies spring from your research. So we must strengthen our industrial and technological capacities, collaboration between private and public partners so that we may occupy the position that we should occupy within Europe. Continue to provide support to the um, current programs, land, air, and sea. Great news um, like the Avant Navantia ones and also um, use the recovery plan opportunity to promote um, the fostering of technology within the defense sector and, uh, of course, at a medium and long term. So thank you. You know that you can count on us as partners, as supporters constantly um, for the investment in industry within the realm of security, space, and defense. And we will, of course, um, be in contact in the next few um, events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General of Industry and SMEs, Mr. Blanco. After listening to the public sector's point of view, we want to listen to the private industry's point of view on our industry capacity in Europe. We give um, the floor to the CEO of Escribano Mechanical and Engineering, one of our strategic coordinators, Mr. Javier Escribano. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning. It's a pleasure for me to take the floor in this round table on the European industry's capacities associated to security, which I find rather interesting in our current situation. There is no doubt that this seminar is going to be an appropriate discussion forum on the current situation and the future of Spanish aerospace industry and Europe's industry in a historical context. Unfortunately, Ukraine's invasion by Russia has reminded us that security is a key factor in our democracies because they guarantee democracy, freedom, and European values, as well as ensuring international peace and the well-being of all our citizens. My apologies. I skipped the page. The war has shown the need for the European Union to undertake a common effort to develop and promote the industrial capacities that we have seen thanks to the transformation of advanced technologies. They open a new risk scenario, which is rather important, such as cybersecurity and responsibility. Therefore, we need to work on collective security and strategic interests of Europe, as we saw in the Versailles Declaration, in which the European Council said we established the foundations for the European Union to be up to scratch to the responsibilities and to protect the citizens' values and the democracies of the European Union. The European Union leaders have reiterated their commitment to be in charge of their own security to follow a strategic action line in the realm of defense and to increase their capacity to act auto autonomously. They have also insisted that it's absolutely key to keep a close coordination in security and defense with partners and allies, especially European Union NATO cooperation in full respect of the principles of inclusiveness, reciprocity, and autonomy in decision makings established in the various treaties. The continent has an industrial base for advanced defense, which is technologically efficient. But in order to meet the purposes I've just mentioned, we need to invest, make progress. In the Spanish case, the Spanish, the defense industry should be part of the defense policy of our country, because that would be the only way to give an immediate answer in risk scenarios. The state's capacity of defense is very closely related to the strength of its industry. And Spain, one of the leader countries of the European Union, we must promote that strength 
and to promote our capacities and advanced system to be at the forefront, which is where we belong. In order to increase competitiveness in this geopolitical context, which is rather convulsed, most Spanish defense companies are working to increase our strength, to promote alliances, and to increase the investment in, to give shape to an industry sector that must give the appropriate response to the challenges, opportunities, and responsibilities I've just mentioned. European governments and public authorities must also roll up their sleeves and make a budget effort, as they have already agreed, to allocate resources efficiently to promote technological excellence and to encourage greater participation in European projects of all types of Spanish industries of all sizes. The European countries cannot wa walk alone. We need to cooperate in alliance because they are absolutely paramount and Spanish industry must take the leadership role they deserve. At Escribano, we want to invest in innovation. We update our equipments and we give them the latest technology to develop the most advanced systems in the market. In Alcalá de Henares facilities, we have full manufacturing capability, precision optics, engineering, calculation, uh, both dynamic and structural calculation, and simulation of the systems we develop. All these research and development efforts have led us to being leaders in important areas, such as, for example, where the early Spanish and European era the manufactures kits for guided precision products. We export 90% of our production worldwide, mainly in Asia, Middle East, and Latin America. We have recently just arrived in the Indonesian market, where we have signed an important market for one of our products the Guardian 1.5 station. I am convinced that collaboration is the way to undertake industrial and technological product, projects of great magnitude that position the Spanish industry, defense industry worldwide. That is why my company collaborates with the main Spanish alliances and consortia such as VCR 8x8 Dragon and SMS Consortium. Our participation in TES, TES, where we do VCR 8x8 Dragon, which is a example of success and industrial collaboration in defense aimed at safeguarding the strategic capacities of Spain for the Spanish interest. So Escribano joining efforts with other companies such as Indra Santa Barbara or Chapa. We are also present in some European programs because we believe in the defense of our continent as our, the main actor of international defense. So please allow me to highlight the participation of our company in two projects approved by European Commission from 2021, from the European Project or Families too. European footage system, I think the speaker said. So we want to provide added value, and I also want to say that all the components we use in our production capacity have been, chain have been designed, manufactured in our Alcalá de Henares facility, which is in constant expansion, therefore guaranteeing the supply independence. My company believes that it is paramount to ensure training and engagement of young talent thanks to con agreements with tr professional training centers and universities in Spain. We've, we use the best Spanish talent because we have them and we want them to stay in Spain. And to cut a long story short, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all a nice day. Thank you very much, Angel Escribano. After these presentations, we are going to move on to the first round table, for which I would like to kindly ask to come on stage, Javier Escribano, Ignacio Mataix, Joaquín Ortiz, and Juan Escriña.
Bueno, vamos a comenzar esta... We are going to start this uh, round table. Firstly, Javier Escribano, CEO of Escribano Mechanical and Engineering, founder together with his father and brother Ángel of this little company which has become what it is today, a Spanish multinational with more than 500 employees and the strategic collaborator of our summit. Thank you very much, Javier, for being here. Next to him, we have Ignacio Mataix, CEO of Indra. Since 2018, he's worked in Indra, and before he was a senator, it's a bit and Talgo, and he has a long experience in um, business management. Welcome. Joaquín Ortiz is the strategic director of SAPA Placencia on behalf of Yvonne, uh, who is ill and had a last minute problem. He's around, he's here, but uh, he just rather, he prefer not to speak. In any case, thank you very much and welcome, Joaquín. He has worked in SAPA since 2018 as director of strategy. Well, not all in my life. I've, I've been in the public authorities most of my professional career. Lastly, Juan Escriña, executive director general of Santa Barbara Systems and vice president of artillery chain vehicles in GDELS. And we know them well because we have a facility in Alcalá de Guanaira. So, Welcome. I didn't say anything wrong, right? I've been all my life, actually. In this case, it's, it's true, and uh, I'm very proud of it. So I'm going to launch my first question. Capacities of the European and Spanish industry to face up the challenges. So let's talk about innovation first, and then about the industrial capacities. Regarding innovation, I would firstly like to have your opinion about where we are, very briefly. And if there's been a transfer of knowledge with the universities or companies of if that has happened to be able to make progress in this sense. Okay, I'll take the floor. From the technology point of view, the Spanish defense industry is very well positioned because thanks to an intelligent use of the public funds of the main programs, which dealt with the defense PAs in Spanish aimed at empowering the European, the Spanish industry so that they could be up to scratch and they were successful in that. In Santa Barbara, my colleagues as well, I guess, we have moved from in the past being a manufacturer under license to being licensees of our own products. So we have our own product, which has been nationally developed and is exported. Actually, more than 80% of our turnover it goes to export in Europe. Which means that the technological status of Spanish defense industry is actually rather good. So we are well positioned to make the most out of the current context. We are uh, well along the lines of Juan, the PA investment, which was 30,000 mi million in the special armament programs that meant that they broke through the barrier of being just receiving offset to working on the license to developing our own patents. It is then when the industry started to develop. In the 80s, with F-18, the technology arrived to Spain, and with these Spanish PAS, these Spanish public programs for armament, the companies developed a greater technological development, and there's a key program, and some people even say bad things about it, but you're a fighter. You're a fighter has allowed to keep our defense industry at that le level. My company, Sapa, did not participate in Eurofighter, but other companies which have found it a turning point for their 
technological progress. Ignacio? Well, uh, took up the glove from Joaquin because I think he mentioned something rather relevant. And yes, there have been two quantitative leaps, one the PASs in Spain and the technological empowerment, but the other turning point and the quantum leap of our Spanish industry, which uh, has not touched all sectors, but most of them, that was transnational European programs such as Eurofighter, where we compete, where we collaborate, and where we show our technological capacity vis-a-vis -vis main European colossus, which are way bigger than us. And we are competing not on an equal footing, because there was a learning curve for us at the beginning of the 90s with relevant programs such as Zero Fighter. But we have had actually a, a strategic empowerment development. We are where we are. There is still a long way to go. There is a race. This is a marathon. And we are fighting for technological and advances. But we have a really good foundation for it. Javier, following the Eurofighter pathway, how my company started working for 20 years ago as a component manufacturer. And Angel and I decided 12, 14 years ago to, be, to stop being a component manufacturer and to become uh, the manufacturer of our own products. So we invested in R&D to pursue our ideas. And we are currently participating in national and international programs. But the national industry's capacity uh, is on equal footing with other European countries oh, from other continents. We're talking about defense technology and our capacity in that realm. In the case of space, there is innovation transference, dual technologies that are using, being developed in parallel, or are these two segments that are completely apart? Do you mean space and defense? Well, um, I was in the past at the minister's office, and the space industry is key in Europe, and it's very narrowly delimited. And it is obviously dual technologies. But there are true experts in the room that coming from space companies. But this industry is heavily regulated, coordinated, and controlled by a Spanish agency, which has a lot to say about everything, regardless of the fact that the member states have made a decision of having their own national space agencies. But when I was on the other side, I always said that defense industry is always conditioned by the national defense policy and the tools um, that the Minister of Defense says. So that's when we talk about PPPs. It's obviously a clear idea because we have a national customer, which is only one, plus international customers stemming from this PPP. In the space industry, we have a European regulation which is rather taxing, or sort of like clearly present. And this is my previous expertise as a political analyst, but I'm sure that uh, um, he can answer better. Well, space industry and defense industry in general, I think there is a large symbiosis between the industry and the industrial capacity in industry and civilian. In the, and it has happened not only from the world of defense, but also from the world of the civil um, industry. And that's the beauty of the symbiosis. And there are clear examples in the aerospace industry, not only in the aerospace for uh, aircraft engines. In Intel, there are cases where there is one we are making radars for the defense industry. And we have just won a tender to renew the radar park in Germany for air traffic, which is more than 100 million. So that's based on our capacity generated in the defense industry. So that symbiosis is, is crystal clear. And I think it runs in both ways, not only in defense, because we also learn from the civil civilian world, and then we apply to defense. And I think that's the one of the beauty of this industrial um, 
industry. Do you want to say something about it? Otherwise, I will ask you about some of the things that we have heard this morning, such as uh, General Ballesteros said that in the dissuasive side, it's not so much about manufacturing hundreds of tanks, but about having state-of-the-art technology in the world. Do you share this thought? Don't you think that we need to combine both? Do you think that we need to promote one of them? I think that we, I think of course we need to share that. This is mass and quantity and we need to, The we have the advanced force, meaning we need to be above your opponent's capacity. That's the only way to guarantee clear dissuasion. So technological development at all levels is key. This is what is what this is what runs on the ground or what it's surveilling us from space. And that is what we are all working on in our industry. One of the wonderful things of this type of industry is that all our products, regardless of the scope, they are on in the limit of the technically possible side and they always push beyond. So that's fascinating, actually, for those of us who are fortunate to professionally work in this field. It's amazing because this is a constant challenge and the only way to be superior and to guarantee this dissuasion is to stay there, to stay up the limit, in the upper limit of what is technically possible. Escribano is a good example of uh, using top technology because you were beginning as a manufacturer and you grew, right? Yeah, right. We are a true example of that. We are a company that began in manufacturing and we have always invested in technology. We have always developed our own projects, products and we have always supported our own people for young talent and the personal growth of our team. We are a company that invested a lot in R&D. We've always been firm believers in R&D. We've never invested that an euro that has not been multiplied by three or more and we just believe in that. We believe in the potential development of technologies which in the future will allow us to stay always at the top, at the very top. So talking about these thoughts, the former De vice president of the government, Ms. Sainz de Santa Maria, talked about promoting the European common defense policy. Of we have pr promoted the European common economy. And there is a greater awareness now of that after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So do you think it is necessary? I mean, I guess you do, but do you need to, you need to promote uh, European policies and uh, private also transfer of knowledge for the defense industry? Any of you? The idea is just to open it for, for uh, discussion. As we all said, it all started with, Eurofighter, with programs such as Eurofighter, the European Defense Fund, and the preparatory actions of the European Defense Fund, and the technological development projects where I think some companies have taken this very seriously uh, for this Europe of Defense, and we have participated actively probably more than we should in the Spanish uh, quota on those programs. And I think these programs will be driving forces for technological development. And we started to see this, such as FCAS or ground combat system that will articulate the European defense industry, that will consolidate the European defense industry. And going back to technology, if we want to keep a, a strategic sovereignty in Europe, those programs will help the companies to develop their technologies and it will be what defense in Europe will be at the end of the day. <clears throat> Following up on that, the key of these programs, of these international cooperation programs, is the need to understand what Europe is and would compare it to China and the US. 
So Europe needs to find itself. The states, which is the big defense power, had to abandon programs such as F-22. F-25 was implemented with a huge effort and having many com big countries on top. And Europe has to do its own work, and I think they are doing it now. It is important uh, to talk about FCAS, which is a, in a way a pending subject, and it's a need Europe has to try and keep that technological level, which is key. So we're talking a lot about China, but regarding defense and cooperation, well, and the technological race with China is more military than technological. Our rival, our opponent, uh, regarding technology is the states. Europe has to do its homework to be the US partner, but also to have our own companies at that technological level. As Soraya Santa Maria said, companies have an important role to play because they are more flexible and they've managed to be faster in adaptation compared to the public sector that takes longer, but when they, they get to it, they are faster, right? But as private companies, have you noticed in the last few years this uh, progress? Yes, undoubtedly, there's been an acceleration in the sector. And um, obviously, we need to be prepared and we need to be more at the European level, which is a clear need. Europe needs to find itself. We can't not trust, safeguarding our freedom and sovereignty. We cannot only rely on the other side of the pond. And the industry clearly is part of it. And the defense industry is part of the defense strategy. And we are, or we must be another partner to guarantee that dissuasive capacity that we talked about and that sovereign sovereignty in technology. So we to open up more and more and to know that in the big programs have to be developed in the European scope in the future. Obviously, the industry needs to be empowered and um, technologically and uh, humanly. But we mustn't forget that we need to empower our armed forces uh, from the technological and human point of view. And um, they require more capacity to have this symbiotic capacity with the companies that, that need more support. I mean, we mustn't forget that we need to increase our investment in the armed forces. Yeah, I would like to know how the the interaction is between Spanish companies. Is there a collaboration? Because we are competitors, right? But between the driving forces and the tier two. So what is your experience in that sense? Where well, our experience is very good. We were part of TEST, which is a great example of collaboration of four companies and many other companies in the project. And our experience has taught us that we need to collaborate with national companies. I think that the industry is very settled. They are convinced that collaboration between companies is a priority. And I think we are in the right track. And taking into account that we have a good future ahead, collaborating and working together. Collaboration is key. Javier talked about tests, and the four test partners are here in this round table, and that's the way to go. We contribute with our field of expertise, what well, Mr. Blanco said before, about the national champions in each sector. So we all brought our expertise to the common project. So we started collaborating in the company management. We provided the design authority for our systems and we worked hand in hand on a daily basis in this program. So there is unanimity in collaboration. With regards to your collaboration with the rest of the European um, companies, <coughs> we have seen um, our participation in consortiums. Um, we are participating in FCAS for the first time in equilibrium with the rest of the countries. So in general terms, what is the collaboration with private um, European companies like? 
In our case, we have collaborated with European companies, but we don't have the same fluid communication and objective alineation than when we have um, worked with national companies. The smaller projects allow us um, to um, to share um, with companies that are of the same size in the in our country, but not as much in Europe. However, um, the FCAS program is going to allow us to understand how the European collaboration is working, and it will allow us to um, see how well we do so. And I think the strategic um, guide with regards to investment in Ukraine it states that we need to stress the cooperation within the different um, Eurozone countries, and it fosters initiatives such as the PESCO programs, like the um, European Defence Fund cooperation programs. And so they're trying to foster that relationship. It is more complex, I think, at European level, because you cooperating um, with other industries with regards to a specific project independently of whether you have alliances to cooperate in technology. But it all really has to do with the framework and within which you're working, the European, the uh, supply uh, joint development program. So it is true that you, the European Union and the Commission are trying to foster these collaborations, and they play a very important role. But I always say that there is a need in Spain to, first of all, do what we must do within our country to deal with our strategic autonomy and our national strategic capabilities. That is our priorities. When we have our house in order, then we can do everything else. Um, so until this is not consolidated, and yes, of course, the regulatory framework and the help from the government is absolutely essential because it's a, um, an essential strategic capacity, yet we need to carry on working internally within the um, European Cooperation Alliance I really believe that we must define very clearly what essential capabilities we want to develop in Spain. And we have to provide funds to develop the technologies that these essential capabilities require. And those we cannot share. When we work in cooperation programs, we share technology, yet our competitors are used to developing their own technologies with their own programs when they don't want to share them. And then we identify the ones that we, want to sh we don't want to share and what basic te technologies we want to develop. And Ignacio, go back to you because I want to focus the debate on the FCAS program. There's a before and after. Um, Indra plays a very important role as coordinator in Spain. Please let us know briefly what do you think this will um, have as impact in the next few years. We are um, at the end of the closing and signing part of the program. And I think something that is essential is that the government of Spain has decided to participate equally um, with the French and German government and spearheading the program. And I think this is a fundamental step and a very important one for the armed forces and the industry, which will allow us to be part of the decision-making platforms and forums because they're very relevant as they discuss which technologies are going to be developed, how we're going to share them, and who's going to do what. Also, the FCAS is a program which is going to foster the um, technological development of the next few generations. And the combat types, the F, and, we're, and the different technologies. So. 
It is the new um, framework, and we must participate. And it's going to really be leading the European industry and the countries that are participating within it. Also, it is a long-term program essential for technological development, which we haven't had before. And this provides stability. And it's fundamental in technological development, but also it's stability for people because they are the ones that um, create teams and they require challenges at, at long term. So the fights for talent and the budget stability that these programs provide are essential. Please, what is SAPA's expectation from a program like this and what is it going to imply for the Spanish industry and for your companies? And Escribano as well. For us, um, it would be a success um, for the program to be launched in the next few months. We are not a fundamental um, part of the project signing, yet we understand that Indra is the coordinator of the project. And we um, understand that they are going to um, bring us in um, as providers and subcontractors in projects that we may offer help. I think it's a very important opportunity for the national industry and all the companies have to internally analyze what capacities we can bring to the table. How can we adapt them to the needs that the FCAS is going to have? It's a system, FCAS is a system of systems that will allow a lot of the industrial sector to participate. So it is the time to understand the um, strategic capabilities of companies and also those that the administration and defense want to project in programs like FCAS and allow them to grow within these programs because we have this double um, possibility. What does Spain want from this industry and how does FCAS allow us to develop it as well as w the collaboration with our partners from our point of view, the advantage of ESCAB, FCAS is the development of the industry of defense and the capabilities. In Santa Barbara, we really are participating on the ground systems. Um, so this system is really an air system. Uh, so we're not linked um, immediately or directly from it, but we are going to benefit from the technological development of our national industry because um, that will impact the um, land programs as well. Another question. We have seen that in the current um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, drones are playing an essential role we had um, actually a conference about drones a month ago here, and the people um, addressing us were saying that drones are going to be used a lot more. Do you see a development in the industry of drones, um, and do you see it in the future? Is it going to mark the tendency of the war within, um, between Russia and Ukraine? When we talk about a system of systems and we talk about FCAS, within which the um, air platform is essential. We're also talking about remote carriers or drones, unmanned aircrafts. All of them will play a very relevant role in the future because they can carry out missions that are different from an airplane. And also, they represent an alternative um, for um, scouting or for surveillance. So I think the development of the role, the drone industry is going to be um, very much increased in the future. You've been talking about the very good collaboration existing between Spanish companies. Yet, um, what does the um, Spanish industry require from the government so that they can um, push forth the 
industrial capabilities of the country. All the speakers have pointed to it, like the general's intervention or the um, former vice president. We need stability. We need state pacts. And foremost, we need to understand that we we need to understand that investment in defense is essential, that it's not an expense, it's an investment, and that stability is absolutely essential in order to achieve what we have been pointing to, keeping talent, technological development, and being able to have the Spain occupy the position that we must have as fourth economy within Europe. From the technical point of view, it's absolutely essential to understand how um, technological capabilities are prioritized nationally with regards to these programs. Could you please speak a little bit more about this? Now we're talking about urgent needs. I've been uh, working within defense 18 years, but really the army are the ones that understand what the priorities are. Everything is very well structured from the point of view of um, how the army plans um, their resources and how this goes up towards the different stages of um, the authorities. It is that um, department that has to um, understand the priorities because the GEMAP, the military side, has already um, pointed to the priorities. And in defense, up until now, things have been in a cascade motion, but they should be linear because the prioritization of the resources horizontally should match um, the priorities that the military have. So for me, what is key is how planning in terms of the materials and the strategic capabilities for national security are inserted in the planning of the uh, military resources. I believe that we are doing what we must do when we participate in European program. Um, budgetary stability in order to develop technology is essential, and we must not forget this within the framework of more um, instability economically that will come in the next few years. In our industry, things can't be done from today to tomorrow because developing or manufacturing any project or product requires years. So we need stable budgets for this. And Javier, really, with regards to what everybody has said, we believe that we have to have a budgetary stability in order to develop technological program that required time, and I think this stability is key because really no defense program is shorter than four or five years. And also we believe that um, fostering the national industry is essential, and I think the state um, supporting national industries who are trying to push forth their projects, future and products, their support is essential. And I also believe that really what we must do is carry on down this path. And one of my penultimate, penultimate questions regarding human resources, the creation of this technology is done by a very um, well educated um, and very well trained people. So. Do you feel that there is lack of prepared um, people for th to carry out this sort of role? Like any other company, we try to keep talent. And years ago, we started um, collaborating with um, universities. We have um, agreement with the University of Alcalá and other universities in Madrid. And we believe that incorporating young talent within the defense 
industry so that in the future we can have a technological team and base which is really um, fostered, fostering youth. Because if we foster young talent, that means we don't need to bring it um, from abroad. So when we say that we want to support the national um, industry, we mean also that we must hire all of the Spanish talent that is already studying and is already existing so that they may not leave and go to other countries. So another question regarding um, human resources, Ignacio. Of course, there is a fight for talent at world and European level as well as Spanish. Within defense and security, we believe that it is a very um, attractive industry, which was not the case a few years ago. And that tendency to not consider um, our industry interesting means that people are not as inclined to work for us. Our industry is transforming um, technology, and I think that this will attract talent and, of course, a lot of um, work with universities and young people that will allow for talent to be attracted by our industry. And undoubtedly, in this day and age, um, technology is developed by people and is the case in defense and non-defense industries. We are in Guipuzcoa, in the north of Spain, and it's not easy because there's a lot of industry in the um, Basque country. So we're constantly fighting for talent. We have also got agreements with universities and we have um, grants. Yet our position is difficult because there's a lot of competitivity and competence within um, talent. Yet um, engineering and talent are the heart of Saba. And Juan Esquina, in Spain there is talent and the defense industry offers a lot of um, possibilities to develop that talent. We're always, always at the verge of um, trying to do impossible things. We are the second sector after the pharmaceutical one that invests more in research and development. And um, really, our industries save the fact that we are not very popular or haven't been as popular because they didn't want to talk about it or be a part of our industry, yet we are a very um, attractive industry for young talent. The rotation between within our engineers is minimum, and the professional development that we offer is great. Is it difficult for you to um, get the talent that you need? No, actually. We collaborate with universities and technological centers. And when we get talent for ourselves, we really don't find it difficult. And of course, we do a lot of internal training. And last intervention, I know you are companies that um, always plan short-term, long-term. I would like to um, discuss um, short-term. When we meet next year, in our next summit um, edition, what would you like to have achieved short-term? What are the most urgent issues that have to be achieved in this coming year? publicly and privately, of course. Budgets. The 2023 budget. We need to have a Chapter 6 um, budget articulated very well. So let's see if in a year this has been executed, this um, budget. And this will have allowed the national industry to um, benefit from this um, budgetary um, thrust forward. What should we have achieved next year when we meet again? 
um, to have signed FCAS. And this should be very short term. And of course, the second thing, when we see the budget of 2024, to really see a, an increase in defense budget and that the discussion is very advanced by this time next year. There is a consensus with regards to the budget and after the um, NATO um, summit in Madrid, there seems to be a consensus with regards to the need to increase constantly the defense budget, correct? Because really, um, we need to comply with the NATO commitments. Am I being controversial in my question? So what we must do is allow for this to happen, to have this impact the national industry. And from my point of view, we also need um, a very important program for the army, which is left behind more often than not. So when there is budget, we really <coughs> need to look back to the army. And Javier, of course, I agree with everything that has been said by you all. And um, Ignacio, FGAS has to be signed because it will mm, help us a lot. And I think also um, a land program is also essential. We're also speaking about space. Last question. With regards to development within space, do you think it's the right time? Um, what is the position of Spain with regards to Europe? We have focused a lot on defense. So let's talk about space in the last few moments of our round table. With regards to space, our contribution, which has increased in the last few years, is far from the contribution that countries like France and Germany provide in terms of the contribution matched to the GDP. Yet we are in a much better position than we were before. The space industry has great companies that compete, that are here in this panel, and they are doing what they must do. There are um, lead technological companies um, that are below the tier one companies are also doing a very good job. And we have a lot of work ahead of us and a lot of um, road ahead of us with regards to space, not only with a civil application, but also with defense um, application and mobility. Indra we ha has a um, air traffic project. And so um, airspace is going to be a lot more um, integrating. Would anybody else like to intervene? So, in this case, thank you, Javier Escribano, CEO of Escribano Mechanical and Engineering, Ignacio Matais, Chief Executive of Indra, Joaquin Ortiz, um, Director of Strategy of SAPA, and um, of course, the, um, Joaquin, the Executive Director of um, the other companies, um, thank you very, very much for your participation. The authorities are going to join us um, for the official opening of this summit. First of all, we wanted to show you um, a welcoming video to this very wonderful city of Seville while we await.
por favor. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the um, institutional opening of the State Space and Defense Industry Civil Summit or the summit of um, the space and defense industry that we are celebrating here today and tomorrow in Seville. It is the third that we have, but it's the first one where we see our, each other's faces. It's been a year of very many changes. Geostrategically, things have changed a lot. And in this um, institutional opening, I'm going to ask um, Mr. John Kloss, the Commissioner for the Space and Defense Industry Civil Summit, to the floor. Thank you very much. We already started working this morning. And I really must share with you that my first impressions are ex of extraordinary work. I want to thank everyone that has been part of the uh, interventions pre prior to me. They have really set the scene to what we're going to discover within these um, conferences. Many of us will speak to you, so I'm going to be very brief. We are very happy on behalf of the organization because of your participation and how this summit has been so important. It is a very opportune moment, a time when we need efficiency, coordination, dialogue, consensus, and more ingredients. We um, are quite certain that there are going to be more resources provided to this industry, something that has been requested by the different sectors many a time, sectors which are innovative and are competing in activities with neighboring countries and are cooperating with regards to industry in Europe. And really, within Europe, the coordination level is increasing, thankfully, but also competitiveness is increasing. I'm not going to mention all of the authorities here present, because if we mention authorities in this sector, we could spend a long time doing so. So please allow me to present um, Mr. Antonio Muñoz, the mayor of Seville, um, whom I thank, also thank the representative of this Congress Center, Seville Fibes, a wonderful Congress Center, a conference center. It is the third time that you organize this summit. So thank you very much. I would like to also thank Ms. Maria Amparo Valcarce, Secretary of State for Defense, CDFE, Ministry of Defense of the Government of Spain. We have had the opportunity to listen to um, also, no, we are going to also listen to Timo Pesinen, Managing Director or CEO of the Industry of Defense and Space of the Co European Commission. We have among us as well Ángel Esquivano, President of Esquivano Mechanical and Engineering Group, who is the strategic sponsor of this summit. Uh, Mark Murdra, President of Indra. Jordi Areo, President of Espasat. Um, Almiran Santiago Bolívar, Chairman of the Board of Directors of ISDESAT and Jose Serrano, Managing Director of GMV. I would also like to thank the global sponsors that are listed here with their um, logos. Aside from Escribano, we have ISPASAT, INDESAT, GMV, INDRA, NAVANTIA, SAPA, TECNOBIT, and General and GDL Santa Barbara Systems, as well as our collaborators, Lockheed Martin, MBDA, Spain. Really, we have mentioned everything that was important to us. We're here to work. We're here to network as well, and to uh, really um, create links between um, the sectors so that we may make a 
it one that is representative of our future. And really, you represent very well the capabilities of our country, Spain. It is also important to remember that we are here to produce, to generate contents beyond the, the declarations that you make. We really need facts, facta non verba, as the classics would say. We are here to make this sector transform and take advantage of the opportunity given to us to take a step forward, a leap forward, in fact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Joan Clos, Commissioner of the Space and Defense Industry Civil Summit. Now I'm going to give the floor to the different speakers of this institutional opening. I would ask you to be brief. Please feel welcome and feel you're at home, but please be brief. So now we're going to give the floor to the general director of GMV, Mr. Jesus B. Serrano, or managing director, sorry. Um, Secretary of State, Mr. Mayor, authorities, authorities, President, good morning to you all. I would like to, first of all, thank all of you for co coordinating and creating this summit. GMV was founded uh, mid-80s with the vocation to contribute to the space industry in Spain. We diversified quickly and started working for the defense sector. And after that, we worked with other sectors, yet always focusing on the fact that we wanted to be leaders um, using innovation and technological development so that we could give um, answers to the needs of our clients. In the last 40 years, our company has been developed, um, focusing on clients' commitments, um, adding to the value chain, and of course, innovation and technology. Today, GMV, with more than 3,000 professionals highly qualified working in this multinational, we have, um, we are Spanish, but we have um, offices in 80 um countries. And we work for the Defense um, Ministry in 75% of our activities. For us, what is essential is the technological leadership and the responsibility that we bear within all of the different markets and segments that we operate, which demonstrates the competitiveness of our technologies and the satisfaction of our clients with our clients and flexibility, um, quality and reliability. The Space infrastructures have a great impact on the economy, the environment, and citizens. On the other hand, defense systems contribute considerably to the stability of our society and its stability. That is why GMV are proud of contributing to Spain, occupying the place that it should occupy within space and defense. And we will face the challenges that the administration put before us. We believe that this summit will be a success, and it is the great um, place for all of us to come together and also to raise awareness um, and public um, understanding with regards to defense and the role that we play within our society. Thank you very much. Gracias al director general de GMV. Thank you very much to the um, managing director of GMV. Now I'm going to give the floor to the president of the, the chairman, sorry, of the board of directors of his desat, Mr. Um, uh, Admiral Santiago Bolivar. Excellency um, Secretary of State of Defense, um, Excellency Mayor of Seville, Presidents, Partners, Collaborators of this summit. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, good afternoon to you all and thank you for allowing me to take the floor representing ISDESAT before you all. You are a wonderful public, and I am thankful for your presence here. 
I also would like to congratulate the organizers for the very opportune third summit here in Seville, because really Seville is wonderful. It is a very opportune moment for this summit because in the times of crisis, and we are amongst a crisis, the industry is the engine for recuperation and research, and R&D is really the fuel for that um, engine. So in research and development is essential for the defense industry and, of course, aerospace. We really provide a lot of the research and development, and I think this is the right place because Seville is the first official center um, for aerospace. And really, it's not um, in the Palacio de San Telmo um, in um, the 16th century had a department that studied astronomy, which was essential for navigation. From here um, departed the expedition of the first um, tour around the world, which returned here the 8th of of September was the 500th anniversary of their return. And from this moment on, really, most of the expeditions that explored the Pacific and the rest of the world set off from this part of the world. And it is opportune because if there's anything similar to um, airspace is the oceans and the Pacific, immense, beautiful oceans that required the highest technology of the 16th century. Sometimes we wonder how um, international legislation and order of aerospace and space is going to develop. Well, I think it's going to be similar to that of oceans. We should f be prepared for the international legal um, battle that will be disputed with regards to space and aerospace and its industry. And the great strategic importance and economic importance and of other areas like defense, security, intelligence, that this sector and that this part has implies that some players try to control it and that conflicts arise. Thus, the European Union and NATO and Spain have defined space as an operational sphere from 2020. 2001, sorry, his dissent um, is gestated as a public-private collaboration trying to solve the needs for satellite communications, then um, world preservation. And this springs from the need to have framework in this respect in 2005 and 6 two um, satellites were launched and they still carry out their role in space in 2018 the path was launched which um, is fulfilling its defense commitments 100 percent and now we are working on the replacement of these two satellites with new generation satellites which also, and also the replacement of the bath and the launching of a new satellite, optical satellites. These defense programs, by the way, the satellites that we are building are the most advanced in Europe in terms of telecommunications and space. These defense programs, well carried out by ISDESATs, have been very important for this Spanish space industry, fundamental in allowing the levels that we have reached within this industry. Five centuries ago, before the beginning of the um, exhibition in the um, Reales Alcázares de Sevilla, there was a meeting between the main actors of this fair, and they spoke. Today, it is our duty to meet here and remembering that history did well back then, and this is the path that we should follow so that we should continue um, doing so. <coughs> and congratulations to Carlos Ruiz Alores, and thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Almirante Santiago Bolívar. Thank you very much, Admiral Santiago Bolívar, President of the Board of INSESAT, for their presentation. We're going to move on to the next speaker, President of INSESAT, Jordi Ereu.
Dear Secretary of State, dear Mayor of Seville, authorities, both civil and military, dear friends. Two months ago in Ispasat, we celebrated together with our stakeholders the launch on the 11th of September 1992 of our first satellite. It was a very ambitious and exciting project. The follow-up of this launch was done from Seville's Universal Exhibition, so it was a big citizens' event that uh, happened on the occasion, and my CEO, Mr. Panduro, told me about this. It was actually the kickoff of an amazing adventure for the whole country, actually. Ispasat has had a business dimension because a big company was born which is a satellite telco operator competing in an international market which is highly competitive highly innovative and we have always had the dimension of having a country strategic pro project at the surface of spain america and now the whole of the atlantic side of the world, so a big chunk of the planet. So for us, being back in Seville 30 years later, discussing the present and the future of such key industries, such as space, defense, and security, makes all sense. That is why we have the alliance of two large forces. One is the powerful industry from Seville, Seville's vocation. I hope your dreams become true very soon. And I also want to express the energy of one person, Isabel Atkinson. The addition of Isabel Atkinson plus Seville make it possible to host this event here. And Ispasad has been backing it from the beginning, from the first edition, hand in hand, with the organization of this event. I started talking about space and the, the space industry and the export of the space industry. A year ago, we thought that we should also add the dimension of security and defense. So I think it, it makes even more sense. So after 30 years, we are here in this big event we should be an event for fa on facts and exchange of knowledge to be faithful to the excitement of that collective project, which was born 30 years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President of Ispasat, and congratulations for your celebration. In Seville, we also have our 30th anniversary. Our next speaker is the President of uh, Indra, Mark Motra. Dear Secretary of State, Mayor, authorities, dear friends, good morning. I would like to start thanking the organizers on behalf of Indra for having allowed us to participate in this event on space and defense industry. This type of events are extremely necessary for our industry, and we have to do our utmost to make sure that our industry gains visibility in our society. So if we are going through a transcendental stage for our industry, and this is no exaggeration. Last Friday, just to give you a recent and relevant example for all of us, even Indra, we reached an industrial agreement to have the future combat air system, FCAS, equally participated by France, Germany, and Spain where Indra is the national coordinator and the international leader of the pillar of sensors. This program enables the construction of Europe, the technological development, the creation of industrial fabric and high qualification jobs. As I said, as it was stated by our Ministry of Defense in a press release, in the pathway to arrive to the future air forces of Europe, we can see that we can jointly solve the challenges. 
And this morning, we talked about the importance of Eurofighter for our industry, for our industrial empowerment, and for our future in the 80s. So I think FCAS is equivalent or even higher in importance. The aerospace industry is showing its strategic character and importance. The Russian invasion to Ukraine has dragged Spain and Europe to an uncertainty scenario with greater risks for defense and security. This conflict has caused a sudden acceleration of geostrategic dynamics that were there from before, in which we need to focus more on the European security, as it was already mentioned in all strategic agendas. So a number of layers of the Spanish and European societies, after decades of relative peace and security in Europe, have unfortunately had to discover, again, that no civilization is possible without defense. There is no democracy without security, no rule of law, no freedom, human rights, SG, schools, companies, nothing. So guarantee and security is a prerequisite for everything else. Therefore, we appreciate that most of Spanish and European society and their institutions have quickly evolved in their opinion on the defense priority. And, and therefore, the investment needed to guarantee it. Even reviewing traditional historical neutrality policies in countries such as Sweden and Finland. As a consequence, we are going through a moment in which our sector has a lot to give to. The increase of budget and the increase in integration in defense open up new opportunities for our industry. The Spanish industry is an exporting industry mainly, which talks about its competitiveness. We create high quality jobs and is R&D intensive. I am convinced that our industry can play a key role in the evolution of our economy. This morning, uh, we have seen it, and therefore, our industry can give response to an intense digitalization and continuous sophistication of the technology. Only if we have our own technological industry, we can preserve our sovereignty, our capacities, our jobs, and we can opt to have a relevant position in the European defense network. And I work, and we, ha we know this, Indra. We are assertively working to become a benchmark player in Europe and the world in the scope of defense to position Spanish industry amongst the leading industries in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, President of Indra, Mark. Murtra, we give the floor now to the president of Escribano Mechanical and Engineering, one of our strategic partners of this summit. Ángel Escribano. Pues, buenos días a todos. Good morning. Thank you very much for being here with us at the opening of Space and Defense Industry Civil Summit. I want to thank the Spanish president of the government for supporting this summit and also the authorities present in this opening ceremony, the mayor of Seville and secretary of state, Ms. Balcarce. Escribano, my company, supported this idea from the very beginning because we are firmly convinced that, as I said earlier, we are at a crucial crossroad when it's necessary to discuss and debate between aerospace and defense and security in Spain, where our group has a clear industrial base and a forefront technology. Our business capacity is inspired in an innovative vision with constant innovation, new technologies that have shaped perseverance, commitment, and versatility that we are very proud of. Therefore, we have clear coincidences between our point of view and what we want this summit to be. A good stirring to 
an impetus to launch our industry in Spain because it's the tool for democracies to keep freedom and evolved in the European framework. Let's not forget that the first editions of the summit only talked about aerospace, but it is true that they are go hand in hand with defense. So it's a clear example of cooperation and joint development. At Escribano, we support the space and defense industry in Spain, which is versatile and open to new technological challenges, new markets that promote competition at the European standards. We are firmly committed with society. And I mentioned earlier how important training is for us and collaborating with universities and vocational training institutions that allow us to create a stable and high qualified job. During the pandemic, we could also give to the country our technological activities, resources, and facilities, as well as our will to serve. Allow me to finish by thanking you for your participation in this summit, which will be intense, productive, and will shape the discussion needed in our industry at a crucial moment for our industry and for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angel Escribano, President of Escribano Mechanical and Engineering and Strategic Collaborator of the Summit. And after these presentations from the large companies that are here with us, we give the floor to the authorities that are with us here today. The first will be talking to us uh, with an online connection. He wanted to be here. He is Director General of Industry, Defense and Space, Timo Pesone. Dear participants, space is a strategic domain and an established defense theater. It is increasingly contested and contested. These days, state actors have the means and cap capacities to run hostile activities against space assets. It is therefore imperative that the European Union enhances its strategic posture in space to defend its interests. To that end, we intend to present our space strategy for security and defense early next year with a two-pronged objective. To protect our space assets and enhance our resilience, and secondly, to better use space for defense and develop resilient services for military applications. With this key strategy, the European Union will be breaking the silos between space and defense, maximizing all possible synergies. But objectives of resilience and sovereignty also require technological non-dependence. This is a must in the current geopolitics. In that sense, advanced technologies represent a key vector for developing our space infrastructures and provide services for our citizens. For example, telecommunication technologies for 5G and future 6G, quantum cryptography for securing communication, artificial intelligence applied to Earth observation space data, or technologies for robotics explorations. They will be game changers to maintain the European Union at the forefront in the space domain while ensuring the competitiveness of the European space industry. Technology relies on research. Our Horizon Europe research framework is a strategic means to enable the development of a European-based advanced technology. We will allocate at least 100 million euros until 2027 to achieve such technological edge. In parallel, we should also build a space window in the European Defence Fund to develop the technological building blocks required for defence applications. But space and defence should also become top priorities in other EU initiatives aiming at reducing dependencies. It is important to for instance, that the CHIPS Act and the Critical Raw Material Act clearly recognize the specificities of space and defense in case to reducing dependencies. And finally, a reference to innovation and skills, which are also instrumental to change. Innovation and skills are the natural turf of new space actors. They can bring new ideas, solutions, disruptive technologies, and efficient industrial processes, also in support of security and defense. Cassini is our leverage in support of new space. We should accelerate its deployment. Furthermore, we will also take actions to inspire and train a growing skilled workforce for space technologists and scientists in the security and defense community of the Union. 
Thank you very much, and I wish you a nice conference. Pues muchas gracias al director general de Thank you very much, Director General of Industry, Defense and Space of the European Commission, Timo Pesonen. And now on behalf of our host city of this summit, we give the floor to the Mayor of Seville, Mr. Antonio Muñoz. Pues buenas tardes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Seville, especially those of you who come from outside our city. Dear Secretary of State, it's a pleasure to have you back here in Seville with the important news such as the organization of this summit, president of public and private companies, which make it possible to organize this main event. I would like to share with you how happy I am because this necessary dialogue between the space industry, the security and defense industry is taking place in Seville. It's not just any summit, and you know that really well, especially in the current situation. It's not yet another event of the many events we have in Seville. It's a timing an event, a dialogue between three sectors which has an extraordinary growth capacity. If there is any other economic sector that can look at the future with optimism, that is the space sector, and of course, the security and defense as well. So please notice how happy I am as the mayor of Seville to see that this discussion and, and, and reflection on strategic sectors, not only for our city, but for Spain, takes place in my city. And so I'm very, very happy about that. As it was mentioned earlier, the walls of the Royal Fortress of Seville witnessed the beginning of the first circumnavigation and the so-called colonization of the Pacific Ocean. And Seville was a witness to that beginning. And Seville wants to want to witness also the conquer of space or this challenge that we have ahead of us. We have been for a while, and may I remind you, that the first Council of Ministers of the European Commission on Space was held here in Seville. May I remind you that the President of the Government announced here in Seville the creation of the Spanish Space Agency. And please allow me to finish talking about how terribly excited we are all in Seville with our candidacy to become the venue of this Spanish Space Agency, a key agency where not only Seville and Andalusia, but the whole of Spain has a lot at stake because the space sector demands innovation and science and no future can hold without the investment in innovation and science. Please allow me to say that we have done our homework. We have created a solid, high-quality candidacy with the support of the business ecosystem and for research with universities, with the various public authorities. And we are extremely happy with the candidacy file that we have sent to the ministry. So uh, we're looking forward to the news, and so we hope that the balance tilts to Seville, the scale tilts to Seville. In many occasions, we have been uh, witnessing the circumnavigation and uh, where Spain was key. Please uh, take into account that we still want to be the epicenter of the Spanish uh, uh, space agency. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor of Seville, and best of luck in this race. Now we give the floor to the Secretary of Space of, for Defense of the Government of Spain, Maria Alparo Valcarce. I would like to thank Commissioner for his invitation to participate in this opening ceremony of Span Spain Defense Industry Summit. I also want to explain my gratitude to the city of Seville, dear mayor. Thank you very much for your kind words and hosting this event. This industrial, technological, and research meeting is extremely relevant so that the Spanish initiatives have international commercial projection, generate wealth and employment. From the perspective of the Ministry of Defense, 
And using this framework, which is aimed at empowerment, the defense and space industry, I would like to highlight our utmost commitment with the national Spanish defense industry and firmly committed to promote their capacities and assets. We have to understand that there is no well-being without security and defense. The current global order has led that the Spanish society is very much aware on the need to have security and defense. The operational environment where our armed forces operate includes simultaneously different domains, both the traditional ground, air, and sea, or the new, more relevant uh, space areas such as space, cyberspace, and cognition. To operate with the superiority in all domains needs technologically advanced systems and means that allow for efficient and agile decision making, hence allowing a pro anticipation and initiative. The strategy for technology and innovation for defense considers that the first objective of research, development, and innovation to contribute to the development of the military capacities, hence contributing with techno advanced technological solutions that will allow to the main achievement of the operational advantage in when they are used. This strategy has a vision, which is to have a research development innovation system for defense that can leverage both the capacities and resources that the Ministry of Defense has, as well as the opportunities we can access through the co national and international cooperation. But to do that, we need to act together in all technological realms that are relevant for the armed forces missions. But above all, to achieve different levels of technological maturity. This process allows that the results are integrated so that we can obtain the future weapon systems so that the industrial technological base can give response sustainably both to the current needs and to the technological challenges of the future. One of the trends of research, technology, and development and defense is the technological advancement. Above all, in disruptive innovations such as artificial intelligence, big data, navigation and positioning, robotics, IoT, social media, biotechnology, nanotechnology, additional uh, manufacturing, new energy storage methodologies, new materials, computing and technology, com te ah, computing and technology, communication. You know this because you work in these industries and these are a clear revolution. And of course, this is very much part of the defense industry. These technologies, uh, which are disruptive, have a clear application in Spain which has been a catalyst for the transformation of the international relations in the realm of security. The applications of satellite systems show that the daily life of citizens is clearly connected to the space. For the development and well-being of our society, it is absolutely necessary to have an efficient use of the capacities for the control of space so that we guarantee the use of an environment that has a clear strategic and commercial value. The National Security Strategy establishes the need to promote measures to defend the national interests of Spain in space. We clearly support the development of the defense and security component within the Spanish Space Agency, fully aligned with the objectives of the defense policy of the aerospace security strategy and the military planning and, and planning of material resources in space. The impetus and constant update of the master plan of space systems 
by the Ministry of Defense guarantees the maintenance of these space capabilities already existing and the achievement of the capabilities that will be absolutely necessary in the future in four areas such as communication systems, observation systems, navigation and positioning systems, and surveillance and spatial tracking systems. The government of Spain will develop, will allocate our investment priorities to these four areas. And this is an absolute requirement to be established in the technological avant-garde of space and to be able to operate with the superiority we need. In addition to the capacities that we receive thanks to this main system, I would also like to highlight the support of the government of Spain to SMEs and startups of Spain, which have developed capacities from which they can offer to the space, and which have major possibilities and advantages for defense. And please allow me to quote a few. Decreasing costs. Resilience, because there is many assets already in orbit in a constellation. The variety of payloads, the reduction of revisit times, and the reposition of assets in orbits. Spain is amongst the first five European powers regarding space race. The Ministry of Defense is supporting the collaboration of the national industry with the European industry through the European Space Agency because we need to solve technological challenges of the space um, sector in defense. We also support the efforts of the national industry to lead and participate in projects sponsored financed by the EU through the co-funding method. Let me give you some success stories, such as the mini satellite surveillance satellites, MEMIS, the development of the European capacity of early warning, such as All Inside, and the initiative of Co satellite communications, EPU. Our support of the national industry allows the industry to be better positioned internationally and to participate in the design, production, and integration of satellite systems, as well as in the operation, exploitation, and sustenance of this ground segment. I would like to point out that in 2023, we shall publish the fifth edition of the TAT Catalogue of Spanish Defense Industry for 2023 to 2024. This publication will allow us to disseminate information on the capabilities of our defense industry, both in large industries as well as SMEs. And we would like to provide institutional support to the national industry, clearly spearheaded by the Spanish government, which has supported a growth of the defense budget to modernize and update the military capabilities of our armed forces. The main goal is to enable the strengthening of the technological base of the Spanish defense industry. At the end of the day, we want to promote growth and, and high qualified jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, if we take into account the investment in the special modernization programs and in the whole Ministry of Defense budget, for year 2023, the growth will be of 25.8%. As you very well know, this is a massive historical growth, as it has been a clear historical decision from the Spanish government to comply with the goal that from now to 2029, we can devote to defense 2% of the GDP. And this investment in defense results uh, in helping programs and actions that are paramount for your industry, the aerospace industry. And I would like to highlight that in the general national budget, there's been a big effort and a vision to because 
we want to support FCAST, Eurofighter, A400M, Euromail, NH90, CIRTAP, Mar Maritime Patrol Aircrafts, the Air Platform Experimentation Center, CEUS here in Moguer, in Andalusia, the Center for Space Surveillance uh, Missions for the Air Forces and Communications and Satellite Navigation Projects such as Galileo. I would like to highlight an independent report which has been published by KPMG for the Spanish Association of Defense Technology, Security, and Aerospace Companies. The industry pro supported more than 70,000 million euros to the Spanish GDP. In 2021, 1.4% of the total of the national contribution, but that has allowed the creation of 50,000 direct jobs, which is a figure that will increase up to 200,000 indirect jobs and induced jobs in the whole Spanish economy. This investment does not only provide a substantial return on the investment, but also it plays a key role because it's a driving force for the local and regional economies of our country. It facilitates the territorial cohesion, the economic cohesion, and above all, the redistribution of the national health. Please allow me to highlight that the Ministry of Defense has endeavored to make sure that all defense programs of a multinational nature should include a national plan that ensures that the percentage of commitment that Spain takes on board is clearly reflected by the return of the industrial participation in our country. And a good example of this, as it has been mentioned by the president of INRA, Mr. Murtra, is the negotiations with our partners in the uh, FCAS program, which has recently allowed to pave the way for the signature of a contract of, for the next stage. And it has been a long negotiation and an agreement, an industrial agreement, has been reached for the program. So congratulations for Indra, because they are the national coordinator of the industrial program of EFCAS. We must take into account that in parallel with these industrial negotiations, the Spanish government has held high-level conversations aimed at making progress in the cooperation with the three partners in the program, uh, on equal footing between France, Spain, and Germany. The political agreement for EFCAS is a big step, especially in the current times. It's an important sign of the excellent cooperation between France, Spain, and Germany. FCAS strengthens the, the military cap capacities of Europe. It gives an important know-how to our, our industry, and more specifically to the European industry as a whole. So the future Air for armed forces of Europe show us that we can solve many challenges together. And I would like to finish by re insisting on the fact that the Ministry of Spain decisively supports the whole Spanish defense industry, we, because we are firmly convinced that they are a key element, as I said earlier, for the development and promotion of our economy. Spanish government has taken the necessary steps to create a financial framework that it is safe so that companies can use it to invest. And that is our objective of reaching 2% of our GDP for 2029. Because security and defense needs an empowerment with top technology levels that allow us to be superior at all, um, in all fields. 
And the space industry is a clear example of how important it is to be at the technological forefront. And precisely to count on an industrial and technological base for advanced defense that knows how to give response to the technological challenge that entails empowering our, our armed forces. And that is the uh, vision of the government. In this event, I would like to I would like you to know that that we will you will always have our support and promotion. So I wish you the best for this summit so that it contributes to achieving the goals that all participants have. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to the Secretary of State for Defense, um, Maria Amparo Valcarde, and to close this institutional um, opening of the Space and Industry Sevilla Summit, the President of the Government, Mr. Pedro Sánchez, would have liked to be with us today, and he sent us a message. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you warmly to this Space and in Defense Industry Sevilla Summit and highlight the relevance that this meeting has for the government in Spain. The aerospace sector is more and more important for the Spanish economy. Its development fosters science and technology's impact um, on improving our quality of life and our security. We saw it in the pandemic, the evacuation of Af Afghanistan, or the volcanic eruption in um, La Palma. And we are seeing it again, unfortunately, in the um, Ukraine war or the fight against climate change. Um, we are doing a, an incredible effort, and the strategic project of the, for the economic recovery and transformation has provided 2.2 will provide 2.2 billion um, of public funds to the defense sector and will um, imply 2.4 billion of private investment. We are going to create a um, Spanish space agency, and this forum is a great opportunity to reinforce the collaboration between PPPs so that we may um, develop all of our potentials and cover our international commitments with regards to defense and security. This civil meeting reinforces the connection between defense and Spain as the key to the um, stability and strategic situation of Spain. This aim is essential for us to come together, and our Spanish government is working very hard to make this possible. So thank you very much, and enjoy this wonderful summit. Thank you very much to Mr. President of the government for his words. Um, this brings the institutional opening to a close. And um, we will then move on to the next intervention. Now a round of applause for the authorities. Thank you very much.
¿Esto se puede mover? No. Ay, Dios mío. Qué desastre. Puede ir. A ver. Y ahí tengo eso. El, el pasar las diapositivas y tengo ahí un aparato, ¿no? Sí, aquí Pero... Sí, pero la, la, la presentación tuya la tienen ya sí, ellos. Sí, la tienen ellos, claro. Pues, ah, claro. claro. Entonces aquí lo que quieres hacer es... Sí, es... No, que... Vamos a continuar con la última de las ponencias de la mañana. We're going to continue with the last of our conferences. Please take a seat. We're going to start in a minute. Please take a seat. Thank you. Please, ladies and gentlemen, take a seat. We are about to begin. Thank you. Si son tan amables. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat. Thank you. Vale. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. We are now going to move on to the last conference of this morning. It's been a very intense morning, ladies and gentlemen. And we really are very lucky because this intervention is the um, cherry on top of the cake. It's going to be Mr. Carlos Martínez Empere, expert in security and defense, Spanish defense systems engineering, is DEFE, who's going to talk about the European defense industry situation and challenges in an environment of increasing security risks and threats. I'm going to ask you to please um, give our Speaker, Carlo Mantis and Bede, a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, authorities. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this civil summit and thank them for the opportunity to address you briefly and to talk about the European defense industry. 
I'm going to focus on a more academic perspective, and I'm going to offer you some data and information that I believe are relevant, many um, from results of um, studies that I have carried out um, regarding the sector. I'm going to talk about the historical evolution. I'm going to give you some fundamental characteristics of this sector that allow us to understand why it works the way it does. I'm going to talk about, as well, the current situation of the sector within Europe. I shall talk about risks, something which is important and has a great impact on how our sector works. I shall talk about opportunities, and I will close with a few um, pertinent conclusions. The industry of defense is a sector that has born and develops jointly with the um, Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. It's when we see its um, rise. The shipyards, arsenals, and royal factories transformed into specialized companies to be able to su supply goods and services to the armed forces. This is the transformation um, which is a consequence of the great complexity of the goods that were required um, for the structure of the, in the industry that was growing and um, the vehicles, the airplanes, and the information and te communications technologies that were required by defense. What are the main characteristics? On the one hand, it's a really a cross-cutting strategic interest industry. And when I mean talk about cross-cutting, it means that it um, spreads across many sectors because defense deals with very um, different goods and services. We have missiles that have um, chemical loads, um, electronic components, co mechanical components. It's a cross-cutting industry that touches upon many sectors, but the main element is that it's strategic because national defense really relies on this industry, which means that this industry normally um, is very um, taken care of by the government. The goods are complexes and require a very complex and long supply chain. The Leopard um, tank um, required um, 1,200 suppliers to build one tank. So it's a very long supply chain. It is a tech intensive industry and really it is absolutely essential to have R&D and I. The companies um, that provide goods for defense really have to invest to research and develop and innovate constantly more than other in other sectors. Really um, allowing the armed forces of the West to have a technological and operative superiority that will allow us to um, win in any conflict. There's something very important. It is a sector that has um, scale economies and learning economies, which are essential in that the R&D plus I has to, have to be funded by funds that require um, a positioning in the market. If the production is low, um, the costs increase, as you well know. This means that it is absolutely essential to have a big market to be competitive. This is easy for nations like the United States because they have an internal market which is very broad. But in our case, we have to sell products abroad. France um, and Germany sells a lot of products outside so that they may be competitive. The scale economies and having a big market means f that we have imperfect um, competencies, competitiveness. It's very difficult to have um, only one supplier. Sorry, it is very difficult to have several suppliers. And this implies that the number of suppliers is low. On the other hand, it is a demand that it tends to be irregular in time when we have a tank or an airplane. Whilst it's being manufactured, the industry has all of its assets functioning, but until the product is 
substituted by a new one, we have um, low production phases within the industry. So it's very difficult to maintain these assets and thus the how um, costly this is for companies it means that it's less, um, it has an impact on the companies. In a European market, having this situation has an impact on us. And last but not least, it is, ah, there we go, sorry. I, I've lost where I was, yes. <laughs> so last but not least, it is an, an industry that has knowledge spillover, which means that our research has application in the civil sector sometimes. So we see very important spillover. Uh, the microwave development was um, the fruit of the research in military radar um, spheres, and we all have it at our homes these days. What is the current situation of the defense industry in Spain? In 2020, um, with regards to the ASD facts and figures, they stated that there was 119 billion for turnover, a direct employment of nearly 500,000 people, and exports um, that reached 45,600 million euros. So basically about one third to um, 50 percent of the turnover is, is um, exports. The market structure regarding <coughs> European Union reports, we have 25 big companies, 100 medium um, companies, and 1,350 SMEs. These SMEs are fundamental for the supply chain because they allow for the providing very specialized components that only these suppliers can provide and develop and therefore integrate in other developments. Regarding the KPMG report 2020, and I'm sorry, I don't have data for 2021. They're probably a little bit higher, the numbers, but we have a turnover of um, 7 billion euros, direct employment of 23,343,000 3, people and export of 3,622 billion. If we compare this data of Spain to that of the European Union, we see that our sector is quite small. It's really 5, per, 5 to 6% of the defense industry sector in Europe. Okay. so. With regards to current situation, the dimension of the different member states is very different. France, United Kingdom, Germany, and Italy are leaders of the sector with the best industries. Then we have Spain, Switzerland, um, Holland, and Poland. And the rest of the um, EU states have um, relatively limited productive capacities. The fact that the Europe, the UK left the European Union generated an additional problem because its defense industry was the fourth um, of the one of the European Union, and that meant that it cannot participate um, in some of the initiatives, such as the External Action Service, the Permanent and Structured Cooperation, and the European Defense, defense Fund. The conditions for the UK um, industry participation in these spheres are very complicated, which in the midterm will imply that they may well be um, looking to the United States. The next slide points and lists the most important companies. Some of them are trans-European, like Airbus. We have United Kingdom, France, Germany, Sweden. As you see, these are the companies that um, hold most of the industrial uh, potential of the different member states. What are the most um, striking risks? Risks. We don't um, invest a lot of in defense. 
uh, countries like United States or United Kingdom do um, have a lot more spending in defense. But the NATO guideline, which you see as the green line here, most of the countries do not go over 2%, and the rest of the countries are quite low. Spain is the penultimate before Luxembourg with uh, a 1.02% of GDP for defense. This has been what historically we have gone through in the last few years. If we don't have um, national defense bu budgets, it's impossible for the industry to grow. So the backing of um, prominent budgets is very important. And most companies have to rely on exports. These numbers are quite worrying because Europeans don't spend enough in um, defense, although the conflict in Ukraine may be changing our point of view. We are still at a worse um, position when we analyze the investment in defense, um, the R&D um, financing of defense. We have here in million euros, the value of United States is about 60 billion uh, spent in um, R&D in South Korea, lower the European Union, quite low. UK lower than the EU, Germany, Japan, and then the rest of countries really have very small investment in defense regarding R&D. What is the problem with this? Even though the Eurostat numbers show 4,000 in Europe, um, ASD talks about 8 billion, really, which facing the 64 billion um, investment of the, e the United States in defense really leaves it at a very poor disadvantage. This has led Europe to have significant weaknesses within its defense industry. We are very good at very many things, but sometimes we cannot lead in this respect. We follow. We are followers of the United States. We foster, um, we take advantage of their innovation and their development, and we invest less. We take advantage of the fact that they are at the forefront, but with these numbers, it's very, very difficult for us to be leaders in this sphere. We also um, see that the national markets are very fragmented. We still prefer um, national providers. And the problem comes from the fact that at European level, the production capacities are excessive. And it would be good to be able to um, import and export. But it sometimes it's very, very difficult to transform these companies and to rein in these companies, but it's not an easy process. Russia continues to be a, um, a high exporter of defense um, products. Russia is not what it is anymore. It has good clients in India and in other places, but that um, export is declining. In communications and electronics, really, Russia is um, declining, is, is um, suffering a decline. There are new international actors which are going to be very um, important in the next decades, like China, South Korea, India, and Brazil. India and Brazil want to be um, candidates to having their own industry, and they are trying the, at their luck at their own developments, although they will probably need about a decade to be able to lead themselves. And then we see um, some erosion in the competitivity within Europe regarding critical technologies, given the new actors that have come in the, to the market it, that invest a lot in R&D, especially China, China. We have supercomputers, a quantum computer, AI, robotics, and new materials. So what is the main problem? Most of the key um, tech for defense can be classified as deep tech, which means that capital investment is very much required in high quantities, and its returns are quite uncertain. The presence of China is quite worrying as a first competitor. Um, 
and it's uh, worrying for the United States and the European Union. China investment in R&D globally surpass Europe. China does not provide a lot of information with regards to what it invests in defense, but we believe that they have surpassed those of the European Union. And we have also spoke about, uh, spoken about the fact that we have um, graduates from science, engineering, mathematics. Most of these, um, this talent comes from China, 26%, and Europe provides 9.5%, and 6% provides, is provided by the US, as per a report by UNCTAD. So United States and Europe, perhaps, um, might need to join forces in terms of talent to be able to face China. Despite all of these risks, Europe has very many strategic opportunities on the one hand, and the European global um, will to be more strategic, the European global strategy, the reinforcement of the European sovereignty. This autonomy strategy was within the EU global strategy already in 2016. In 2017, we had the cooperation, uh, the PESCO, initiative in Lisbon, which um, is launching many programs. The Capability Development Plan, which is trying to create European capabilities which can be coordinated so that we all have the means that we require and that they be coherent and solid. We also have the Strategic Compacts for 2022, which enables um, many initiatives to be to reinforce the European capabilities, and we will see the impact of this in future development. And we also have the European will to promote reindustrialization and R&D within Europe. They are civil activities right now, but I believe that they're going to have spillover to the military sector, um, super computational um, sectors, algorithms and developments and applications, and AI systems that will spill over. The availability of receiving funding from the European Defence Fund, there's about 8 billion in the period 21 to 27. It's not very high in comparison, but it's better than nothing and will allow us to um, develop military capabilities for research and development. Ideally, the European Union, what, what it wants to achieve is to plant a seed and have multiplication have these have multiplying effects. We shall see this um, in the future because currently it's impossible to measure this. But perhaps these seed investments will have, um, will produce big trees in the future. There are other opportunities. Um, the increase in spending in defense um, provides us um, with a point of view that allows us to increase our um, investment. And Germany, Spain, and other countries are seeing the need to increase um, investment. There's going to be a substantial increase. Sorry. And this means sorry, I'm trying to get the right slide. Forgive me. Uh, really, the problem that I see here are the bottlenecks that may be generated in this sector. D multiplying by two, the defense um, spending will generate bottlenecks with regards to human resources, to ma materials. The increase in the spending in defense will have an impact on these bottlenecks, which reduce the efficiency of our sector. Finally, there is a great opportunity for collaboration between member states. 
which will be um, structured by the um, the funds that we've already spoken about and um, supported by other mechanisms within the European Union. And the director of DEFIS has spoken about this issue. This collaboration is going to be important um, long term because it's going to generate a reorganization of the sector within the European Union because all of these agreements will create new industries, consortiums, and way of working. So these agreements will be key. And this European Fund for Defense will create a more integrated defense industry and will allow us to have more capabilities to um, face the developments that we need to take in the realm of defense. As a conclusion, the industry of defense, um, to be competitive, requires an adaptation constant process. On the one hand, to the strategic framework, because conflicts change and the um, military needs vary. We have examples in Sahel and Ukraine, but they are also linked to the political lead legal context. Finally, the European Union has decided to invest in defense and um, bring together all of the member states' capabilities. And of course, the technological evolution, the fourth industrial revolution in the 4.0 industry, R&D, all of this is absolutely required for our industry to constantly adapt. It's costly, but it's the only way in which we can have proper defense that satisfies the operational needs of our continent. With regards to the public-private um, partnerships, we really see it as essential. The interests of administration and industry must converge, and we must avoid divergences that um, have an impact on our efficiency. Industry requires um, being able to produce funds. The public administration needs to provide defense for the citizenship citizens, sorry. These objectives may be conflicting and be difficult, but they're essential. The investment to produce defense means has to be considerably high. And so, really, I believe that the market currently doesn't work. We have to create different institutional mechanisms so that we can face all of these um, problems and technical complexity. So we believe that this collaboration is important because these um, defense developments are highly, um, they, they have spillover and they're very profitable. They can be exported. These are many of the cases, but there is a lot of R&D investment that really doesn't take us um, too far. So that R&D also has to be taken into account. Many a time companies don't understand how this development is going to have an impact on the market and what benefit it might bring. So state support is absolutely essential for this, because the pri otherwise the private initiatives cannot face it alone. So to, avo so to avoid risks and to be able to achieve the objectives that the ministry of industry and defense require is fundamental. I don't want to take any more of your time. I have tried to summarize how our sector works. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for being here. We shall come back and reconvene at 3.30. For those of you that are following us online, we shall reconvene at 3.30. Enjoy the break. Um, and for those of you here, we have a lunch where we're going to network. This is very important because we're finally face to face. And we hope that you may uh, make many business deals and shake many hands. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the evening session of the Space and Defense Industry Civil Summit, a summit that we are celebrating here in Seville 
I would like to welcome all the people that are following us um, virtually and all of the people here in the Palace of Conferences here in Seville. I hope your lunch was delicious and very productive in terms of networking. So that's um, the collaboration and the PPP um, be useful for all of us. We are going to begin with this section. We're going to have different roundtables, and the first block that we're going to talk about is space, airspace, as an axis of global industrial development. And um, we have as our first speaker, Jordi Adeos, the president of his Passat. Please, a round of applause for him. Internet um, reaches for the first time half a million people in Ecuador. The East Passat project um, has implemented connectivity um, via satellite in the community of Manduro in order to foster tele-education. We are going to manage to achieve the objective of the teachers because they are going to allow um, for our children to use computers so that we can learn more things. These um, tech gadgets are going to allow for assistance to school to increase, which was harshly hit by the pandemic. Manistra Brown from the Education Ministry um, would like that the connectivity um, allow people to connect with each other and foster education in the strategy to foster connectivity. The Latin American country is going to um, give first place to education and health services. In a meeting in Quito, this gentleman said the mechanisms that allow us to give um, good health um, assistance can allow can be allowed by teleassistance. All of this begins with connectivity, and from there we can open up a world of solutions. The connection that the Equatorian government um, is looking for spans throughout um, the country and will help hundreds of schools and medical centers. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, when somebody starts um, or is welcomed with an applause, that is wonderful. I think a video in a session after lunch at the beginning of the evening session is a good idea to focus our attentions. I would like to thank you all very much for being here. In a session where we're going to talk about space, and the role it plays within the human development strategy. We have spoken here about defense and security, and this is very linked with what I'm going to talk to you about, because we really need security and defense to defend what I'm going to talk about now. And these are not worlds apart. But I would like to highlight that on top of defense and security, airspace has many dimensions. It's a transversal element of our world, and that is why we talk about space as an axis for global and industrial and human development. That is why we say that space is at the service of three agenda. In the last decade, in humanity, we were allowed ourselves to um, use three main agendas that are our axis, which have set strategic objectives, which are general but are essential. 
On the one hand, we have the 2030 agendas, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them. The other is the Paris Agreement regarding um, the fight against climate change. And the third is the new urban agenda that the UN through the um, UN Habitat, who was presided by the Commissioner Joan Claus as the Secretary General of UN Habitat. Those are three great agendas filled with objectives that were set in the last decade. And in this decade, we are going to see um, the implementation of these three agendas. So this decade that we are living in is that of objectives that have to be achieved, evaluation metrics to understand whether we are advancing in this agenda or not. Space plays a very important role in all of its dimensions in the building, in the real building and implementation of those of these three agendas that I have mentioned. And they are agendas that we must remember and evaluate. Space is linked really to most of the SDGs. It really is difficult to find an SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, that is not directly linked to space. So end of poverty or zero hunger, space is included in that because it will create productive change in agriculture, in um, stock rearing, so that we can create intelligent territories, clean water, um, decent um, work, and economic growth. This is a, an economic sector that generates quality jobs and which helps social and economic development of our territories, the reduction of inequality. This is evidently something that helps when we see a video like this. Economic development through digital transformation and thanks to con digital connectivity. These are just but a few examples. Life on Earth, life under the seas, action against climate change and peace in solid institutions. When we are defending borders, when we are fighting against illegal um, trafficking of peoples and goods, we are defending solid institutions. And in this realm, space is very present and more so than before. The fight against climate change, I want to highlight within this something more than 50% of the indicators and metrics that are used to monitor whether we are advancing in the fight against climate change come from space. That is 50% come from space. And evidently, space gives us a very important element that may be um, subjective, but raising awareness. When we see images like these, is when we understand, because images is a, an image is worth a thousand words. When you show from space the effects of deforestation or the defrosting of glaciers around the world, we need the space for it. We need space for it. It is also evident that space helps in adapting and creating policies to mitigate climate change. The new urban agenda means a world that is going to be more urban is a world that has become more urban but does not forget the villages for millions of people that are going to migrate from villages to the cities. There is no possible development socially and economically without digital transformation, without the effects of the <coughs> digital revolution this can only be possible if connectivity digitally is possible. This is basic. So therefore, airspace and space will allow us to reach as far as uh, possible with our technologies. It'll be space that will allow for connectivity for millions of people. And I was saying space is very important in itself. 
and it is essential for what it is useful for. But in itself, is essential because of the actors and what they do and who do what. Um, and I give you a number from the International Association of Satellite, which uh, mobilizes 3,000, uh, 3.86 billion. The industry of satellites services launching the industry mobilizes um, 279 billion and um, the part of services is 94 billion corporate uses 17 billion and in terms of sensory with the sensory field and with 5g we are already uh, mobilizing 2.7 billion this is all to support the fact that this technological universe and this great industry in itself is a factor for social and economic development because it generates innovation, it generates exports, it generates good jobs and good employment. 230,000 um, quality employment with high added value. So it is a technological universe that is interesting in itself, which has helped for the last 65 years. The, the first satellite was launched in October in 1957. We have been working for 65 years, years sorry, in supporting all of these policies. And evidently, space has a future, a future that will allow us to talk about this and to talk about lunar communications, and the technical director of ISPASAT is here. These communications will allow us to explore new horizons that science will bring to us. So thinking about the present and the future of tomorrow is incumbent upon the sp space. It's also, space is also at the service of the integral development of society. This is a person that is connected um, in through space because no other way is possible. We see here geolocation. We see internet for mobility from maritime and air spheres. This is a revolution of space that is transforming everything. With regards to science, the new frontier that innovation implies, we add a new world, an immense world of new applications. Space allows for precision in analysis of problems. It gives us parameters and metrics and detects phenomenon and shows them very clearly. And derived from this is data analysis and the added value that comes from this. It's evident that space provides data that allows us to foresee and analyze phenomena from deforestation to illegal fishing that is carried out around the world. All of these applications are thanks to space. And evidently, we are undergoing a transformation. We are going f in a company, in our company, we're going from structure management to designing efficient solutions. We've gone from infrastructure management to providing solutions and services closer to the market and the needs of the people. And therefore, it is easy to understand the applications that can open up from connectivity, the management of forestries, of agriculture, of um, stock management. Yesterday, we were talking about um, efficiency in watering um, through using sensors in um, agricultural ex um, exploitation, sorry, agricultural centers. And this was something we were talking about in a university yesterday. So we are within a decade where we have to monitor mm, the implementation of global agendas on territories. We have a lot of metrics and data that will allow us to evaluate 
how things are carried out and carried through. We have to comply with objectives now. In this very remote um, village, these children are able to use um, these appliances. We are very well connected here, but half of humanity is not well connected. And yesterday I said that 244 million people do not have connectivity in the um, American continent. And without connectivity, it is not possible to carry out further development strategies. There is no digital transformation possible. So it will be through space and only through space that we will be able to reach the remotest of areas in an efficient and economic way. And this is something that we are fighting to include in the agendas but in, of dialogue between Latin America and Europe because we think it's absolutely crucial to create um, a path that can accelerate strategic countries economic development and who countries that are essential for Europe as well. With regards to security and future, space is essential for um, meteorological purposes to avoid cat catastrophes because to manage emergencies, space is essential. Um, with regards to volcanoes or land um, tremors, we are key to cover and to provide information because it's a robust and resilient technology and works when other things don't work. Security in communications and control of borders, illegal trafficking, continuity of services, resilience. We have lived through this uh, while we were going through the pandemic. We know this. Given this general um, world and this situation, I want to stress that is pasat and is this sad? We really are Spanish um, companies, but which are global. And really, what we want to do is face all of these great big challenges. And our companies were born from a business model that was specific. But we understand now that we have a strategic role to play in the transformation of the countries that we serve. We are. Um, sustainable. We're an industrial um, engine. We have policies of cybersecurity. We are working on quantic key um, elements for safe communications. And these are elements that ISPASAT, together with ISDESAT, will allow for these challenges to be met in our country. I would like to say that I don't know whether we will live in space or not. But I very certainly want to say, and sometimes there are sectors that ask me why space. So I want to express in no uncertain terms that space lives among us and has done so for decades and will do so for decades. And so let's fight for a space that is worth our while. Thank you very much. You are like. Yes. Uh. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President of Ispasad Jordi Areo. The organization really was not wrong when they asked him to speak at this um, time. So thank you very much, sir, because it has been a very, very interesting conference on your part. The next person that's going to speak to us will be the Commissioner for Airspace Verde, Ministry of Science and Innovation, Government of Spain, Miguel Bello. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank the organization committee. I unfortunately have not been able to attend in person because the ministerial conference of the European Space Agency is um, taking place right now in Paris, and I have not been able to attend to see you. As the commissioner for the Perte uh, for Aerospace, one of my main jobs is the creation of the Spanish Space Agency. And I want to dedicate this um, message to the principles that are allowing us to create and structure 
the ministries and the um, models and competencies and statutes that we are going to need for the um, this Spanish space agency. The role that we are going to play in innovation and the capacity that we're going to have to transform the work and economy is absolutely essential. And we're going to offer um, indispensable services for communications, for navigation, for the world, or for security. These services and applications are absolutely essential and strategic for the European Union, as well as to help to mitigate the problems derived from great challenges like climate change and a allow for the achieving the um, sustainable development goals. The space agency is essential for science and um, for answering essential questions. The government of Spain understands the strategic capacity and the mobilization capacity of different um, sectors and for research and de development approved um, in 2022 a PERTE Aerospacial, which basically is support for the defense and aerospace industry so that we may be key and can be part of the, trans the short term and long term changes. The um, ministry has prov foreseen the creation, the Spanish Space Agency an organization that will be a guarantee for the sustainability and coordination of the policies with regards to aerospace and space um, policies. The space agency will allow us to coordinate effectively the activities in aerospace from the point of view of its technological development, as well as the use of space um, for communications. The agency will include the functions that currently are distributed among different administrations so that we may be more efficient in the sector in Spain. The Spanish Space Agency is going to follow the models of the new UK, um, Switzerland, or Australian Space Agency. We will not carry out technological scientific projects, but we will supervise and harmonize all of the space program. We will um, give legal backing to all of these and coordinate the um, international organization representations. We will, of course, um, include the Defense Ministry and the um, Security Ministry so that we can all operate together. Um, in a transversal manner. There will be a coordination with the Ministry of Transport and Industry in the competencies that apply to them. The agency is going to foster value chain, the development of satellites upstream, as well as the downstream application services, including um, launching and operations. The agency will integrate the functions that are currently distributed among different ministries and entities so that we may represent efficiently the Spanish space sector. We will also provide institutional support for the commercial use of space, fostering private investment and identifying the PPP um, collaboration opportunities. It will always be necessary to have interdepartmental cooperation because we will have to coordinate different um, nature strategic actions, communications, defense, security, information about climate, protection of environment, agriculture, fishing, industry, all of these sectors in really require international cooperation. So we will incorporate them into this so that the agency has enough autonomy and um, action capacity. Its personnel will need to have experience in management of space um, elements and also abilities to coordinate initiatives nationally and internationally so that we may be well positioned in the space world. That will allow us to have better investment internationally and better representation in ESA or the European Commission. On the other hand, with regards to the n specific national de developments, defense and transport, we see this as key to the development of the sector. The space um, race um, and the STEM careers will motivate 
the development of new abilities, experiences, and capabilities within industry, university, and education. With all of this in mind, the principles that n foster the need of a space Spanish agency is really the service to citizens because they will be the end users of the development that we will create. That's the functions and organizing structure will have to respond to these needs. The space agency will have as its objective the fostering and development of um, research and development and science, defense, innovation, and use, sat use of satellite data, and the, impact, the economic impact that it's going to have in associated industries. At the same time, the agency will have to foster and coordinate with other departments the interests of our state in this regard and, of course, linked to um, communication and budgetary needs, as well as the management of the um, public funds destined to these elements. The functions and competencies of our agencies can be divided in four sections. One, creating a hypernational spatial policy, identifying objectives and national priorities with the, from the point of view of the state, starting from other national policies like security and defense ones. This um, national space policy will have to be robust and autonomous and prioritizing national objectives. <coughs> and finally, will have to be approved by the government. The policy will allow us to act strategically, sustainably, and <coughs> coordinated in this sector, synchronizing our competencies and establishing a national policy that will allow us to use it as a guideline for the PPP. So we need a national plan for space, the delineation of space programs um, for our agency and for other departments will have to be done in an appropriate time frame and with specific budgets. The National Plan for Space will have as its main objective the fostering of um, services for society and maximizing um, the use of investments and um, f fostering PPP and, of course, um, allowing our national industry to be um, thrust forward. We will regulate the use of space um, vehicles, including, of course, geolocation, um, meteorology, uh, civil protection, environment, agriculture, defense, um, sea security, transport, and energy, as well as uses of space for scientific research, including studies of climate change. The agency, through this plan, will also promote the investment um, ecosystem for private funding for venture capital um, technological funds so that we do not lose opportunities. And we will also foster the fact that um, citizens be informed of the benefits of what we do. So we will create dissemination campaigns and training in institutes, um, colleges, schools, and universities so that we may create um, talent as well academically. The agency will always inspire a workforce that will be more technological and spatial scientists. And also, as well, candidates for um, space, uh, uh, space elements. Once we define the national policy, we will design its implementation by assigning public resources to the different elements and supporting um, other departments. The follow-up of our impacts and initiatives and policies of each department. With regards to the competencies of research and development, the agency will carry out the following functions. That the activity of CEDETI and ESA, the current activities of the um, state's research agency with regards to space vehicles, the activities of participation of Spanish companies in European programs, and the representation of Spa Spain in the Council of Space Com Council. There is um, a low volume of our participation in these programs, but our agency will foster them. We will also support the research um, institutions 
and that way we will be an, an important actor that will coordinate strategies of research and development within our country, combined with the strategies of digitalization environment and others. With regard to acquisitions, we will foster pol space policy by innovations and the buying of materials and services like buying satellites and contracting services and communications, um, buying different materials for information in space vehicles and services. And we will play attention to new mechanisms of public and private investment to develop commercial activity and private investment in space. The agency will also control the um, industrial returns for the different Spanish companies that require international buying so that we can optimize them. We also want to be essential for the coordination of actors in this um, space area, startups, organizations, universities. That is why INTA, as an OPI specialized in space and development, will support the technical, will provide the technical support to the agency and will provide the technical infrastructures. infrastructures. And this does not mean that we will not be able to use other um, structures. The third um, set of activities will be the space activity has um, international projection. And this means international cooperation and representation of Spain in the um, organizations of this sector, ESA, EUSPA, and UNSAT. We will be responsible as well for the governmental coordination in UNOSA, UN, and also follow up and integration on international agreements. The agency will also help to verify that we comply with the international treaties regarding space. And we will also promote bilateral and multilateral agreements of cooperation with space agencies. As well, with regards to cooperation, we will cooperate with other ministries and um, areas. And the way we will coordinate with the Space, European Space Agency and committees, this will allow us to be more organized and structured and be able to carry forth a unique voice in this forum. I think it's very important the coordination we will carry out with the Ministries of Transport and Divest so that we can coordinate the vigilance and regulation of space traffic, traffic and understanding the policies that will define the future use of space um, outside of our country. Also, we're going to provide a legal framework because we are going to regulate the public and private activities, creating a space law, um, creating an understanding of what uses for space are agreed and allowed and not. And we will, um, of course, focus on the launching of um, space vehicles, launching of satellites, control, control, of any aspect that impact the space and its traffic. This law will allow f to understand what certifications you can um, obtain to um, certify your processes. And uh, this is something that currently is being done by the OP of space. For this, we shall have a legal team that is um, specializes in le space law so that they can propose um, frameworks in these competencies. This is a short summary of the principles that are guiding us in the Space Committee to creation, for creating the Spanish Space Agency. And we hope that it will be launched by the beginning of 2023. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for the Spanish PERTE, the Strategic Plan for Economic Recovery and uh, Transformation. Uh, thank you to, for this presentation about the Spanish 
Space Agency. So we're going to move on to the next round table. I'm going to give the floor to the General Subdirector of Space System of INTA, Angel Luis Moratilla. He will be chairing the next round table. So can you please join me in welcoming home him on stage? Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Firstly, I want to thank the organization for having invited INTA to chair this interesting roundtable on such a relevant topic, which is space as a um, vector for global and industrial development of our society. We do not have much time, even though we have a bit more than was scheduled, but uh, the two previous presentations were so good and with such a huge scope that it allows us to restructure our presentations into more industrial-specific comments. Space truly is global. Because they are in around the Earth orbit. So by nature, space is global. También, es decir, no solo el activo obtiene... It's an asset, which is global. And the application is also naturally global. So data from space assets on Earth observation are global in the way they are generated and received. Therefore, the global nature of space should always be taken into account due to its industrial implications. But there is another type of global nature which is not so physical. It's not, it doesn't have to do with the planet Earth, but it has to do with the applications. We've heard about all sectors, defense, healthcare, transport, navigation, agriculture, heritage, taxes, infrastructure, public works, energy management, just about everything society does has a clear space component. So space is global in that sense too. And the second key word of this round table, which is inherent to the summit, and that is industrial. Because space is so key for all these fields. And they are all key issues that may cause a true problem. El, eh, <coughs> So, the value of all this is strategic, is critical. And we need to own it not only by purchasing assets, but also by developing them, owning the technology that creates them, and giving technological maturity to it all. So, we must develop these assets in our own industry until we have a true operational project. That is why industry is a key player. If the space industry can't do that, then it is very unsatisfactory because you can't purchase it in an outsourced manner. I would also like to mention that European Space Agency has a tradition of generating small startups that invest uh, and apply space technology in other sectors. The other example of a spin in space, new space, in which many components coming from other sectors are used in space, in space industry. It's not just technology, but also structure modes such as automation and electronics. And to talk about this, we have three 
representatives of the industry. We all know them, they are really well known. So I would kindly ask them to come and talk about the present of the industry and the short and medium term future. First speaker, Miguel Angel Buenduro. He is a telecommunications engineer. Please do come up on stage, all of you. Good afternoon. You'll know him. So I would read very fast, a very long CV. The speaker said, the interpreters obviously don't have it. Experts in telecommunications from the Polytechnic University of Madrid, course of National Affairs. Then he has various other extra additional merits. It's a long CV. His current responsibilities, I mean, he's worked in many years, in many places for many years. So, so if I focus on his passat, he represents his passat as the CEO in many other sectorial associations. He's been spokesperson in many organ international organization and national organizations. I shall not bore you because he's everywhere, and he's very well known. So Miguel Angel, this question I had, how do you see the present and the future in the short and medium term from the industrial point of view and more specifically in SATCOM? Good afternoon. And honestly, this is the first round table I've been to um, that I have not arranged the questions beforehand, so that's quite good. Re in regarding communications, one needs to differentiate between upstream, meaning launching and building satellites, and then downstream, those of us who operate and develop applications. We are currently in a situation in which we need to face different types of project problems. So please allow me to talk about a medium-sized operator, such as ISPASAD. But these problems are shared by most operators, quote unquote, traditional operators. My president talked about the 30th anniversary of the first Impasan, so those of us who have been here 30 or more years. We are undergoing a disruptive period. All sectors are. We are also in a transformation sector. It seems that that is not original either, and that all sectors are under transformation. But I will try and talk about life cycles of the system. So the life cycle of our systems are shortened because the technology is the way it is. Now, in five or six years, satellite assets are old. We still need to invest significant amount of money and markets or the prices are in decline, and those companies which are listed or operate, we don't, we're not listed, but it seems that the evolution of the apparatus is not very attractive. But at the same time, people always laugh at me because I always say that we are in a very sexy market <clears throat> because when you talk about space communication, well, you are drawing some attention. People look at you, right? On top of that, and why is space so attractive? And I've talked about it many times. You may say that I am a little bit repetitive, but there are two persons in the world who probably are the richest people, and I talked about this the other day. A guy called Elon Musk and another guy called Jeff Bezos, and they sort of have a liking for space. Maybe our president convinced them, but they do have this inkling for space. 
One has invented 7,500 mil millions with more than 2,600 satellites in orbit, and the other one is very close. And what's new about this? Per se, this won't be very new if you keep the value of change, which is what I was talking about earlier, both upstream and downstream. We are in the part of the operators, other people manufacture satellites, other people launch them, other people launch applications. They, these two projects, do everything. They, they build their launcher, they may, may manufacture their satellite, they operate it, and they send it home wrapped in socks so that you buy the service when you buy in Amazon. So in my opinion, this may transform our industry because it's currently very fashionable. And we sometimes remember that at the end of the 90s, a guy called Bill Gates tried. But this is having an impact on the investor appetite, investment appetite in traditional operators. And how do we manage this? at Ispasa. Well, we are not going to compete against these monsters. And what the president said earlier is that we have become or moved from being an infrastructure-only company into a company that makes progress in the value change to add services. And we have acquired two companies with the focus very much set in Latin America. And I think it's a very exciting moment uh, for the future. But our answer is that for the time being. Great. Well, thank you very much, Miguel Angel. We're going to move on to Jorge Poti. I would highlight, in a nutshell, that he has a very GMV career. Miguel Angel had been in different companies and positions beforehand. All the companies ending with S. But he has been in GMV all his life. He's an aeronautic engineer. And uh, all his career has been in GMV. So allow me to mention some figures which are rather spectacular. He has multiplied 3.5 the magnitude uh, of his company with a turnover of more than 150 million euros. His position is rather big. He is the deputy president for space of the Spanish Association of Technology Companies, TDAA. So he can talk about GMV and also on behalf of the whole sector. So I would ask the same question. How do you see the current situation? But more in general terms, as the deputy president of the TDAA, AE, and more specifically about navigation. Thank you very much, Angel. I am very optimistic regarding the situation we have in space and what the, we still have to see. As Jordi said, this is a very young industry, uh, only 65 years. The s industry has developed with major achievements. I'm rather optimistic at just about everything. We're talking about colonization of the moon, sending people to Mars, and very ambitious projects. But up to now, the space has proven to have more impact on communications and satellite navigation. In communications, I shall not say anything else apart from Miguel Angel said. In navigation, we are going through a, quite a sweet spot, actually, due to the highly strategic role of satellite navigation, or as they are actually called, uh, navigation positioning and timing services. It has a strategic value, has an impact on economy, according to the EU estimates. 12% of the EU economy depends on satellite navigation signal availability, and PNT services, uh, the satellite gives this technology with a lower cost than the ground networks. And this is growing. All world economies have their own satellite navigation system due to the strategic importance. Uh, the US was the first country 
from the mid 90s. We have GPS network, and then Russia, then Europe with Galileo, and then China. We have many constellations of satellites. So multi constellations and multi frequency is the way to go. And we will manage to have much more accuracy as well as a more a signal with much more integrity. The only problem is that it's very weak and is easier to interfere with it. Galileo, the European system, has a PRS signal, which is more robust and with uh, more resistance to uh, fraud and interference. So we use SVAS, which is augmentation system. The first um, was in the States. In Europe, we have our own one, ECNOS. And GMV has just got a contract with the Australian government of, more, of almost 200 million euros to develop these SVAS in Australia and New Zealand. We will sign it, and we will do the celebration soon. But I just wanted to I mentioned this because we are amongst friends. Another trend is the application of satellite service in unmanned vehicles for ground and aerial mm, services. We are working with BMW, and as it was mentioned before, we are see a transformation that we won't even believe was happening in transport. Transport will be self-driven very soon. And in a few generations, they won't even believe we drove our cars. And I think this is going to happen sooner than rather than later. We are doing our best. We are doing what we can, which is a lot, actually. Especially with BMW, we are developing the positioning system, which is embedded in BMW cars in the States. They are already in the market. And it has correction service with the global scale from GMV. Lastly, but I would like to mention that we are reaching the limit of what conventional system GPS Galileo can provide. I mean, they're all very similar system. They are all satellites in 10,000, 20,000 high, kilometer high, average, medium high orbits. We are beginning to talk about LEO satellites, which complement the other system, and uh, they can Pro provide a more resilient signal. They can penetrate indoor, and they can give us much better navigation than the day-to-day -day satellite life with this new LEO, low Earth orbit. So this seems to be rather a constant in GMV, right? Congratulations. Our third speaker, Juan Tomás Hernani, CEO of Atlantis, has been just about everything. His academic life has developed in different institutions, Spain and abroad. He's had public functions with Cristina Garmendia. He was Secretary General for Innovation. He's been CEO of different companies, even one which has nothing to do with space. I can't find the name of the other company. Anyway, he's been CEO of all of them, but he's mostly been working in space. And his latest adventure is Atlantis, created in 2013 with Cristina Almedia Rafael Guzman. And they're a small company that had just begun, but which has amazing, has had amazing results. It's already gaining profits. And I will not say that it's rather scary, but uh, big companies are looking up at them saying, what about this small fish that is coming up? So they've done quite an amazing job. And their Earth observation capabilities, optics for the time being, oh, they will not stop there for sure. Lastly, I also wanted to talk about his cap his skills as an uh, amateur opera singer. My last my question for him is more about Earth observation. Thank you, Angel. I said in private that you introduced me to people more than my wife does. 
And when I hear my CV, I always say the joke that I just, I turned up for the ad because it, the ad said it's useless, useless to be a candidate without reference. It was meant to be a joke. Anyway, we are part of the digitalization wave. The transformation in space industry is done by people who pay for the party, who are those who use data. Space can look like an industry for engineers, rockets, and astronauts, which it is. But at a larger scale, when we talk about the 300 plus million, we're talking about a data service, transmission, storage, and supply of data. And that's a truly digital industry. That is why we are undergoing through this gigantic transformation in observation as well. Last year, there were five SPACs operations in the states with 1,400 million in capital injection in a company close to Google. So they are creating major constellations. Three years ago, we reached 1,400 satellites operating in orbit. We now have 8,000. So what am I doing in this market? Well, I think you said this the other day. We used to be so happy eight years ago. Life was so easy, but that is over. If this global transformation has such an impact, I can't continue thinking about my own specifications, my own requirements, then the next, and sort of like going at the micro scale and micromanaging things. And after eight years of projects, I found a solution. Morocco has 70 centimeters. The UK is going for small satellites. Israel has small satellites. US too. And we need to know that, you know, acknowledge it. This is happening today in main advanced countries. And Atlantis is participating in some of the largest defense adventures in the world. So I think that in this sort of um, gigantic change, we are bound to specialize. International. We must understand this situation globally and internationally. <laughs> My clients are in Virginia, Tel Aviv, sorry, they're not in Gipuzkoa, sadly. Perhaps I could have a competitor um, there too, but my clients and competitors are all around the world. And when I go to bid in Thailand, I'm coming up against different competitors. My main competitor is an American company that has decided to um, use the um, ultra-high pixel technology that we use. One of the main manufacturers is um, carrying out direct competence, um, competence with us, um, competition with us, sorry. Where am I with regards to um, the world? Jorge was talking about um, having um, won a bid in New Zealand. And the question is, where can Spanish companies win bids around the world? We have to specialize and we have to focus, because otherwise it'll be very difficult to achieve success in such an aggressive um, world. Thank you very much, sir. You have spoken about United States um, and great sectors, and you have forgotten Inter with the cooperative constellations, which we are going to launch within Inter in March. What you said regarding globality is an opportunity and a threat. Because all of those um, competitors that you talk about um, are also within this sphere that w and in this arena that we're all fighting in. <clears throat> As it is a strategic sector, countries must support their industry. Because if we don't have backing from our countries, we cannot compete. How much do we have to compete? support so that we don't limit our competitivity within our own country. That is where the key lies. So, and that is why Miguel Bello um, did such a great job of explaining this, that each within the government be dedicated to their own industry. 
with the very difficult commitment um, that it entails to um, still be competitive and support your industry. In um, navigation, I would like to talk about globality and the shared use of um, Earth observation systems and navigation. The radar have millimetric resolutions, however, in navigation with GNSS, we are looking for millimeter um, differences, it seems like we're gravitating towards systems of systems where we don't only offer integral services, but also um, bearing in mind all of the sectors, uh, navigation, um, sailing, observation of the earth, and so on. And I want to ask you what your opinion is regarding this, and also what your point of view is regarding the LEO constellations, which will provide coverage to latitude latitudes where the NEO satellites cannot reach. The multi-domain applications and all of the navigations applications requires um, communications in 99% of the cases. With regards to Earth observation, this is also very frequent in applications. So yeah, the, I think that there is development in that sense. I briefly talked about the LEO component, and we haven't um, spoken about it, but it's the Secure Communication Program of the European Union. And I only bring it up, perhaps Miguel Angel wants to extend on it, but they wanted to create a complement of um, navigation or observation of the Earth as part of the um, safe communications constellation of the European Union. This communications program, which is multi-orbit, will have uh, geostationary and LEO and other components. Within the LEO components, they were thinking of um, applying satellite loads that will allow for the next, taking the next step in um, satellite communication, because as it, they are closer to the Earth, um, it allows to use other frequencies that allows to um, penetrate buildings, and you can have indoor navigation. So one of the programs that is currently being um, discussed in the ministerial conference of ESA is this issue, and we hope that it is pushed forward. With regards to globalization, in the broader sense of the word, globalization has um, taken a step back, yet that doesn't mean that we don't live in a world where cooperation and collaboration is essential, especially internationally. I must say um, that we have also um, signed another contract of 421 million um, in United States of uh, with a um, co air connectivity provider. And the 1st of February, we expect to launch a new satellite, the Amazon As Nexus, which is linked to this contract, which is linked to aerospace navigation. And um, to many of your surprise, it has um, a useful load of the um, American Defense um, Department. So we foresee a world in outer space where cooperation and collaboration is essential. Our satellite has a um, defense load from the United States because that allows us to diversify the risk. Thus, commercial operators allow us to implement um, certain capa capacities and capabilities that even though are not critical, may be essential for certain service providing. So I think this is an absolutely essential axis. I wanted to say that um, regarding Armenia, that is close. Um, we have the Arakis mission of discovering dark matter um, 
after 40 years of history in ESA. It's the first time that Spain is the lead in a scientific mission. We used um, a telescope that was destined to dark matter, um, was being used to analyze the Earth. And right now, we've gone back to analyzing um, the um, dark matter, and it's 174 million. We also are building four satellites. Really, you all have multi-million contracts, so that is fantastic. Now, I have a question for you all. Security, up until now, Security hasn't really been a severe issue, except for in uh, GNSS, where P uh, PRS appeared, and we were very aware of security. Beyond that, with the new <coughs> regulations of the European Union, there was security <coughs> everywhere. And we have um, introduced it and applied it to all programs. Security <coughs> is key. Um, como veis La protección. My question is, how do you see the protection of space assets with regards to the quantic key distribution, which is the way we can defend ourselves facing quantum computational um, elements? We have the expert here, which is Antonio, but anyway, with regards to security, <coughs> I want to pinpoint certain information regarding the use of space for global security. Space is necessary to protect the distribution in communication beyond 100 kilometers. Because if you're not using the space, you, it is simpler to attack you and for you to lose that security. Conceptually, there are two aspects that affect operators. On the one hand, protect our assets that we are flying in space, try um, to um, avoid them having internet connections, and within our corporations, try to have our own secure systems. The extended use of space for civil communications, and we've seen the example of the Ukraine war, war. We have seen that there have been 7,000 terminals that were operating with the Viasat um, network. The terminals were cyber attacked, and there was a confusion regarding whether it was the satellites. No, the attack was on the terminals and was carried out through the hubs, and they were blocked. So in the future, I think this issue is going to be key. That is also the opinion of our clients. And sharing the load with the, Euro the, the United States um, de Defense Department basically means that they protect us too. With regards to quantum keys, and I think tomorrow Antonio will explain it in more detail tomorrow. But to summarize, I think it can be a great opportunity, not only for ISPASAT, but for the collective in Spain that can use the funds that have been identified in this PERTE. And Antonio has given me the news that it has been approved by the agency. I think this will be very important for the future. The awareness of security being important is growing, and that is fantastic. And I think that the situation in, in Europe has really awakened us to this need. It's, this is a transcendental need. It's very important. And as a result, and in connection to what Miguel Angel was saying, that we are in a um, in a world where two multi-billionaire United States people could possibly monopolize the communications on the planet has made the, United, the European Union understand that we must be sovereign within our governmental communications at least. That program that has not been launched yet, which will be soon, 
is going to be the European Galileo for um, safe communications via satellite. It's an essential program, and I hope that um, we will foster the Spanish participation within this. I am not going to repeat um, what has been said with regards to quantum communications, but with regards to the Earth, I think it's essential to use certitude technologies, which allow us to see the data and timestamp of the position through blockchain technologies. This is something we will incorporate in the satellites um, that we will produce in 2024, and this will allow us to have uh, more security with regards to how the data that we provide were gathered. Something that a person that is very dear um, for me here in Seville, in the um, aerospace um, business forum that was carried out here in Seville a few months ago, the industries were complaining um, firstly about the fact that they could not hire talent or engineers. If we have money, if we have the programs, and the great coordination, and we have spoken about the fact that the development time to, mar time to market is very long. You can't really um, train an engineer in two minutes. So do you see a critical problem here with regards to talent and engineers? To me, it was surprising because um, all of the different sectors were complaining within the industry about that as the main problem. I do absolutely concur. It is a problem today and is going to be a problem in the future, not only in Spain, but in Europe. And it's going to be a considerable problem that will limit the capacity that Europe will have to create technology. And let's understand this as a stumbling block because we need to do something to solve it. The um, vocation for STEM disciplines has been decreased considerably, and therefore the enrollments and for the industries um, that, um, that get talent um, straight from university. For our industry, we have um, a high rotation um, of personnel in terms of what we do. And this is a problem. The pandemic has had a collateral effect that remote working has dynamized and has made the labor market a lot more dynamic and um, allowing for interviews online and all of those things have made it easier. However, ta finding the right talent is difficult and finding engineers is difficult. For us, we also have this problem, and especially in Spain. We have personnel in Brazil, in Peru, and Colombia, but particularly in Spain, this has become worse. And the pandemic has made it even more problematic because engineers that were perfectly um, capable were working with us in the offices and have offered um, double the money for working for a Washington um, company, and they were working from their house in Spain. What this means is that they have double the amount of money and they live in Spain, and that they work for international companies, and that, that poses a problem for us. I'm absolutely in agreement with what you have said. <laughs> and I wonder whether we have um, the doctors we need or do we lack them? Do we have the nurses we need or do we lack them? Do we have the teachers that we need or do we lack them? Um, because there are vacancies um, everywhere and restaurants don't have enough personnel. So really, we are suffering the consequences of the um, age pyramid. Engineers are just another um, stage within this whole um, problem. It really is one of the problems that the country has that we really need to think about with regards to our children and immigrants because we need to solve our problems. 
um, bringing over an engineer from Turkey is currently very difficult, and it should be much easier. So having said this, what we do is we have created the Atlantis schools where we have 12 people that um, are um, studying engineering, and when they finish their degree, they have also um, been working with us for four years. And I think really it's important to be aware of the problem be before one can solve it, because we have had lack of support with regards to science in Spain. It's not <coughs> only science, it's technology, it's mathematics. Everything is important and everything retrofeeds into it, um, the global needs. So the first thing that we need to do is be aware of this need. We're going to draw soon to a close because we don't have a lot of time. I would ask you to state what is relevant regarding what we have discussed here and to talk about a few seconds about the problem of private investment in the United States and Europe. I have talked about it previously. I think that there is a certain threat from the technological point of view. We have solved it. And we can um, probably be successful. However, it is difficult to um, avoid this business model. Um, and in Twitter, they say that they don't know whether they should um, go into Chapter 11 or not. In any case, we mustn't get depressed. We can work with them, though initially they're not inclined to finding partners around the world, although they are opening up a little bit. It's important to understand whether these moguls will be successful or not. Finally, I'd like to say, and it's uh, regarding our industry, our space, defense, and security. We do not reach the masses enough. There's no dissemination. So from the point of view of space, which is perhaps a little more attractive, and it may be easier, but in the years that I have worked in defense, we have spoken a lot about a project of um, defense culture dissemination that for one reason or another have not been put forth. And I think it is an essential time for the dissemination of the defense culture and um, space culture, because right now is the right moment for people to understand it, because it's closer to home. And I think it's quite um, striking that there are very few journalists in an event like this. <coughs> if we want to convince our citizens that this is worth investing in, we must work hard. And I think this will help the agency because up until now, the competencies have been distributed in different um, official um, organizations, and none of them have felt that they had full-fledged competencies to do things. So this space agency is going to help in that. And what about defense as well? I think the agency is going to um, foster defense too. Jorge, I agree with you, Angel. I think the space agency is going to help. And again, I agree that defense is important too. The agency is going to help, but together we must help too. To draw my intervention to a close, the threat that these graced American investors, um, well, I don't think they're not going to um, find partners, uh, but I don't see them being the monopoly of the world. I don't know. We'll see what will happen. So to close, 
this panel that um, where we have been talking about industrial and global development, the vision that we have in GMV is we are growing um, very fast and we continue down the path of growing. We believe that the only way to reach um, the international global market is growing and using a company that is strong. And we've grown a lot, like I said, but we <coughs> have not hit the targets that we wanted. We have to continue growing in value chain and the capability that we have to carry out great projects. And I think this is something that attracts talent. So STEM are looking for great projects and great technological challenges. That, that's what we're trying to do. And to close, I would say that technology, internal demand, and international markets. We are, with regards to technology, in a wonderful country. Spain is a breeding ground for great engineers with great um, innovation capacity. We have a discipline and ecosystem that allows us to produce miracles. And we have to be very proud of it and bear that in mind because they could be very important. But this is just part of the equation with regards to national demand. And the second issue that we must understand is that we should be like Israel. We are an offshore country where our national demand won't get us too far. So um, for us, for instance, the first launch was in Japan, then in the United States, in Spain. We haven't really dipped our toes into all of this because um, we invested in our own satellite and we ended up selling it to Asia. That's not the problem. If we understand that we are an offshore country, then that's OK, because that will allow us to grow outwards. The attitude towards national demand is, what can I do for my country? Can I help in defense? Can our technology help with regards to cost and deadlines and what they support? Can they supplement your strategy? That is the attitude because we're no longer begging um, the market to let us in so we can grow. Really, this is no longer the case. It's much better to understand that Spain is an offshore country and think about, well, I come back to my country, how can I help? And lastly, the issue of United States, we must be very vigilant. It's the first market. It's a capital market that is humongous, and they can change the rules of the game. We have tried to play that game. We have an American investor that has um, bought 5% of Satlantis España, and they have um, bought Satlantis um, United States for in 45% of the shares. So at least what I think is essential is that we take advantage of the opportunities that the markets offer outside and in the United States. We have to play their game following um, the rules. And thinking that we can't succeed in the United States is a grave mistake. And I believe, of course, that we must play in the global market, yet we have um, a long way to go. Um, and there are countries like um, Canada, which have a similar GDP, that can help us grow in space production. These three companies are wonderful. And the whole sector is wonderful. So I'm very optimistic with the for the future of our industry. So I congratulate you um, as representatives of your companies and of the industry. Thank you very much for your participation in this roundtable. Thank you. I want to thank the four speakers in this very interesting roundtable on space. So we've talked about defense, and um, we've talked about space, and the next block will combine both. We will talk about the technology, defense, and space as sector for change. So the first presentation this afternoon is by Director General GMV, Jesus Serrano for whom I would kindly ask you to give him a round of applause.
Bueno, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Firstly, I want to thank the organizers for having invited me to participate to take a part in this presentation. As I said this morning, GMV was established in the mid-80s with a clear technological vocation, and we need to be in, and I'm really happy to be in this presentation because as I said this morning, the company has been developed over the last 40 years based on technology and innovation. Nowadays, GMV is a technological multinational in Spain with sister companies in more than 80 countries of three continents with more than 30, uh, as you can see on the slide, 3,000 professionals highly qualified. And these are the business figures. Defense and space, technology as the factor for change. We, I could talk about technology as a fundamental element for future energy missions in space with kilometer long satellites assembled in space and refurbished in orbit. Or technologies for future missions of space mining or even the technologies we need to inhabit the surface of Mars. But I thought it might be more interesting to land on Earth to talk about technology in activities in the short term to space uh, um, scopes, which are dual use, space traffic management and satellite navigation, and to share a few considerations with you on the technology and future of defense. Europe started the definition of EGNOS in 1995, it became operational in 2009. And the first operational satellite was launched in 2011. The system was declared operational and gave the initial service in 2016. The constellation will be finished next year, providing additional service of PRS, high accuracy, and authentication. In these three decades, the development of critical technologies for satellite navigation system has been key to make sure Galileo gives very good positioning and meets with the established requirements, atomic clocks, algorithms to process orbits and time sync, estimate of retardation, giving need to the need giving place to the need to develop this technology, signal processing receivers and maps. The interpreters would like to mention that the speaker is reading a script that we have not received. 12% of the union GDP receive it. They allow for an improvement of the operation in many sectors of the economy, which require precise, reliable information on positioning and timing, and information on search and rescue for emergencies. It helps the daily life of citizens, giving information that can be combined with other civil applications which have a huge impact in the environment. Satellite navigation system and the technologies deployed generate new business models, as Jorge said, as well as new disruptive applications in new scopes. One is autonomous driving, in which we know, knowing the precision and the level of confidence or trust, reliability of the information, are key to comply with the requirements for those systems. Even though Galileo is not complete, we started to develop in the second generation with electric propulsion. Interestingly, it links flexible payloads, with, which are fully digital and reconfigurable to respond to future evolutions of signals. Navigation antenna either are more sophisticated with better signal. Authentication and protection against jamming and spoofing and evolution of the algorithms and new IT technology for new services. The use of these technologies will lead to a service with better specifications that is more resilient and reliable. But as Jorge said, technological progress has no end, and the current market of devices and applications is estimated to be 152,000 million euros with many receivers in the world. The development of businesses inspire new applications that entail more demanding requirements for a spaced infrastructure which is reaching the limit. 
to overcome that limit and to have centimeter precision availability of signal without jamming, we have new elements and technologies for the future. One of them is low orbit satellites that um, Jorge mentioned, and it is currently being discussed in the ministerial conference that we convey new signals, avoiding interference and with higher passive penetration indoor and the capacity to do data transmission, accelerate convergence of precise positioning, or monitoring the integrity of GPS and Galileo signal before they are received on the ground. We are concerned for the environment in our planet, but we are not so concerned about the space environment. There are 32,000 objects in the orbit with more than centimeters in Leo and one meter in Geo. A collision of, the, of two objects could be catastrophic. It could generate many fragments and they could cause an increase of the population as it happened in 2009 at the anti-satellite testing in 2021. If many of these collisions occurred, there could be a similar effect compared to the chain effect of the Kessler syndrome. There are more, there, there is more than one million of fragments which are not cataloged or monitored. And in case of collision, there could not be the catastrophic, but we could entail losses. In total, there are more than 10,000 tons orbiting the Earth. In total, there are only 6,800 satellites which are active. There are initiatives aimed at creating mega constellations with many one-web satellites. This is 460, 604 planning, Starlink 3,000, and more than 12,000 in plan. So in total, tens of, mil of millions of, of thousands of um, satellites can be launched in order to guarantee the sustainability and stability of these operations and to preserve the space we need to manage the space traffic safeguarding active satellites and the uncontrolled population of space debris this is paramount to support the collision avoidance and the coordination between maneuverable satellites this entails many technological challenges, such as monitoring, cataloging of objects from Earth, including more powerful radars with capacity beyond LEO, high power laser systems for non cooperative objects, passive radio frequency systems, and many others. We need to complement that with vigilance satellites that can use optic sensors, radar, laser, or passive radio frequency systems. Automatizing collision avoidance and using artificial intelligence and other systems such as multi-agent and intelligent contracts, such as blockchain for the safe exchange of data, can give us many advantages. The number of data available will be higher for the increasing population of objects and sensors. We need to have many techniques of processing big data. We need to ensure confidentiality and integrity of data and due governance. Blockchain is a promising solution for that purpose. In the decentralized exchange of data and allocation of responsibilities to the various players. <clears throat> Due to the increase of the number of satellites and generation of space debris, the, we need to have an active elimination capacity. So we need to make progress in sensor processing, imaging, propulsion of robotic technologies for capture of target objects and refurbishment of a satellite to extend its useful life. Technology has been a key element for our citizens. It generates key progress for civil society. GPS or internet constellations are only two examples. The 2022 NATO strategic concept talks about the plan. On the one hand, strategic competitors and adversaries 
are investing in technologies that may limit our access to space, our freedom in space, deteriorating team equipments, and having a negative impact in our defense. It considers that disruptive technologies bring both opportunities and threats and are changing the type of conflict, acquiring better strategic importance and becoming key scenarios for global competition. NATO, quote unquote, thinks that technological supremacy has more importance in the battlefield. So technology is not only a vector for change, but also a critical and key element to ensure our defense. Technology is the reason why we need to consider the battlefield in five dimensions, Earth, sea, space, and cyberspace. The response to this paradigm are the multi-domain operations, joint coordinated operations using collaborative environments such as force multiplier, agile uh, situations, and able of creating these solutions. To do this, we need to have advanced sensors and armed system interoperability and interconnectedness between armies and allies and domains, as well as systems for demand and control for these operations. And this is all fully in the new combat cloud. In multi-domain operations, technology is a key element sensors and platforms that are digital and configurable that can be duplicated according to the operational needs in the battlefield. New generation weapons and direct energy weapons, autonomous and robotic platforms using beehive in technologies in different visions of uh, surveillance, support, rescue, logistics support, it is also key to have the operational development, this concept, man and man teaming, machine learning and big data to process and exploit the huge amount of information given to us by sensor infrastructure, comparing action strategies and comparing optimum solutions in order to help in the complex multivariable decision making process. Multi-domain, multi-level battlefield that is reliable, in, has integrity and accessibility, as well as interoperability between the various armed forces. Communication and eventual processes of the compact cloud will need to give the high requirements. Quantum technologies will be very helpful to reinforce the security of the systems and information, and also for the use of quantum computing. In this concept of multi-domain operations and intelligent and digital hyperconnecting, the electronic warfare have become a key element to gain superiority in the face of our threats. I finish my presentation here. Thank you very much for your attention. The interpreters didn't have the script of this presentation, which was literally read at the speed of light. I want to thank the director of GM V, Jose Serrano. Our next speaker, thank you very much for being here, is the assistant director of Satsang. You know it very well, the satellite center of the European Union, Luis Tillar. Tille, sorry. Pues muchas gracias. Uh, el Centro Satellites de la Unión Europea eh, fue creado en. This center was created 30 years ago and it's been acknowledged to be a high technology center by the European Intelligence Services. We have it with 50% of the staff, which is Spanish citizens, because we have top competencies here. So I wish you best success with your future space agency and the research and development programs. I am here today to talk to you about technology as a vector of the change process. This would be more of a topic to be covered by an epistemologist, but the organizers 
make sure you would not get bored, so they chose me instead. So I'm going to go back to English. It would be easier for me. How far is technology driving processes? Technology is becoming very, very complex. And I will first share personal experience before going into the subject, not in space, but in deep seas, when I was a young Navy officer on a submarine. I was impressed by the knowledge of my commanding officer in this time. He has about 15 years on board the same ships, knowing the submarines, which is nuclear, with a nuclear reactor on board, very well, and how it worked. Once we had a technical issue, and he didn't have the answer, because technology was so complex. So what he did is gathering the people who knew about it, having discussion, getting their advice, before deciding what to do, because we could not get any support from the outside as we were underwater. It is an important lesson of hum humility on highly technical issues I have kept all life. Then, to go into our subjects, war has always some surprises. Since SATSEN was created in 1991, well, the political decision and the creation on 1st January 1992, how war has evolved. In 1991, the Gulf War outlined the use of intelligence from space as major in US bomb bombing and targeting. Later, in Serbia, in 1999, internet proved to be quite resilient, even if it was a it became a civilian technology, as internet was still working despite bombings. It was the age of the network-centric warfare that was seen as a revolution in military affairs at the same time from this book that was published in 1999. In the last decade, we had some also more technical and affordable technologies rising. In 2012, for example, there was some jamming of uh, TV broadcasting from Deutsche Welle, Deutsche Welle, Voice of America, or France 24, in Iran and Syria, uh, originating from those countries, especially to avoid uh, accessing to the information from those occidental channels. More recently, in 2018, the first drones, were, which were bought on the market, were used to put some grenades on, on it and to also bomb and attack Iraqi forces. If we go back in history, I would just like to point out the Strategic Defense Inis Initiative launched by 1983 by Ronald Reagan. It was impossible to achieve to most scientists, but it has driven huge research and development investments accelerating the pace of progress. It was about space. It was about networking to provide information. And it was also about computer science. Would a Google have appeared later if they didn't have this huge investment at this time? I don't know, but I think it played an important role. So, just to illustrate this, it didn't happen by the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s, as uh, this Arthur C. Clarke novel and famous movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey. But if we look back at the pace of investment, I would just like to draw your attention of this huge gap between investment, government expenditure in space, which has been flooding all research and development uh, in the US, accelerating the pace of progress. How SpaceX and Starling depending how SpaceX and Starling are today depending from a strong ecosystem that is lowering risk for entrepreneurship. Now I will go back to the European Satellite Center. When it was created in 1992, it has been here for 30 years. I will divide it in three periods. First one, uh, it was a Western European Union uh, center, and it was using spot images mainly, which were 10 centimeters uh, accurate. In 2000, President Clinton has 
free the use of the GPS. It, he said everybody will now have use of GPS, whether even if it was a military system. And also, he authorized uh, operators, satellite operators, to, to sell imagery that were very accurate. So, very quickly, the EU Satellite Center were using Econos images that which accuracy was under one meter. At the end of, I would say in 2010, 90% of our production relied on US imagery coming from US operators. It was also a period of strong political commitment from the European Union. 2003 was the first war European, well, sorry, EU mission in Bosnia. It was also where the foundation of the external action services was set up with the Javier Solana. Then in 2011, there was a launch of Pleiad, which gave access to uh, same accurate image uh, to European. And today, Satsen is providing its images through at about 85% from European providers. So it's a, just an example of how, when gathering together at European level, we can come back in the competition and also provide some strong uh, assets even in space, where the technological uh, competition is very hard. Satsen mission is to provide a common strategic culture by providing, supporting the common security and defense policy of European member states. It's also maximizing synergies and complementarities with EU activities in space and security. It is working in space, in security, and also in defense. Whereas our operational production in the 10 last years have augmented 10 times, our budget only augmented twice because of strong, uh, and how to, to do it? It was about catching the best from our research and development and adapting processes. Today, Satsen is also quoted in the strategic compass in the four pillars about acting, securing, investing, and partnering with, uh, with, uh, with uh, partnerships and third countries. Just to show what we have been doing through the last 30 years, first, that is an uh, image that we were working in the 90s, 10 meters resolution. Uh, computer science was at this age in the 90s. You had these big, uh, big screens. Uh, we had to take also to pictures with the old, uh, uh, well, paper pictures. Whereas in the 20s, we are working today with some images which are about uh, down to 30 centimeters accurate. We, we are also working through digitalization as all our products are digitalized and we, with a strong support from our IT sectors. So first, what I would like to point out, how did we did this? First thing on the over is operational service. Our operational service is about their special intelligence. Second, we need to have a strong human resource policy. We have our own training because taking people and finding people who can <coughs> interpret images, you don't find it like this uh, everywhere. So we have our own training unit that trains 50% of our personnel and the 50% others are training the EU member states uh, staff. Then it is also combined to the strong information technology policies to provide the support we need and get the best from the computer science and also investing in artificial intelligence issues. Then to foresee the future, we are also working on capability development. We have a team that has to foresee what will be the future of the, technical, of the technology we are using and where we should look at. It is uh, projects can fail, of course, because if you want to look into the future, we have to look, take at them very early, test it, and then after it keeps the best of it and the one which, 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 which will succeed and improve our processes. And the last part is having a wide community of users through cooperation with EU bodies and member states. Our users are military, for example, from the EU military staff. They are also intelligence services from the member states. 
There are also from agencies of the European Union, like Frontex, when we survey, when we look out at the borders of the European Union. But they can also be partners like the United Nations and, uh, formal, and uh, through the, uh, for the prevention of chemical weapons, for example, in, in Syria. But it's always very important to get this tie link with the users just to better understand what they are looking for and if the service we provide is the one they are looking for. So just to illustrate technology as a vector of the change process, I took out this picture from the uh, library of the Monasterio of San Lorenzo. I find it quite interesting to see in this big room where you have some books uh, from in different languages, in Hebraic, in Greek, in Latin, and also in the middle of it, this uh, uh, Armila sphere, which is presenting the uh, which is presenting the Earth at, at center, and we, that's all we have in front of us. We have so many different technologies, but which one will be the game changer tomorrow? We really need to have a wide open. I will come back to my first lesson of humility. Things are getting so complex and even more in space that we need the skills of everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Director of Satsang. Uh, thank you for being here today at Seville and, and welcome. Um, muchas gracias por estar aquí en Sevilla. So thank you very much for your presentation. So we're going to proceed now to a round table. So I would like to ask on stage Counter Admiral Fernando Puo, Joaquin Rodriguez, Admiral Santiago Bolívar, Félix Fernández and Javier Moreno. And I give the floor to Ángel Macho, the director and editor of Info Defensa. Sí, yo creo que están cerca. Bueno. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon and thank you very much for holding on there. It's been a long day. We're going to try and shake up things a bit with this round table. Firstly, I want to thank the organizers for having invited me to chair this amazing panel with amazing panelists that I will try and coordinate. So I'm not a big expert in maths and science. I'm more of a humanities person. But I try my best to understand. But that's the whole idea, to try and understand how technology is key in the change process. This morning, General Ballesteros talked to us about technology as a dissuasive factor, which is key. And then, Timo Pisanen said that technology is based on innovation, which means that we should always start by innovating. In any case, technology is in the air, is part of our lives, and thanks to disruptive technologies, it is even harder to follow what's going on. Our top panelists will help us clarify and understand the topic. Firstly, please allow me to introduce them. I will do a very short uh, presentation of their CVs. And I'm going to ask a comment to all of you. So I'll give you all three or five minutes to talk to me about your point of view on the topic of the round table. How is technology having an impact, or will have an impact in the future, in the change that we are witnessing? Rear Admiral Fernando Pool Quintana, Head of Satellite Systems and Cyber Defense at the General Director for Armory and Material. He was in the Navy, then he's an expert in communications and has a diploma in state and war, naval warfare. 
is in the NATO, in the, in the in Brussels, combined maritime forces in Barheim, participated in the Balkans War, uh, in the fight against piracy in Somalia. He's the rear admiral since 2018. He's chief admiral for technical assistance uh, and head of satellite systems, and he's been an aggregate for defense in the Spanish embassy in Washington and Ottawa. In August 2002, he has his current position as head of satellite programs and defense at the General Dir Directorate for Armory and Materials. Thank you, Angel. And I also want to thank the Director General for GMV, because everything I was going to say, he's already said it, and in a really nice way, even much better than I was planning to say, especially the last part of my presentation. So I'm here to talk about my thing, and this is my thing. So I'm going to try and give it a little bit of a military angle to it. For me, the main change that new technologies have brought to the Army is the appearance of a new domain for confrontation, space. The use of space by the armed forces brings clarity. It dissipates the fog of the war that Claude Sevy quoted in his Treaty on War. It decreases uncertainty and it gives advantages to people who use it in the battlefield. And in all domains, traditional domains, as Jesus said, earth, sea, and ground, and the new domains, cyberspace. How do they get this? Well, we all know this. They had a more realistic and accurate vision of the operations theater, of the enemy's position, improving communications, making them more reliable and safer, improving the position of our units, and allowing for data transfer all along the planet, facilitating the establishment of networks, and of course, with greater accuracy in the armament, improving targeting, etc. This possible use of the armed forces in Spain for everything that I have listed really implies an expanse of the confrontational um, sphere to space. And also satellites from the nations that use them are strategic elements. They require um, critical installations which in conflict times is the main target, a priority target. And depending on um, which side is fighting, we have to defend or neutralize. And that depends on where we're fighting. Until now, the use of space was limited to very few nations, especially um, in defending and attacking. However, new technologies, which is what we're dealing with in this um, panel, like the um, reduction and miniaturization of components, the calculus um, exponential increment, the um, production and storage of energies, all of these new technologies imply a reduction in cost um, for using space, being able to use satellites. And right now in space, there are satellites from very many um, companies and organizations that have launched them. This space organization, as Jesus Serrano has pointed to, has meant <coughs> that there is an exponential increase of um, orbiting satellites, more than 30,000, including space debris that is bigger than 10 centimeters. This will bring um, collisions and accidents to um, our world. And we've talked about cybersecurity, but I'm talking about physical security because this overpopulation of satellites means that there's going to be um, collisions between satellites and um, space debris collisions. And as we saw a few days ago, also um, the um, 
entering, re-entering of um, space debris into our atmosphere again. And I was affected by it when I was trying to catch a flight. In the civil sphere, there's going to be conflicts um, in obtaining orbital positions or frequencies because there's overpopulation in times of crisis and conflicts. This will imply the confrontation for space in for the use of space. And most states can use um, space, even our adversary. And I'm not talking about anti-satellite missiles, but they use um, images to, um, to the resolution of 70 milli centimeters for military purposes. So we must prepare in the um, DG of armament and material, we develop satellite programs um, with regards to um, Earth observation, radar, um, spectrum, um, infrared communications uh, satellites like the new ones. I don't know if is the is going to talk about the new generation to Pinsat. That in about two years will be in orbit. We also participate very actively within the Galileo program of um, satellite position. And also, we develop robust receptors for these signals. It's important to have um, programs to develop um, space vigilance. Um, well, and, I'm, and I'm not talking about the S3 stop dependent on Thadeti, because they do um, space supervision or vigilance. But what I mean is really um, vigilance of um, things that can affect our systems. The armed forces, um, after the creation of the um, 2019 um, National Space Strategy, they created the um, Monitoring and Operations Center of Space um, Surveillance. We are now improving its infrastructures, and I think in the future we will improve the detection capacity, as the GMV CEO has um, mentioned. What do we think about the future? Um, Mr. Breedlove, General Breedlove, is very right in saying that um, we must prepare for conflict in Spain. We depend on GEMAP. Um, allowing us to um, be able to work in that um, sphere. And that's all I want to add today. Thank you very much, um, Admiral. And w I understand that technology is present in all of your um, programs, and you have a subdirectorate of R&D, so truly you um, foster technology as one of the key factors in the process of change that we are going through. Thank you very much, Rear Admiral. I would like to introduce Joaquin Rodriguez Grau. He's engineer by the um, University Polytechnic of Madrid, uh, masters in, by the University Pontificia de Comidas. He was um, delegate of the Technological Aerospace Park. And right now, he is um, the, um, C, the the director of CATEC, the Advanced Technologies Aerospatial Cen Aerospace Center. Categorized as the most in receiving the Innovation Radio Prize in Budapest in, 19, in 2017, forgive me, which really um, reaffirms their commitment to innovation. CATEC is the leader in our past technology, which we have talked about uh, here, and is part of the working group for the new European regulation for ASA and ISA. And with that, Joaquin, I give you the floor. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Angel. Um, it's wonderful to be able to be here with you all again. The question that you asked is how does innovation connect to change? How is it a um, change vector? And I 
want to um, reiterate that Timo Bessonen from the European Commission said that um, for him, the order was innovation and technology, and this led to change. And um, he, this really is the cue that we needed for this roundtable, because it's very easy, innovation, technology, and then change. And how was this working up until now, now 10 years ago? It, within the realm of space and defense, it was very easy to understand. But from the 60s, 50s and 60s, the um, disruptive innovation always come from space or defense spheres. In space, which was very much connected to science, had m more um, innovation for the society. And defense um, responded and responds to the need of um, defending sovereignty and national interests. And they require innovation. And at the end, the society was the receptor of, of the result of all of those innovations. Yet in the last 10 years, all of that has changed drastically. We have all seen the B to C concept develop. Great corporations are selling services directly to people, to the consumers, not to other corporations. And I don't know where Miguel Angel Banduro is. And he said, and that leads that the two um, great fortunes of the world invest in um, satellites and space. And truly, the big creators of the business tendencies worldwide detected that it was very important to have an 8 billion um, market of their services in terms of technology. And from this point on, when we can buy whatever we want from our mobile phone, we as consumers can have an influence um, on the technology that is created because we are a broader market than the defense or than um, ministry or than a country. So the new market niches are the things that we consume the most with mobiles or iPads, data and mobility. Because people today or currently have needs that are met with regards to content, communication with people we love, with um, companies, and when we need something physical, then we need mobility, which is the one that provides us, this transport provides us with what we want. So this humanity made up of 8 billion people can um, consume products from Jess Bezos and Elon Musk. So when people individually can choose what they want with such purchasing power, we have an influence on the change of society because we're not the receptor of technology anymore and innovation, but we are the ones that are fostering it. That is why New Space is the um, private actor that responds to the data business and the navigation with data um, targeted to personal um, clients. With regards to mobility, I wanted to give you a few numbers. Um, we um, really work on um, unmanned mobility, autonomous mobility that feeds um, from data and positioning in from space, of course. We follow the Morgan and Stanley report regarding the mobility of um, UAT mobility. And I think those 8 billion people, when we demand mobility, we're going to create spectacular business. And Morgan and Stanley believe that um, there's going to be 70 billion euros um, in, in, in mobility. And in um, 
f the future for 2050, we um, foresee nine trillion um, global um, demand for um, mobility and over urban delivery. That is a great amount of demand. So really, people are the ones that are driving innovation. And that innovation is what generates technology. When we talk about dual technologies, we generally understood that it was from the military to the civil. Um, that was the linear direction. But that was broken now, because now, with regards to digital or communicational worlds, the civil world is providing technology to defense and space. And thank you very much, Joaquin, for your intervention. Now we have Almirant um, Santiago Bolivar Piñero, who's the president of He's De Sat. He has a lot of experience and a very wide, C broad CV. And I'm going to highlight the things that catch my attention. Among the many things that he has done, he was Corbett captain. He was um, the head of the Now Historica Santa Maria and um, head of the Flotilla Niña y Pinta in the celebration of the 500th anniversary of the discovery of Americas. And they stopped in several ports and um, more than 10 million people visited. The importance of dissemination, this was the program that had the biggest impact of the celebration of the fifth um, 500 years. He was the commander of the um, Juan Sebastián Elquero Elcano um, vessel. He was professor of the Naval um, Academy. He has had different destinations. He was um, rear admiral designated as chief for communications of the army. In 2008, he was vice admiral and chief of the federal arsenal, responsible for the building of the Fry Great Cristobal Colon, first of the F-100, um, and the um, Juan Carlos I um, aircraft carrier. From 2013, he was head of the Euromar 4 from Rota. In July 2015, he goes to be part. He moves to being part of the reserve, and in he was then chairman, appointed chairman of the board of directors of Itzesat. He's member of the Academy of the Arts and um, Literature of the Gadith um, region. And with that, Admiral, your CV is very long, so I have been as brief as possible, sir. I'm sure I've, less, I've left out many things. Forgive me. In any case, from your broad perspective, and as chairman of the board of directors of His Desat, I wanted your opinion regarding technology as a vector for the process of change. First of all, thank you very much, Angel, for giving me the floor and the organizers of this event for allowing this summit to take place and allowing me to speak to you all. Uh, innovation always reminds me of what a zarzuela, which is a traditional Spanish song, um, says, um, this is um, barbarity, and um, times are running ahead of us much quicker than we expected. But I think we are facing different speeds, and allow me to reflect upon this. As a user of the industry of defense, I'd like to analyze this from a different point of view the problems that a pilot have when they pilot a plane or the first officer in, an, um, in a vessel. When I finished my studies, um, my maritime studies, I uh, boarded a BG. We had 
data converters that transferred digital analog a radar, radar that had a 3D 250 mile range and SM-1 missiles um, which had a long range and lots of other um, armor. Working in the Sahara um, war and playing with the F-1s, really um, we had a vessel that had a 9.8 in Guantanamo and had surpassed the molders, no plane could enter our fields. F-1s flew um, very, very close to the earth, yet we could detect them because our um, vessels were highly technological, really. I've never been in a, in a vessel as such after that. So that is why it's important to think about what can we do today and um, how we can invest in the preparation of the people, which is essential for any technology. Years have gone by. What does the army have? Communications back then were HF and the operations were understood as a combat system which was within the ship. And it was like a balloon around us. Um, we controlled the space around us, uh, the space under sea, um, and the space surrounding us. And so this um, balloon was the operational capacity that the vessel had. When we um, increased the um, linking capacities, we created a micro balloon in what we wanted then was um, be able to see and be able to target, um, target well and continue targeting. But how can you shoot first? By seeing first. How can you continue targeting? Um, by having artillery and having um, span and so on. The principle is still the same. But the problem for an official of CC seeing first and then being able to identify, that's where the Kamin and Elin come in because they aid identification. And then it's important to dissuade with a credible ability and with a possible will to act. If dissuasion is, um, if one has to act, we act. And if we can't act forcibly, then dissuasion doesn't work. That was a problem that a gentleman or gentlewoman from the Theithi would have detect, identify, control, and if necessary, combat and destroy the enemy before being destroyed ourselves. The technological advance has allowed us to go from this balloon that was part of one vessel to all of the vessels being linked and that all of the air forces be linked so that everyone has an aerial photograph of what is going on, a real maritime picture for everyone. And if we go underwater too. So this technological advancement is incredible. And that is due to communications, which is digitalization and communication. The leap forward is incredible. And where are we now? What do we have? Our imagination allows us to foresee that the communication capabilities will allow us, on top of this multi-dominion that we are working on, air, sea, and land, we can also dominate cybersecurity and space. We spoke about whether technique was fundamental before, and it is. But now, when we bring space into this equation, Cyberspace is technique. Space is a reality, but technique here is absolutely necessary. 
So technique is absolutely essential for any change. But let's focus on what the Saka said this morning, um, Mr. Breedlove. Now, the best vessels that we have in Europe are the F-100. Last year, we had an exercise regarding a match um, 2.9 missile. There were many European um, vessels, the Cristobal Colon. And United States was not part of this exercise. Who got rid of the missile, the Cristobal Colon vessel? The sensors and weapons um, um, from in this vessel are from the 90s, yet it's communications and not technology. Therefore, has different speeds. Of the decades of the 90s, we had second stats. However, now we have very important satellites, and we are building the most important ones. So technology has different gears, so to speak. What does an officer in a boat, or in a vessel rather, worry about? And what do um, Spanish defense companies worry about? Well, they're the they worry about detecting, identifying, controlling, and combating if necessary. In all of the different operational scenarios that exist, and if all of this is linked, wonderful. Yet, are we really linked? We are linked in um, what is around us, but we don't have great links yet in space. In sensors and uh, weapons, we don't have um, VMD capacity. Do we have any system in Europe that will allow us to understand all of the um, aerial, land, and maritime contacts at the same time? No. We're talking about the future. When will this be possible? When will this happen? Will we get to the multi-dominion um, sphere and that space is essential there? Yes. Of course, do we have to work on the operational dominion of space? Yes. Yet, understanding where we are and where we're headed, I would focus on what the Admiral had said. Knowing what exists is the first thing we need to understand. And now we're vulnerable to cyber attacks and everything that is encompassed within them. This um, cybersecurity issue in cyberspace. Really, we have to foresee this. And I know that the Ministry of Defense is working hard to do this. So. What does is this ad do? We try to um, fulfill the um, capability spatial requirements of the Ministry of Defense because really what they're trying to do in the Ministry of Defense is understand the timing and we are renewing the last generation satellite with the most advanced systems with ones that um, spread all the span throughout all the different possibilities, the bombs, the particulates with energy. And that's what we're doing here this ad. So thank you very much, um, Admiral. From the maritime domain, we move on to multi-domain within the air. Felix Fernandez Merino, he's business development director in Technobit Grupo Isia. He's colonel in the Air Force, um, in reserve and in space, Air Force and space. Gatha um, pilot, number one of the 36 um, corps, and he's got, um, of the Air Force, He's got a degree in economics and business. In 2008, he became part of Airbus, where he developed different um, tasks. And since 2021, he is the business development director in Technobeat. Felix, I give you the floor. Bueno, voy a intentar hablar de espacio, seguridad, defensa, capacidades industriales y tecnología. Otro momento. So, Admiral, we can talk about frigates at another point, but let me focus on this. In space, we can talk about dual systems. 
But uh, to be coherent with the previous speakers, I will concentrate on defense. The most important uh, goal is to enjoy the welfare state, health, education, infrastructure. But to do that, we need security. And security um, it really involves defense. When talking about defense, and even though NATO in December 2019, space was a new operational domain, in 1993, I remember that when we went together with five Air Force captains, we were deployed in Bosnia to do combat air controllers. It was a nightmare to work with, to send reports, HF, and things that didn't work. And then the British people arrived. They gave us a briefcase with tactics, and it changed our lives. It shows how to space also contributes to other domains, in this case, air and ground. The mission of industry is to provide solutions so that our armed forces can meet the missions. So what capacities do they need? We need to work with them. And we, we only want to do, make profit. We also want to contribute with the purpose, which is to make Spain a safer place, which means that we need to work with the armed forces. We need to know their mission, their needs, and we can quote Essen, the uh, National Aerospace Security Strategy. Then we have the Space Air Force. And there are many directives from the NATO and from the EU. But I want to talk about the PDC, the Joint Doctrine Publication. One is um, space, and the other one is infrastructure. And we need to know what we are talking about so that we can work with them jointly. As for exploitation of space, the ST activities to understand space order. But exploitation from space is divided into four blocks. Number one, obtaining intelligence with imaging, infrared sensors, electro-optics sensors, and any other sensors that will develop it will be developed shortly. In it come in is another mission. The other mission is communications and connectivity. We see how operations change. At the Ukraine war, connectivity is a game changer. Another point is support for navigation and positioning, which needs to be safe. If you're receiving unsafe, signals and they are doing spoofing or jamming or hacking. And another point is weather problems. Protection against threats from space, such as ballistic missiles, hypersonic missiles, offensive satellites, or attacks to our infrastructure in air and ground. With kinetic energy elements, targeted energy or distorters, or just a sabotage or a cyber attack. We need to know the threats to really find a solution. So after we say that we understand the mission, and since I'm here, I want to talk about my thing. My thing is how OSEA, a national industry that I hope we are join forces to give an answer to our national ministry and armed forces, and we join arms to give them our best and uh, to be more competitive. The solution that my group, OSEA, can supply, not only through Technobit, but also other sister companies, such as Twister, Technobit, and satellite communication companies that are members of OSEA. So we have four vectors. One, onboard electronics, computers, power units, distribution, conditioning, remote terminal units. And that's the first block. The second block is everything related to the emission system, pointing and follow up through laser techniques, sensors, optronics, and intelligence vision, including the full section of optic, mechanics, electronics, and algorithms. And through algorithms, we can be more aware of 
the situation in Spain. Satellite communications, broadband or narrowband, such as KUX, both fixed, deployable and on the move. A key point is cybersecurity. It's not only about the ciphering, but also about the keys. Not only generating the key, but also the distribution and the load. And if we have a cipher, it's uh, duly certified. We also have the Q, K, T for quantum keys. And the cipher has to be multi-domain, multi-protocol, scalable, and modular. I don't want to take more of your time. We could talk about operations, and I don't know if we have time for questions. But there are some key words that, in my opinion, are dual use, global use, multinational, but keeping national sovereignty and autonomy, because the world is changing constantly. And we say yes to Europe, to NATO, but we need to keep a certain level of autonomy so that we don't depend or have semiconductors. I would like to talk about innovation. We are talking about miniaturization or integrated circuits in specific applications, access. The quantum keys I mentioned, these fraction satellite networks. Does this was like electronic warfare in the past? They said counter countermeasures, then counter countermeasures, because when we invent one thing, the other invents another thing. So to summarize all that, we have electronic protection measures. So if the bad ones bring an innovation, we bring a better thing against that. Thank you, Felix. You were so fast, so you managed to squeeze in so many things, which helps the chairman to meet with the timing. Javier Romero is the director of strategy at Navantia, member of the board, doctor in naval engineering from Madrid, expert in national defense. This person has been, is Navantia from the very beginning when he was, when Navantia wasn't even Navantia. So he's had a long career in house in many positions, strategic planning, and since June 2017, director of strategy, a member of the corporate board. So he knows really well this domain. So you forgot to mention that I support Athletic Football Club. Well, that's hard for me because I support Real Madrid, which says a lot. After all this morning talking about the space, I'm going to tell my boss that we should be called Navantia Space. But Admiral said that the best frigate was the one we make, so we're very happy. For technology, we have two conditions. One, the long-term vision that the Army had, the Navy had, sorry, with the industry. So Navantia was created many years ago when we both designed from the English and Americans. We developed them. We've just signed a contract of 1,600,000 £1, pounds. That's 1,800 million euros to do logistics vessels for the British Navy. So that's our job. So the long-term vision that uh, was implemented then, it's a virtuous circle with innovation, engineering, construction, support to life cycle. 
we talked about the life cycle of 30 years, it was a minor space. And the army vessels, the ACV office was created. And we're going to do a technological update on a yearly basis. And the ecosystem around Avantia is absolutely paramount. This ends up with exporting. The investment of the F-100 frigates meant employment in Spain, but we've also exported them to Australia and Norway with a 2,000 million euro return for Spain. So that's a full cycle which we need to plan in advance. It doesn't happen overnight. Another key issue is knowledge. And it was mentioned this morning talent and the difficulty in recruiting and maintaining talent. Apart from working in cool projects, because a submarine is a spaceship ship at minus 300 bars on the water, and FCAS or any other project are really interesting for young people. But we need to find them. So along that lines, I'm talking to talk about Navantia with the Excellence Center, with an investment of between 35 and 40 million euros, which we need to promote and we need to recruit young people. Thank you very much, Javier. Admiral, we have five minutes and I'm going to ask a question that we haven't agreed on. Beforehand, it's very brief and it has a quick answer. If we think about Spain and we need about technology as a game changer, where are we? Are we okay? Gradually improving? Not so well, we need to improve. So very quickly, what's the diagnostic of Spain nowadays in technology? Space technology, I'm a newcomer, so I've arrived, I've visited, I've been visited. I've been explained what companies do. I've seen the results in the working groups and now a level in those working groups. I must say that I give a very high mark to Spain. Thank you. Admiral, he needs to go and he has a train to catch. So what's the mark that you give to Spain? Performance. As the Admiral said, I'll talk about what I know. Catec is a private technology center specifically focusing in unmanned vehicles and systems. We are European leaders in intelligence for unmanned vehicles. What you said earlier, we will give you our CVs, our long CVs, but you've said only a few things. And uh, you said that we are the most innovative innovation in Europe, and we normally, And talking about the technology, we in Spain we are very well positioned and all the organizations that participated this morning, including two of the organizations here participating in FCAS, I think it's easy to see that in technological domains, which is an indicator of our technology is in unmanned teams, in man and man teams, swarming, distributed intelligence, situational awareness sensorial awareness. In Spain, we have, we are a benchmark. In swarming, we are leaders. What mark do you give us? Spanish defense industry has considerably the high level. I'm not going to go to talk about vessels because Navantia's director is here. Enable radar system for long overhaul? Not. 
We need to improve a lot. Long haul missiles and weapons. We make components, but we don't have an industry on that. I'm not going to say anything else about vessels because it's uh, Navantes level is really good. They are the best defense company competing in the world, and their foreign sales say so. In the space world, we are 45% capacity of doing advanced satellites, 42, 45%. So with the new generation of satellites, we could reach 47. We'll be our leaders in certain fields. We, need, we don't need to inspire to do everything because we can't. It's not profitable. So we need to go for things where we are leaders. We are leaders in radar antennas. The radar of Path 1 was manufactured in Spain. Path 2, we might. And the antennas for 1 and 2 are the most advanced ones in Europe, and they are made in Spain. So we can make 47% of a satellite, and we are leaders in uh, antennas. Great news. We are getting great news. Felix, I'm optimistic for the future. Regarding this current situation, let's be a bit realistic. We have great engineers. We have a lot of talent, fantastic professionals. Many of them are actually emigrating abroad. The human factor, I have no doubt. And I, did and I feel profoundly Spanish, so I'm very proud of my country fellow men. Let's look at the investments. We are very good, but we're not Superman or Superwoman. Everything is based on investment, so I'm very optimistic with, with the Secretary of State for Defense regarding the fact that there will be an increase of 24% that will be increasing. So up to now, the investment was in relative terms. And of course, there will be certain things which we are very good at with the state of the art technology. But if we see the global picture, we've talked about swarming and man and man teaming. In Germany, Germany is investing way more money and has been for longer in manned and manned teaming. And we are very good, but you need resources to do that. At the end of the day, yes, I am optimistic about the future, but I am very aware of our baseline because we need to fix it. Javier, they've said everything. They've sold a boat and a 100. I want to talk about F-110 and submarine 80 with the digital twin as the first um, default equipment. And uh, the F-80 will also be very good for our national industry. I would also like to say that if I see the glass half empty, the top 100 of world levels uh, only have two Spanish ones in Dranas in the top 100 regarding turnover. So we need to improve and keep on working to improve our defense industry. I want to thank you all. We finished on time. We were given until 6.20. It's, six, uh, it's 18 minutes past 6. Thank you very much for being part of this round table. Bueno, sé que vamos contra reloj. We are going against the clock with the last block of the afternoon. Very intense day. So we're going to make a couple of changes in the stage.
estamos, pues les pedimos un poco de silencio para este último bloque que, en el que... So we're going to talk about innovation, research and technological investment, something that have been present in our discussions today. And to do that, we want to ask que calca idea Manuel Ausaberri to come up on stage. Lilian, bueno, eh, yo doy paso a, uh, que... So I give the floor to Keke Alcaide, Director of Marketing, Communication and Institutional Relations, and she will be chairing this session. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. I want to welcome participants who follow us in person and those of you who are following us in streaming to this conference on Space and Defense Industry Sevilla Summit. We are going to talk about innovation, research, and investment in technology, and we will do that through two main axes, science and research and technology sustainability and digitalization as main drivers of the future industry. Due to agenda issues, we have just made a couple of changes, but we are actually used to. So we have two of the speakers need to leave, and I'm going to do a very short presentation of who they are. To my left, Lillian. She started her professional career at Morgan Stanley in Mexico with industrial companies in Latin America. Then she moved to London, where she joins the European team covering companies in the electricity and energy. Then she joined Amber Capital, where she is an investment analyst in public European values. She has a degree in finance from the Mexican Univer American University and Master in Finance is from the London Business School. Then we have Manuel Osaberri. Good afternoon. Manuel is a civil engineer, director of strategy innovation and president's office in Indra, in charge of strengthening technology leadership in those fields. He's in charge of designing and implementing the new model of open in innovation and head of in president's office. Since January 2020, he is also in charge of sustainability in Indra and drafted the master plan in June 2020. I'm going very fast, but it's just we don't have much time. So I'm going to ask them both a couple of questions so that they can shed some light. Manuel, regarding new technologies, Maybe this is a bit out of context because we have split the table, but my question is, to the current increasing a lack of security in the geostrategic arena, do you think that we need to be more positioned at the European level? Thank you very much for having invited us. Indra is a great Spanish technological company present in many countries, technology is part of our DNA. So the answer is that yes, of course it is, very important. But we are actually deeply convinced. We are at a decisive and strategic crossroad. There are certain strategic geodynamics that from the past inferred our decisions to take our geostrategic position more seriously and to take on more responsibilities in our own internal defense and external defense, actually. And we have also been great steps being taken in Europe and along that line. One is the European collaborative programs that we have discussed today, such as FCAS. But due to the Ukrainian events, I think we have all realized that 
defense and security are a prerequisite for everything else. Behind that investment, Indra uh, is part of this national industry, an innovative industry that can be given an answer to these needs at the European and Spanish level. For Indra and for Spain to play a protagonist role, that needs to be done through innovation, technology, and high added value. Because as you all know, in this market, in Europe, we are competing against true giants. Our competitors are 10 times bigger than us, and we are rather big in Spain, so. And there is a thought here on how we need to evolve as an industry to be able to invest in R&D to compete and be sitting at the table of the big European giants and to defend our industry, our jobs, and the workload with high added value, which will mean that in the long and medium term, we will continue keeping an industry, which is an exporting successful industry with high added value, such as defense industry. After what Manuel said, there are good forecasts in Spain on investment in defense, but we still need a greater impetus. And what is what we need to achieve that growth? Yes, no doubt, there are significant opportunities for the European defense industry we see that in Spain, with this commitment of reaching uh, the 2019. So this is opening a pathway to promote the industry. But we need a national leader that will channel these efforts. And we've seen clear examples of Dassault in Spain or Leonardo in Italy, BA systems in the UK, which have give an impetus to the industry and open pathway for the other players. So we need a national champion. In our opinion, Indra can play a good role in the effort so that it um, opens up a pathway for the rest of the industry. So we don't want to divide forces. And we want Spain to have a pool that pulls in the same direction as it has happened in other countries in our industry. Manuel, what are the strengths we have to take that leap? As I said earlier, there are some basic foundations that help us identify the opportunity. So the Spanish defense industry is at a good situation to find the opportunities. But as Lydia said, we have some weaknesses. What are the strengths? In certain niches, we are state of the art. And um, we have technologies that are super specific. And uh, we are really the best ones, but we also have some gaps. And one, another one is the scale of our companies. Our national industry certainly is more fragmented than it should be to face up these future challenges because a big program such as FCAS can only be managed by big conglomerates, big giants that can then agglutinate other companies and another more comprehensive and uh, fabric, business fabric. Let's not fool ourselves. Spain is an average capacity country. We listen to the Secretary of State and this morning, and we are feeling rather optimistic, and we are, should have a very positive attitude because all the signs point at the fact that we are taking up momentum, gaining momentum. And other European countries are spending way more in defense. 
our competitors have national markets that are their clients that are investing more, such as France, Germany, and the UK. So pending subjects, many. A certain shy evolution with some sort of arrangement to acquire better R&D investment capacity scale um, and power to be better um, partners and with better technical capabilities in our portfolio. That's the logical sense that our industry should move into. And there begins to be a certain degree of consensus and majority uh, agreement on that being the pathway to go. So within that niche that we are at, uh, sort of like average size company in Spain, talk to me about strengths and uh, weaknesses that hinder our quantitative leap. In defense, right, because in other industries we are leaders, yeah. The industry is heavily fragmented. Capacities exist in Spain to have this fabric that can have a stronger industry. The effort is fragmented, and a company needs to compile this capacity and support the industry so that Spain sits at the debate table with someone that can absorb this load. That is not only the national demand, but also international demand. As I said, Indra is at a very good position to play that profile based on the experience that we have both nationally and internationally. But we need to fine tune that approach because today we are divided into two businesses. One is information technology and the other one is transport and defense, which are, in our opinion, are not in synergy. So efforts such as Thales and Safra to define the perimeter and fine tune the focus to become leaders in the business and the field of defense. I know that you don't have a lot of time <laughs> left. Something that you would like to add? Yes. I think it's important to um, understand the defense industry and we see the wonderful companies that make it up, Ispasat Navantia. There are sadly two um, big companies among the top 100, Navantia, AGMOB, wonderful companies, as I said, exporters that compete internationally, Indra. But when I see our industrial fabric, I see that it's a burgeoning one. It's, it's very competent and with great capabilities of being successful outside of Spain. It's an industry that if we support it, it's going to give us returns um, and it's going to give back a lot because we are um, an industry that create added value um, industry. We provide work for engineers, men and women. We export around the world. And I'm not talking about birds and bees. I'm talking about um, companies that um, compete in international bids. And really, this could be part of our industrial policy because we probably will all agree that um, the defense industry, in comparison to other economic industries based more on services, having a higher industrial workload is very good. And this is one of the Spanish industries that have survived, that continue to grow, and that export. So if we help it and we um, um, target, sort of push it forth, we will see many returns. I see very positive um, indications, and I think we have more support from the society and authorities. And I think we have ahead of us a very extremely exciting cycle. I hope that that will be the case. I don't know if you would like to add anything else, Lillian. I take up what you said um, the f with regards to earning the trust of um, the societies and the government. We, you need to earn the trust of the markets, the investment bodies, 
trust in the defense market. We have seen how investment um, has changed um, and this environment has changed drastically because um, we see it in the portfolio of investment of people that didn't invest or companies that didn't invest in defense previously. Thus, we need focus. We need to delimit the parameters so that we can see capitalization and um, really um, value the abilities and capabilities that already exist in the industry. Thank you very much. You're both very much in sync. It has been wonderful to have you here. I'm sorry that you um, have to leave. Thank you very much for being here with us today, and we hope that you will join us for the next summit. And um, thank you very much. We shall continue with the next part of the panel in a few seconds. Thank you. Efectivamente, muchas gracias a los tres. Thank you very much to the three of you. Kika, please don't go too far because you're going to uh, chair the panel in a second. The last intervention of the um, of our conference today, I would like to ask Miguel Ángel García Primo, president of He's the Sats, to join us. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organization for inviting me to talk to you, and thank you all. And I speak to you um, in friendship, really, because we are the last few here in the room. I'm going to talk about um, innovation, investment, and technology. And as you all know, this should have been what we talk about first. Because we start with um, research and development and innovation, with that we get to technology, and with technology we manage to um, create industrial development. It would have been good to um, have started earlier on this topic, yet I want to talk to you about the following. I have prepared the following presentation to illustrate what I want to talk to you about. I'm going to tell you very briefly about our company, and mostly I'm going to focus on research and innovation regarding our new our new generation satellite Spencer. And I'm going to give you the um, examples regarding the technologies that we are developing, the innovation that we are using in this satellite. As we said, this satellite has um, 45 percent participation of in our program of um, industry Spanish industries but in what do the Spanish industries participate well frankly in the most um, innovative sections of the satellite the useful charges and the antennas which provide um, it with the with the resilience and capabilities that the armed forces require very briefly, we are a company that um, began in 2001. We started providing um, secure communications to the Ministry of Defense. We are an instrument that allows um, them to communicate securely via satellite. And we did it through a PPP. The Ministry of Defense had their requirements, and we basically complied with the technical and industrial side of the program. We finished the products, and we launched it in order to be able to um, give these capabilities to the Defense Department. We also agreed to commercialize part of them um, abroad so that we um, could make use of the investments that the government was going to make. In 2000, 2006, we launched the two satellites, Extar Euro and Spain Sat. And in 2018, we launched the Bath satellite, um, which really allowed us to have an observational intelligence um, observation of the Earth, a PPP scheme, 
and it's providing services from 2018 as well as the 2005 and 2006 one. And in 2019, we began with the SpainSat new generation, which is going to replace the satellites that we currently have. Following the same um, PPP model, so that the Ministry of Defense receives the secure satellite communications and we can send the substantial um, results to um, third parties, parties internationally. We would like to sell to NATO the Th CP130 um, capacity package and also to the European Union. We are a satellite operator and um, government service provider. Our mission basically is to provide governmental satellite services to national and international customers and the ministries of defense. And our mandate um, received from the government is to basically be a company that um, brings forth as well um, the rest of the industry. And that is one of our main elements, which um, our shareholders, 30% um, the Ministry of Defense, our sister company um, for, with 43% of our shares, Ispasat, and then we have Airbus, Indra, and Zenit within our shareholders too. We are quite a singular operator in that we have we work in several spatial application operations and we work with um, land observation and also with the AIS systems constellation of monitoring of the maritime traffic. We have a panoply of um, things that we do, but mainly secure communications <laughs> via satellite, the Expense and Star Euro satellites, the uh, future constellation of Spensa and um, of Spainsat NG1 and 2 that we will launch in 2024 to 25, which we will also um, launch with a Falcon 9 and really we think it's wonderful to have been able to secure a launching slot in this last few years because currently we don't have um, no big satellite launches um, and they are currently being developed. So this is a weakness currently. It's a world weakness, not only a European one. We're doing well. We're um, covering deadlines with regards to land observation. We have satellite bath and we are also working on bath two. We are also um, working as operators in the civil um, vigilance spatial systems. And we offer monitoring services um, with our constellation of satellites regarding maritime um, flows. You know um, that these are our satellites. We have Spain Sat, which is 30 degrees west. We have two global beams, two, five others, and they are the capabilities that our armed forces um, have. Extar Eur is 23 degrees east, and we have two global beams, four steerable, etc. We also provide services based in hubs and different teleport stations. And one of the services that make us the proudest is the SAPZO project which is a uh, more welfare and recreation service. Any soldier or Marine um, that is Spanish, be where they may be in any deployment around the world, in any vessel, in any airplane, has um, a set of applications and connectivity similar to um, the ones that they would have if they were in their offices in the Ministry of Defense. 
And I think that this is very, very important for our soldiers and Marines. With regards to our customers, we have customers within our allies. We have national customers, Ministry of Defense. We have clients in the United States, our second best clients, the Department of Defense, Department of State, and certain intelligence agencies. And we also offer services to the Ministry of Defense of Portugal, Greece, Norway, Denmark. Mm, with regards to the European Union, um, we also collaborate with them. But I want to focus on the Spain SATS um, next generation. Two big satellites that have three useful loads in um, band X. X-band, military K-band, and new HF. Um, in X-band, we have several characteristics. The RA, the electric resonator antenna. We have a reception one and transmission one, and it's the first time that we have a transmission um, antenna in Europe, and we are manufacturing it in Spain, and Airbus is carrying it out in Spain, and I think this is the most important technological leap in R&D within our program. We have a frequency reuse capability thanks to this antenna. We also are able to provide the fire power flexibility, sorry. We have interference um, geolocation. Um, the um, antenna has been hopping and anti-German capability, capability. So um, we can do virtual beams and we can multiply our capacities. And we, of course, we have um, K and UHF um, beams. These um, RA antenna are the most innovative and most advanced um, technology in Europe. The transmission antenna is, is the only one in Europe and is also very important to highlight the collaboration that we have carried out f from the Ministry of Defense being the anchor client and describer of the necessities, the Ministry of Industry with financing, the Ministry of Science that allows with certain funds for the most innovative, um, innovational um, elements, and ILESAT, which is pulling the whole industry along with it as the um, tractor company. This is the satellite, um, 43 meters long, the farthest antenna are the UHF um, more than 10 meters long. So really, um, it's 6.1 ton satellites. And very briefly, I want to show you the different elements and where they have been manufactured so that you can see how broadly we have spanned territory-wise. The panels of K-Band have been manufactured in Madrid, the antennas in Bilbao, in Sener, the RA antennas are being manufactured in Airbus Madrid. The technical control of um, these antennas in Torrejón. The radiant chains in Sened in Aranda. The amplification modules, the SSPI and DLA, are being manufactured in um, Barcelona through Sened, and this is based on new technology, Nutrivegalia, and which has allowed us to carry out this um, industrial development. Indra does the MCCM microchip modules, and in Valde, Peñas Tecnovit um, creates the RCC band, um, RCC band as a band. Um, electronics is carried out by Crisa Madrid, Antena Navarra, is carry on the test caps. GMV creates the software, and HV system creates the exit. TTI in North in Cantabria does the SS SFPA for UHF. Senet for the um, makes the UHF. 
It does manufactures the UF HF Emux, the processor and the transponder, and Alta here in Seville crew deals with the um, component technology. This is what I wanted to say to you as a conclusion. I wanted to add that the PPP between the Spanish MOD and Hidesat is working very well. Since we started collaborating 21 years ago, this allows us to have strategic sovereignty, which at the same time allows us to have technological sovereignty through our technologies. And this, in the end, really makes us more competitive the whole of the Spanish industry. It also allows for international cooperation and collaboration. Our systems are all dual programs. And from 2020 to 2040, we are going to invest hopefully um, 4 billion euros in communications and in land investments. We started with our participation in 2001. We only had 15% of our participation in XSTAR 21, in PAS 40, in Spain SAT 45. And we hope that with PAS 2, we will be able to um, obtain Spanish collaboration in 60%. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon again. We are going to continue with our round table that we um, initially had. I'm going to present the four panelists. I, first of all, we have Francisco Velasco, the director or dean of the School of Industrial Organization in Andalucía. And from 2003, he has um, participated in projects regarding industry and technology, the Space NBA programs um, aimed at directors of SMEs, the seed um, programs of 4.0 for youth and um, other programs. He has helped with the space strategy for Andalucía, and he has um, helped in transforma digital transformation programs and many other things. Good afternoon, Francisco. Then we have Jesus. Sanchez, Lieutenant Colonel, Head of the Optol Electronics and Missiles Department, National Institute for Aerospace Technology. He's Lieutenant Colonel of Engineers of the Air and Space. And as I said, he leads the Optol Electronics and Missiles Department, and he is author of several patents and dis responsible for um, defense projects and development projects. Then we have Sorry, the order has been changed and it's difficult. We have Jose Javier Martinez Herraiz, um, degree in um, electronic, sorry, um, computers. Um, he works um, in the science of computer, computational sciences at the University of Alcala. And from 1988 to 99, he worked in telecommunication com unit, companies in different European uh, countries. He has um, worked um, teaching in cybersecurity um, courses, and he collaborates with the Guardia Civil, National Police, and Civil Protection. Good afternoon, sir. He is the 
Delegate for Electronic Administration and Security and the Dean of the University of Alcala. Good afternoon. And finally, Felipe, you're very far. Doctor, I'm in the University of Seville. Previously, he was chief of um, a laboratory in Inta, and he was director of the um, processor of um, fuel for S80 for Navantia. And he um, works in the University of Seville. Having said this, we are going to dive right into the um, issue that we want to talk about, a commitment to innovation research and technological investment. With regards to the situation that we're going through, uh, the conflicts, the war um, conflicts, we really have to pay attention to new technologies to face these threats. Good afternoon. Yes, I would really like to highlight the fact that throughout today, the situation in Ukraine has been amply talked about, yet we haven't talked about the ability that um, armament has. What we are seeing in action are um, cheap versions of armament, all of its um, automatic um, guided ammunition, suicidal, suicide drones, everything that we are witnessing, we should be very worried about regarding protection systems, guided bombs, missiles. And I wonder, in the midst of all of this, in Spain, we have good technological level, yet we haven't managed to adapt that technology, and I don't know why, so that we can have missile technologies and armament technologies, propulsion and rocket technologies, technologies that are shared with the space technology and propulsion and guide, guiding and so on. So really, I think there's a long road ahead of us in this sense. And add capabilities that um, are required so that we may travel this road. In Spain, we don't have hyperspeed technology, neither in navigation nor in aerodynamics nor in materials. And all of those um, capabilities are absolutely indispensable. So I understand as well, Jesus, that in order to adapt to all of this, we need to transfer this to people. What are businesses, Francisco, going to expect from the talent and from the labor force? In order to reply to that question, I'm going to um, refer to two um, studies and also to AOE, our industrial school. An alliance for the strategic competencies directed to emergent technologies and defense. It's a project launched by the European Commission that is trying to create an ecosystem for the defense um, industry and other stakeholders that it focuses in cybersecurity, robotics, and AI and um, CFRI. Within this um, alliance, we have Andalusia Aerospace, the Andalusian cluster, the University of Seville, the University of Cadiz, other universities within Spain and Europe, and as well, big companies like uh, Safran, Rolls-Royce, and Airbus. Within this study, they identify four competencies or professional um, uh, spheres, um, aerospace, drones, um, another focusing on cybersecurity and everything related to firewalls and encryption, cyber physical systems. Another 
um, study area regarding data scientists, voice recognition, natural language, artificial vision, machine learning, and one final um, one link to database designer, quantum computation, neural networks, etc. The other study that I would like to mention, one that was targeting the Spanish industry in general, not focusing on defense, and it stated the 12 professional profiles that would be more demanded, and nine of them included data in its name, vis data visualization, data engineer, etc. Internet of Things, of course, um, 4.0 industry. And they also included that in the next um, four years, we're going to need more than 90,000 professionals in this realm. Finally, based on our experience, we mustn't forget that we're talking about people. We're talking about research and development and the investment in the human capital is essential. People that develop their working life in companies, so um, it's also important to foster soft skills, leadership, teamwork, communication, um, conflict management and management. They work within businesses that have their own strategy, that have their balance sheets, they have you know, their financial issues. So all of this is very important. <coughs> also, it's very important to highlight the relationship between um, the company and university. And I want to talk to you, Jose Javier, because I'd like to understand the weight that the relationship between a company and a university can have in this um, university relationship. Yeah. yeah, but since I have to my left a university professor and I'm only a lecturer, I want to explain to you the difference. What a chair is, a chair of research, because they don't understand that I am the director of a chair, but I am not a professor myself. Sometimes I'm introduced as a professor, but I am not. Currently, the university is organized around faculties, schools, departments with their areas of knowledge. And then there are research groups which can have teachers from different departments. So those are the chairs. It's a chair of research. And they are especially important because a company finds an agreement with a research group to research on the same lines and something that is important for the company. So they sign agreements uh, for three years for an amount of money which would depend on the university, but they can sign Article 83, they can go together to public tenders uh, jointly between the university and the companies. But the case of research groups, they allow you to have a time horizon of three or four years. They can be renewed and research on something which is interesting for both. I am the director of a chair of cybersecurity with DEF. But in the University of uh, de Alcalá, we have Indra chairs, Escribano chairs. It, I would like to know if they are important. The, last week, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation, the minister together with the Minister of Universities, presented an initiative through INCIBE and through the Secretary of State for Digitalization and Artificial Intelligence to finance 34 chairs on cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, which were two of the topics that you were talking about earlier 
for 50 million euros. So in four years' time, there will be a tender, a call for proposals. So a, a company together with a university need to apply for funding to research on artificial intelligence applied to law, health uh, sciences, so different, different fields. And I think this is important. I mean, this, these subsidies, the total of 50 million, because up to now, it used to be companies that would finance a chair between 30 to 60,000 euros a year for three years, which is a big effort, right? A big investment. So this initiative, which was presented last week with the Secretary General of INCIBE presented at red.es, and it is important because it allows for a certain degree of stability at the research base. So I would like to ask Felipe if research and companies work hand in hand, how can a company access this chair? Thank you very much. Firstly, it's a pleasure to be here. So I want to thank the organizers for having invited to the University of Seville. This, only, this is not only happening at the University of Seville. 80% is applicable to any private or public university in Spain. And there are some peculiarities whether the university has a foundation or not to manage the funds. But in general terms, there are th three pathways for collaboration based on the temporal time scale. So there are certain projects and initiatives that can run in the long term where it's based on public calls for proposals. These calls for proposals can act at different levels. Generation of knowledge within the national scope as research projects. And there is one theme which is industry, space, and defense. So there is a good action uh, field margin for maneuver. So it's really important that this type of projects can help to do PhD thesis that is considered to be as an industrial PhD thesis, which turns the research into a new, with a new strategic level. The third level is a strategic projects. In that sense, we have all the programs for next generation for the European Union. There are some PPPs in the national program for transfer of knowledge and lastly, proof of concept, where the company has a, an industrial need to materialize to something, and the university can apply for it. Regarding medium-term actions, they are mainly under contract 6883. This means that university professors are subject to this in compatibility law, they cannot work for companies in certain fields, such as applied research of various types, such as experimental R&D, professional work to introduce new technologies, consulting and advisory, and repetitive technical services. The last part really depends on the university itself, and that would be short-term projects, which are normally done by accessing the central research services, which are embedded in each university, and each university can offer their own services. 
So we, we've just focused on universities and companies, but there is a big part which is training. So people who are receiving training. So let me go back to you. In an SME-based industry, where should training go? As it was said earlier, Spanish industry is very fragmented. More than 95% are SMEs. And then I will talk about how we can work. Because Amber Capital's power asked for a leader that could agglutinate the capabilities. But it doesn't exist. We have what we have. We studied the, the region of Andalusia together with our cluster and the companies of this industry, Andalusia Aerospace. So it is easily, ex can be extrapolated to the rest of Spain. So there was one strategic line on training for this industry. And I want to talk about the objectives I have because it, ex it is explained here. They want to strengthen the competitiveness of these companies, of the industrial fabric, through digitalization towards 4.0 and advanced technology for manufacturing processes, to strengthen technologies and diversify to others by in increasing R&D investment, to have more added value products, internationalization of markets, improvement of employment quality, participation of Andalusian companies in space and defense programs, participation in MRO training, RPAS, new space, space applications. So the training we ended up having was on industry for Perisire, and then like a big mix, which is which was for training. Industry 4.0 strategy, value, business, and it was geared towards the SMEs formulating their digital transformation plan. As for the leadership lines, implementation of a model nationally of dual FP vocational training with also university master's degrees and in Andalusia only we're only five percent of the space business in Spain and this is not comparable to the weight we have in the other industries business management There was a program that we developed on in, at AOI, Aerospace MBA, that brings together a specialization in the space industry and business management. English language training, if we need to go for the internationalization. SME, international management. That's a challenge. We need to find new clients, and we need to do it internationally. Business and university interconnection, and I will not talk about that because other speakers have mentioned that. I talked about the size, and in that sense, the role of clusters is very important to amalgamate technology centers. We had Alcatec, the Advanced Technology Center, as an agglutinating force of all companies so that they can act together and have greater capacities, which is a lot, actually. But there is something which is rather important, uh, which I, we mentioned at the backstage, and which I would like to mention to Jose Javier, and that is we need to invest in the empowerment of talent and retention of talent. Absolutely, because this is something that is paramount 
And precisely, we've been talking about it all morning with the companies. Everybody talks about how difficult it is to find qualified people. And we are talking about it not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. And I want to give you an example from my field of expertise. In cybersecurity, there are universities that cannot implement a degree on cybersecurity or postgraduate degree on cybersecurity because they don't have teachers. In 2022, November, there is a report from Infibe on the analysis and diagnosis of the cybersecurity talent in Spain saying that in 2021, the labor force had 151,000 people. There was a gap of, gap of 25 people. So we need 25 people, 25,000 people working in cybersecurity. This morning, General Ballesteros was here and he reminded us in 2016, he was the leader of the Spanish Institute for Strategic Studies and we did a report on PPP and there was a specific section on this, which I wrote. In 2017, it was published. So we analyzed five, the five-year data, and we were doing rather badly. But we did a global analysis, because it was not only a Spanish problem. Five years later, we're even worse, because the needs are higher. Um, especially to certain degrees, and we have fewer students and there will be less because we look at the figures of, in, of high school, of people who are studying and who will reach university. This morning somebody talked about STEM studies, and how there is a clear lack of students doing this, especially women. There are fewer and fewer and it is very important. And as we were saying earlier in the backstage, in my chair I had a researcher, and this guy has been hired by a Finnish company, and he hasn't gone to Finland. He's working in Alcala five days a week with a Finnish salary. So we are now competing in a global world. So it is very important that at the National Cybersecurity Forum, there is a specific group on training, empowerment, and talent. And it's not finding talent. It's actually being able to retain it in the organization, which is really difficult. Companies see that the way new generations work even after COVID-19, I mean, they have a different reasoning. And the first question a potential employee asks you is how many remote work days they will get. And if it's less than three, they would actually consider it. But in any case, I'm influenced by my specific expertise, which is cybersecurity. But I think it happens as it happens in other fields such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, everything that has to do to data science and data engineering, there is a clear need of people. And the solution is difficult because Spanish companies pay the salaries they pay. In Madrid, we see people who move out to a village to remote work to Madrid companies with Madrid salaries, but I don't see a solution in the medium term. In general, there are companies such as Escribano, they, they, they said to us, send us people, where do I get them from? The same thing with Indra or Avengo, I talked to them. They all need new people and they need to retain them. And that's, I think, the main problem because I've even heard in other fora, and I mean, money is important and um, 
companies are now complaining more. The, the worst thing for them is human resources, it's just finding people. Okay, well, this is a great conclusion. Uh, it's uh, very important to make progress in, in parallel so that we can meet all needs. So stepping out of university and training and going more into artificial intelligence, which has already been mentioned by Jose Javier, I would like to ask Jesus, who process optimization, do you consider that artificial intelligence is being applied properly? Well, we are beginning, but some of us are afraid that money is invested, but not properly, meaning that it is too fragmented and there is no critical mass of one artificial intelligence center for defense or a better structure because we don't always achieve what we want by investing a lot of money. Sometimes investing is easy and the figures, you put them in a presentation and it may look like it's working, but sometimes it doesn't work as it should. And it's more knowledge management, people management teams. A technologically advanced team is, is not trained in one year, in, in many years. So it's a long haul journey. It's a marathon and we're not winning that race. We are going at one speed and the others are going at a greater speed. So we are long, farther and farther away from the winning group. And that's the perception I have. Our adaptation speed in the race means that we are farther and farther from the winners. Felipe, you're at the back. And in a way, answering to Jesus's uh, demand, maybe the university should be that channel for dissemination that can consolidate the idea of the need for the training on innovation, research. Can the university be that channel against what it may look like? The university's vision is not only as a knowledge generator. It has other missions, which are even more important, and that is the transmission of knowledge. At the university, we train students, but we also generate knowledge, and our obligation is to return back to society what society is giving us on a daily basis. And the only way for us to return it is to give societies back this type of knowledge. And this type of knowledge can be returned in many different ways, and they're all complementary. The first part is the action of the various research groups, which lead to patent registration. It can be done in an isolated manner or together with companies. What can we do with these patents? Well, they should be exploited commercially together with companies or training knowledge-based companies whose main aim is to use this knowledge. If this knowledge-based company ends up actually working, then we have spin-offs coming from universities. In, at the University of Seville, we have very good data from many companies, and I think all, uni all com universities have very interesting data on spin-offs that have become big companies uh, based on this idea. As it was mentioned earlier, the creation of business chair or chairs of businesses is a method of um, conveying knowledge that is not regulated in the in all the universities. Some universities have a, have it, others don't. In Seville, we have 50 chairs of this kind, of these five areas of knowledge, with very different companies, such as a chair for Telefonica, a telco, specialized in artificial intelligence, Airbus chair, so I could list you up to 50 chairs on this. Then there is a last area, which is 
specific entrepreneurship spaces, including co-working spaces. These spaces are an area where certain synergies uh, between EBCs and companies can be created to achieve eloquent results. Please allow me to add a final piece of information regarding the University of Seville. It's the second most important university in Spain, <clears throat> with 70,000 students, with more than 500 research groups. We are the first national university regarding international patent registration and the second internationally. We hope that uh, there can be a good pool of uh, students that can help us uh, find uh, people for a very favorable future. Do you have any information for the closing? Final conclusion, is there anything else you want to say? Any final words? I want to say one word, which is sustainability. I could not attend the previous sessions, but I guess they talked about it. So I wanted to talk about sustainability as a focus of interest for the future. From the authorities, we can help the industry, not only by giving funds, but by managing the situation better and uh, doing processing better, administration better, and uh, permitting and speeding up. And that can be even more useful sometimes than the actual funds. I wanted to share a thought with you which goes beyond space and defense. And I want to talk about the use of technology. Due to COVID-19, which has invaded many fields of knowledge, people talked about the future, but it's not the future, it's the present, and in many cases, the past. So this is a clear imperative. And we will need to learn how to live with it and to make it work in all fields, defense, space, and always guarantee the security of our interactions with technology. My final thought might not be very welcome, but I want to put myself in the shoes of the graduates of the University of Seville who go to the labor market and they are offered salaries. I'm not going to say they're a higher low, but um, I ask the executives of your companies to think about it. But many university graduates are forced to emigrate because of the salaries they are offered. And for some reasons are that the salary and the labor conditions are not appropriate for what they deserve after doing master's degrees that can take them up to seven or eight years. So after eight years doing a degree of this type, the receiving a job offer of 2,000, 1,200, up to 1,500, I leave it up to you to make that judgment. So we finish here this round table. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. And now, thank you very much for being here. And we'll give the floor to the next uh, session. Pues muchas gracias, Keka, Keka Alcaide, y a los ponentes de esta última. I want to thank the speakers of this uh, round table. So having reached this point, it's 7.30, which is the time we were supposed to finish the program. So I'm going to ask all of you to give us 15 more minutes to two more speeches for two reasons. Number one, because we have learned that the resistance is winning. And secondly, it's because these two speeches will be worth it, your attention. 
so it will take 15 minutes to listen to them. The first one is the Director General of TEDAE, Spanish Association of Technologies for Defense, Security, Aeronautics, and Space, Cesar Ramos, and he has the floor. Good afternoon, all, and thank you very much to the organizers and um, sponsors for allowing TEDAE um, as a leading organization for the industry of defense. If we look back to the origin of space activities in Spain, we see that Spain um, piggybacked on the space effort um, of Europe since the beginning. Yet the road to here has not been easy. We have gone through financial difficulties. And at the beginning, um, we've gone through very um, important technological challenges. However, we have been able to find um, hope in the investments. So we um, joined the European Space Agency because we didn't want to be um, left behind and because we wanted to be part of Europe. And on the other hand, because Europe could not give way um, in the space race um, to United States and um, Russia. And that's why we all had to come together in the West. And for these reasons, the um, profitability of space cannot be measured regarding financial indicators. Um, because they allow us to understand the success factors within our state. Having space capability means for a country having a key tool for their future, because not only is it a great economic growth vector, but also a very important political tool that allows them to um, achieve a significant um, strategic advantage in the case of conflict, something that Europeans saw after the first Gulf War in 1991, when we saw a very clear independence um, um, after we um, saw this situation. The um, situation of um, defense in Spain explores the universe and also dynamizes telecommunications, health, um, environment, and security, generating value for the whole economy while improving our daily life and our ability to relate to each other securely through communications, internet banking, GPS, or the meteorological predictions. In the last few years, the um, financial crisis, the conflict in Ukraine, and um, natural catastrophes have brought um, to the international agendas um, health, um, security, climate change, or um, sustainable. So for many of these um, departments, spatial technology contributes to these um, elements of society. Sometimes it may not be evident, but space and defense have gone through a long road of collaboration. Since um, Alfonso de Cimo El Savio compiled um, a catalog of more than 1,000 stars, Spain developed a relevant role in astronomical um, research. The development of the navigation techniques bakes in um, astral calculations allowed us to um, have the dominions of the seas for many um, centuries because we had strategic advantage based on technical and scientific knowledge. In the 18th century, during the reign of Charles III, we created the Royal Observatory of Gadid, um, pushed forth by Jorge Juan, who together with Antonio de Ulloa played a very important role in establishing the measurement of the equator. In the 20th century, Emilio Herrera, <coughs> Um, designed projects for the launch of artificial um, satellites. At the mid-60s, the National Space Program favored scientific development in Spain that led to the launching into orbit of, in 1974, of our Intasaduno first satellite, which allows for 
Spain occupying the fourth um, place in the um, space race in um, Europe. Space in the 21st century is now a, a new or a different sphere and market where the Spanish space industry has a presence in all of the activity sectors, and it is well positioned within the value chain. It is also important to highlight that currently there are more than 50 countries that have their own satellites launched into Spain and that it's space and that space <coughs> economy um, is valued in 350,000 million which means that there are new companies and new service markets um, pushed forth by space technologies. These developments and dependencies have meant um, the, um, several important points for the defense in Spain. From the Ministry of Defense and understanding that having our own space capabilities is an asset for um, sovereignty autonomy and um, freedom, we push forth our own um, model, providing our own um, space service. Developing this model, the collaboration between different organizations, given the dual characteristics of the technologies and the capabilities and services provided. The defense capabilities are uh, based on the participation of Spain within the um, space European Space Agency, which is taking place today and tomorrow in um, Paris, which provide 1.5 billion euros for 2023 to 2027. So all of this uh, means that Spain has relevant capabilities in observation through um, programs like BATH and Expensat NG and makes us leaders in um, surveillance in certain projects or having participation in the um, European Funds for Defense or structural permanent capabilities. From DEDAE, the Spanish Association of Defense, Security, Aeronautics and Space, we understand that we're living in a time where we have to take advantage of the space sector because, as the European um, Commission said, it is critical for our economy, for our citizens, and defense is part of our political agenda to guarantee our societies and freedom. And in Spain, having created an aerospace birthday to consolidate as a financial tool our sector, as well as the Spanish Space Agency, really makes us very thankful to the government for um, hold, taking us hand in hand to the future. However, the future is not yet um, one in such a complex word, world, and we have to continue working to our strength from the point of view of organization. The creation of the Spanish Space Agency will allow for the regrouping of different administrations uh, regarding space and be the, being the agent that will create the long-term space policies. The future role of the Air Force and Space Force will be key to defend the space where confrontation is more than a possibility. From the point of view of the international sphere, the Euro Spanish participation in the um, spatial European, the, the space European Space Agency, sorry, means that within a more competitive market and our collaboration within the European market, it implies we must improve our positioning. So internationally and nationally, we have to have specific action plans within the defense sphere. The, the spatial systems planned five years ago must be reviewed so that we can direct the activities of companies with better aim. The Aerospace Verde that has been approved this year must be a financing mechanism that is stable and realistic that will allow us to strengthen industrial fabric and which is more diversified. Because in the next few years, the industry should be able to manufacture the 
systems, but also to transform them in applications and services at higher speed, at better prices, and for a broader number of users. We face, once again, an opportunity that we must take from the point of view of um, business responsibility, collaborating with the administration with the commitment of society, because space and defense represent a challenge for all of us. It is for this that we must work together to lead industrial sectors that, as a public good, should answer to the needs of the society and strengthen our present, and so that they may constitute and bring together our best future. So thus, we understand that Spain will not invest in Spain and defense because it's a better country, but we will be a better country because we invest in both of these elements. Thank you very much, and good evening. And now, as promised, the last presentation, a little bit shorter. We have also recorded by the president from Real Instituto in Cano, Juan José Ruiz. Good evening. It's a true honor to be here representing Real Instituto in Cano. My apologies, I'm not able to be there in person. But in any case, we have followed uh, your conference online. Amongst other reasons, because during the sessions you have had, you have discussed topics that uh, our institutes follows up very closely. Our researchers, Luis Simón, Daniel Fimo, Felix Arteaga, have written on each and every roundtable uh, and all the topics dealt with there. Please allow me to give you a short summary of what we think about the topics that you have discussed. <clears throat> In the first session, you talked about defense. Defense is one of the priorities that have come up, jumped out to the public opinion in the last few months due to the cruel, illegitimate, and terrible invasion of Ukraine by Russia. We are firmly convinced that being prepared for defense and give security to citizens is very important. And throughout these months, we have undertaken a huge activity in this field. I would like to remind you that our institute was chosen together with the Atlantic Foundation and the German Marshall Fund as the think tanks that organized the conceptual meetings during the recent NATO summit in Madrid. We could present clearly the fact that the defense industry is key for security of our citizens, the defense of our freedoms, and that we are all committed to generate proposals and ideas to move forward. In the second topic, you've talked about the capacities of the defense industry, which is a way of expressing our interest for defense and security in Europe. We believe that the defense capacities must be seen jointly. So defense is a public good that cannot be segmented. And we are committed to push for the European defense, the public good of European defense, and above all, to integrate it in industry. We think that this is a central topic of our research agenda, and we have placed it there amongst the priorities for 2023. With an approach that I would like to underline, it's not a matter of spending more, which is important, but spending better and jointly. As you very well know, Europe spends little in defense and in a not coordinated manner. Only 11% of the $60 million that were invested last year were invested jointly, and I will talk about this later. In the third and the fourth, you've talked about space. And we think that this is another topic that we need to bring to the public opinion. At Real Instituto in Cano, for a long time, we've been very concerned with the need to invest in space 
and to generate a governance of our investments and the development of our aerospace capacities that allow us to be more efficient in our expenditure and that will allow us to return more value to the investment we make. We have huge hope in the possibility of having a space agency that allows us to be standardized in the governance that we see in our partners, and we believe that is the way to go. In the fourth round table, we also believe that you have touched upon a key matter, the impact of PERTE uh, on space, the strategic plan, and um, on the aerospatial in aerospace industry. PERTEs are associated to a key concept for our future, for the well-being of our country, which is the implementation of industrial policies that the defense industry should be part of as another driving forces. The Perte for space is indeed a great opportunity. Allow me to finish this message only with two comments on things that we believe are of key importance at our institute, which we have certainly placed at the top of our research agenda for the forthcoming months. The first one is identifica the identification in our legislation of the bottlenecks that hinder the per joint purchase processes and joint auctions with other countries. This is a geostrategic and geopolitical new advancement, the proof of Europe's will to move towards its defensive and strategic independence. But due to our legal legislations, uh, we can't do it because they're not fine-tuned enough. So we think it's very important to move from the objective we have of promoting those joint investments, those joint purchases, to do it according to a legal regulation, a legal uh, framework that make us responsible uh, in the eyes of society. And we will devote resources to the identification of where the obstacles are, and we will share them with all of you in our publications, our events. And the second topic is the need to be realistic. Investment in innovation, technology in all sectors, we probably in the defense sector, where we need to bring the private industry to collaborate with the public sector that, need, that entails multi-annual investment frameworks that are not sufficiently developed in our legislation and budgets. So we think it's very important to establish pros and cons in those countries where there are those investment, multi-annual investment frameworks in the UK, France, Italy, and the States. So we will do a comparative analysis of those multi-annual frameworks, and we will actually bring them to our own research program at the Institute. So we will be very happy to receive your comments and suggestions to improve them and to make them useful for society and for the industry. So as I said at the beginning of this message, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Please count on us as an ally to, because we are only fulfilling our mandate, which is to generate ideas that are useful for society. There is no doubt that we believe that reinforcing security, defense of our country, certainly is a contribution to freedoms, prosperity, and the creation of high quality jobs through the insertion of our industry, our companies in the global value chains. Elcano will continue pushing these goals, and we will be very happy to share them with you as we find new progress in the forthcoming months. Thank you very much for the invitation for allowing us to give us our view on this sector, and please count on us for any activities. Thank you, President of the Institute del Cano. And now we are finished, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for staying all the way to the bitter end. I would give you an award for those of you who managed to make it to the bitter end. It's been a long day. It started at 10 with the top speakers. And tomorrow, 
we continue. Thank you, those of you following us online. At 9.30 tomorrow, we will be back here to continue talking about space and defense. Have a good rest. Thank you. Thank you.